This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. Flags regulations. Clerk, please read the motion. On a point of order. Um, asking the Minister for Infrastructure to bring forward a, a support package for a hard pressed taxi drivers, haulage, and coach industries. Two months later, it has taken a letter from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to move this along. Is it in order for M Minister Mallon to ignore the will of this House? And will the Minister write, will the Speaker write to the Minister and urge her to respect this place? Well, the member will be aware that uh, I'm, and I have written on a number of occasions to the Executive Office and all of the Ministers and data the Executive, uh, reminding them and advising them of them to respect the various courtesies and conventions and entitlements of, of this House. So the member has made your point. I haven't gone into all of the detail of the point that you've actually raised, but you have made your point on the record. And I will be ha having something further to say later in the day when I deal with the first urgent oral question. Okay, thank you. Point of order. Point of order, Mr. Further to the last point of order, is it not the case that in order to enable Minister Mallon to make the provisions, she is going to now be given powers which she hitherto did not have. Is that not what has been declared today? Well, like I say, the member has raised that point, and it's a further point, and I will uh, take note of it, and the House will take note of it, and the ministers within the executive will take note of it, I dare say, and as I say, we'll return to this matter later. Thank you. That this assembly takes note of the proposed changes to the flags regulations Northern Ireland 2000 as set out in the draft flags Northern Ireland Amendment Number 2 Regulations 2020. Thank you. And I, 
I call Keith Buchanan to move the motion on behalf of the Business Committee. I beg to move. Thank you. And, uh, the Business Committee has agreed that there will be no time limit for this debate. The proposer will have up to five minutes to propose a motion and up to five minutes to wind. All other speakers will have three minutes. So I call Mr Buchanan to open the debate on the motion. Point of order. Um, I would be interested to know, Mr Speaker, under what standing order members are being restricted to three minutes. Standing order 17 relates to speeches in the Assembly. 17.4 says the Business Committee can, shall consult with the Speaker in order to establish the total time to be allocated in each debate. It does not bestow on the Business Committee the power to limit the speakers to three minutes. It only bestows on the Business Committee in consultation with yourself to set the totality of the time. So where is this three-minute limit coming from? Well, the Business Committee considered the um, proposal. Merrill will be aware the Secretary of State has written, wrote to myself and uh, the Business Committee then took a decision to table the motion for take note. The unusual and interesting situation is that whilst legislation in this House is dealt with by way of a no time limit on the speaking rights, um, this is not legislation which has been dealt with by the or processed by the Assembly itself. So the Business Committee, and I am satisfied the Business Committee ta took a proper, a proper and appropriate decision to leave the debate on timed, of course, but limited the time to uh, three minutes for all other members. And I am satisfied that that's, that's in line with uh, our rights to do that. Okay. And we'll always review these things, of course, if uh, we think that there is something wrong with the decision which has been taken and in light of any member's contributions, including your own, and we can do that in due course. Thank you. And open the debate, please. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Flags Regulation in Northern Ireland 2000 made provision in relation to the flying of flags at government buildings on specific days. Under the Flags Northern Ireland Order 2000, it is the Secretary of State who has the power to make and amend such regulations. However, in doing so, the Secretary of State is required to refer a draft of the proposal, proposed regulations to the Assembly. The Assembly must then report to the Secretary of State the views expressed in the Assembly on the proposed regulations by the date specified by the Secretary of State. Following this, the Secretary of State has a duty to consider this report. The Secretary of State may amend the proposed regulations as a result of the report before laying the regulations for approval by resolution of each House of Parliament. The Business Committee will, was made aware that the Secretary of State had written to the, Sec the Speaker on the 1st of September 2020. The Secretary of State advised that he intended to amend the flag regulation in Northern Ireland 2000 to implement the new decade new approach agreement commitment to bring the list of designated flag flying days from Northern Ireland government buildings and courthouses into line with the designated days. This means increasing by three. The Secretary of State also advised he intended to amend the list of specific specified government buildings from which he would, the flag would be flown. A copy of proposed regulations and accompanying explanatory memorandum were circulated to all members last week. The Secretary of State has asked for the Assembly to be able to consider these draft regulations and provide a report of the Assembly's views by the 14th of September 2020. The Business Committee did not take a view on these proposals in line with previous practice. The Business Committee instead agreed to bring forward today's motion in order to create an opportunity for members to consider the draft regulations. The official report of this debate will record the views expressed in the Assembly on the proposal. With your permission, Mr Speaker, I now wish to make some remarks as an Assembly member from Adolster and Democratic Union's Party Chief Whip. The DUP regards the display of our national symbols, including the national flag, as a basic but central expression of pride in Northern Ireland's Britishness and membership of the United Kingdom. We have constituently supported its display from public buildings on a 365-day basis. This, we feel, is entirely appropriate for major civic buildings such as Parliament buildings and the Belfast City Hall and reflects increasing practice seen elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Therefore, although we welcome the addition of three designated days and two government buildings under these draft orders, as committed in New Decade New Approach, it does not address overarching concerns we hold about the general direction of travel. Nowhere else in the United Kingdom has designated flags legislation. The fact remains that it is unwieldy and unfit for purpose. DCMS have for several years already recognised the three royal bursaries we are today 
adding to the designated day list. Due to the absence of political agreement or proactive steps by the Secretary of State, State in Northern Ireland were left behind. Mr Speaker, it is wrong that Northern Ireland faces such upheaval in simply keeping place with the expression of our Britishness elsewhere in our nation. It is unjust that our nation pride is subject to the veto of certain political parties. We on these benches seek a fundamental reform of these structures. As we approach the centenary of our foundation of Northern Ireland, we will be strongly making the case to Her Majesty's Government for greater assurances that the celebrations do not fall victim to the inflexibility of the current legislation. The Northern Ireland Secretary may be required to give due regard to the Belfast Agreement before making any changes, but we are clear that a failure to act in itself violates the constitutional provisions already set out in that agreement. The flying of the national flag is not a divisive or disproportionate. Its display from public or civic buildings does not invoke fear or division. It simply recognises Northern Ireland's constitutional status and gives due regard to the principle of consent. I would encourage all members who share our position on these matters to passionately make their views known during this debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member and I call Emma Sheeran. Like most people, um, on a Monday in the middle of a global pandemic, the Union flag isn't uh, my top priority today, and I suppose it's fair to say that Union flag is never my top priority. As Irish Republicans, additional flying days for the flag are never going to be something that we in Sinn Féin will celebrate. And indeed, the presence of the Union flag above Parliament buildings and other civic spaces, at one time intimidating to people who identified as Irish and Republicans, is now somewhat tired. I don't feel welcomed when I drive up that hill and I see the red, white and blue flying, but it doesn't threaten my Irishness. I'm confident in my identity. I can be Irish in a place that doesn't recognise me as such, and seeing a union flag doesn't take away from that. That said, respect is an important commodity, and the north of Ireland is contested territory. The dominance of one community over another should be left in the past. It's our belief that there should be parity of esteem for both British and Irish identities here. We should have neutrality or equality when it comes to flags and emblems, either both or neither. Obviously, this is not something that political unionism is ready to accept, and we have seen and heard talk in recent days and weeks hyping up the need for artefacts and memorials to the creation of the state in the lead-up to the centenary of partition. If we're honest with ourselves, anyone can see from a quick walk around this building, around this estate, indeed around this city, that there's no shortage of British imperialism reflected in architecture, in statues and memorials, even in street names. In the current context, I think this motion is at best bizarre and inappropriate and at worst insulting. We're in the middle of a global pandemic where thousands are worrying about their business going bust, being made redundant, balancing and managing the threat of COVID with the need to maintain employment and put food on the table. I will. The motion is being bizarre. The member knows that this is a direct consequence of new decade, new approach, an agreement which her party signed up to support. The member has an additional minute. Thank you, and I thank the member for his input. Um, I'm, I'm coming on to the fact that the British government have got other uh, commitments as per NDNA that they haven't signed up to yet. They haven't implemented. That's why I'm saying it's bizarre. With everything that's going on around us right now, ensuring the increased flying of a flag seems like a strange item to be making the top of the agenda. Of course, the virus that is Brexit is still trundling along in the background of our new normal. And in terms of the British government's failures to honour its commitments as set out in NDNA as in previous agreements, it's a damning indictment that this is something that they're choosing to prioritise. We've been waiting for 22 years for a Bill of Rights for the North, and in our ad hoc committee, we still have members questioning the, members of creating, the merits of creating one. Two pages before this paragraph on flag regulations within NDNA, the British government commit to close engagement with a restored executive relating to our priorities in the next phase of Brexit negotiations. Disregard the fact that the North voted to remain. The fact that three months ago this Assembly voted to support a motion calling on the British to extend the transition period has been ignored, and just last week they actually admitted publicly to their intention to break international law. Considering all the important commitments that the British Government are not honouring, it's nothing short of absurd to me that we're standing here today discussing flags. Thank you, and I call Colin McGrath. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the flag regulations that are presented in front of us today are, as has been highlighted, presented as a consultation as they are actually being progressed in another place. We are asked simply to give our opinion on the matter, and that will be considered by the Secretary of State when he takes his decision. Flags are controversial in Northern Ireland. They are often not used for their purpose. They can be a sign of division, and they can be used to create feelings of unease. And I'm always struck by how it is often the intention of the people putting them up uh, not to celebrate, not to create uh, pride, but for negative and unhelpful things like the marking of division of territory and creating a sense of this is our place, not yours. Now, New Decade, New Approach was a difficult document to develop. It was a bit of a pick and mix and something for everyone in the audience. Uh, it wasn't so much a deal as a collection of aspirations laced with items that were imperative on one side and not necessarily, uh, but just bearable to the other. But it got this place back up and running and with major issues like nurses' pay, health and education reform and then COVID-19, we are better served having this place functioning than not. One item on the NDNA list was this issue of flag flying from uh, additional designated days and at certain designated buildings. This is something important to many in our community. It isn't to me uh, or many of the people that I represent, but it is to others. And in recognition of this being a shared space and a shared place, I am happy uh, to support what is going through today. But I wanted to be clear that, that it is being delivered in the context of NDNA, which contains many more elements to be delivered and ones that I want to see introduced and introduced quickly. We need health service reform. We need to see the medical school at McGee delivered, and I welcome the progress that there is there to date. We need to see the continued reform of these institutions to make them fairer, more democratic and more accountable to the people that we serve. We want to see extra childcare hours for hard-working families and parents to ease the burden on their monthly pay packet. We want to see more social and affordable housing uh, to tackle the unacceptable housing stress that there is here in the North. We want additional accountability for this housing matter too, with a separate outcome in our programme for government on housing to be able to measure its success. These, we believe, are the issues that affect people. They impact on their lives and matters are that which they want to see progress on. I want to see this place working, the people in it working, and the people that we are here to work for seeing improvements in their lives. So I want to see much more delivered other than just the flags. Thank you. And I thank the member and I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in response to the, the piece of legislation that has been put in, in front of us um, to acknowledge the sovereignty of our flags. Um, the designated days um, Alliance has supported for many years. It shows respect for people who want the Union flag. It also shows respect for those who do not want the Union flag. But what it does say, and many others have said it here, is that we are a community that appears to be divided. We're actually just one community. We're all from this place, and we want something better. New decade, new approach was that, and we all signed up to it. it is, the designated days has been equality proofed so many times. If I am to be in this chamber, stuck in the middle here with you, then all I would ask is that we show each other respect. The flag is the flag. People want it. People don't want it. It's time for us to move forward. And as others have said here, we're in the middle of a pandemic. A virus is killing our people. We have education that's not being reformed. The Bengoa hasn't been brought through from health. There are a lot of priorities here. While I'm respecting this legislation, and it's only adding three more days, it's adding the birthday of the Duchess of Cambridge, the birthday of the Duke of Cambridge, and the birthday of the Duchess of Cornwall. It's adding three days. That will change, unfortunately, when people pass away and days are removed. When other people are born, days will be added. That's designated days. All I would say to each of us is, we have a lot of work to do in this place, and can we move on with that? I thank the member, and I call Christopher Stolford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, as has been mentioned by other speakers in this debate, uh, this uh, development arises out of the new decade, new approach, and I welcome it as such. And it, was also, it has also been said that new decade, new approach did represent a compromise. 
and I accept that there are things that people on that side of the House are going to have to tolerate going through as part of that compromise that they might not like, and then there will be things that people on this side of the House are going to have to tolerate going through that they might not be that fussed on either. And politics is the art of the possible, and New Decade, New Approach reflected a compromise between the two major uh, political traditions that exist in this community. I think this is a welcome development, and I speak as someone who puts a flag on his house during the months of July and August. I do so because I'm loyal to the United Kingdom. I'm a loyal subject of Her Majesty the Queen. It's part of who I am. It's part of my identity. And it's important to me, and it's something that I value. I value the flag of my country, and I want to see it treated with respect. And that's why, for example, I don't like to see flags left on lampposts to become tattered rags. The flag of our country should be treated with respect. I welcome the provision uh, of these additional flag uh, days. I welcome the expansion to um, two other uh, government buildings because I think that's right and I think it's appropriate. Mention was made about the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and, and their list. My understanding of the list that we're now being brought into line with is that that is the minimum requirement or the minimum recommendation from the government in Whitehall in terms of the total number of days. It may be that other days can be added to the list, either on a one-off basis, such as a significant national event, or um, on a permanent basis, if that is so decided. And I have heard some of the comments that have been made. I've sat in the chair where you were, uh, sir, the last time Assembly Commission business was considered. And I think it would be the worst possible thing for us as a community if we descend into the trenches over the issue around the foundation of the state. People are going to have very, very different interpretations of that. And I accept that. But I think if we can show a bit of give and take toward each other, so why shouldn't, for example, on the actual day itself, why shouldn't the flag be on the roof of this building? What, what would that really cost? What would that really hurt anyone to just, on that one-off day, perhaps accede to that request and show a bit of generosity to people who believe different things from you but want to work with you to run the country? Member, time's up. Okay, thank you. And I call Sinead Ennis. As my colleague beside me here, um, Emma Sheeran, has said, for some looking in on this debate this morning, there will be a certain and not unjustified sense of frustration that here we are in the middle of a global pandemic with all the regs at Lumen and all the other crises that are, that are coming our way, and we're here again talking about flags and emblems. But I think you know, this debate, uh, it's, it's about more than flags, um, and it's about us deciding what type of society and place we want to live in and how we're going to treat each other, and more importantly, how we acknowledge and respect each other's identities. And I suppose in the context of Brexit, where we've been reminded just recently and yet again of the British government's total and unequivocal lack of respect for Ireland and the legally binding international agreement it signed up to. And with talk now emerging that the British government are manoeuvring themselves uh, to perhaps abandon and renege on major parts of European human rights law, which of course us here in the North, we know only too well the British government has formed in this regard. But it is unsurprising then that the same British government refuses to implement key human rights components of the Good Friday Agreement, specifically a Bill of Rights. The Good Friday Agreement provided for an equality of treatment duty on public authorities, and this statutory duty was explicitly singled out in the agreement to be enshrined within a Bill of Rights, and it said, the formulating of a general obligation on government and public bodies fully to respect on the basis of equality of treatment the identity and ethos of both communities. And the Human Rights Commission, which was tasked with the formation of the bill, recommended in its 2008 advice to the government, public authorities must fully respect, on the basis of equality of treatment, the identity and ethos of both main communities in the North. No one relying on this provision may do so in a manner inconsistent with the rights and freedoms of others. And as my colleague has said earlier, look around this building that we have to come, come and work in every day. And I don't see my identity or my ethos reflected anywhere in this building. Absolutely nowhere. So instead of asking us to celebrate uh, and roll, no, I'll, I'll, I'll finish if you don't mind. Instead of asking us to roll out the flags to celebrate the birth of yet another unelected British royal, perhaps a British government in this house might consider Sinn Féin's reasonable proposals on equality and neutrality. 
both flags or none at all. I know the Secretary of State has said he will be reading the Hansard report of this debate, so I want to take this opportunity to call on him and his government to reflect on why they have yet to implement a Bill of Rights and their apparent inability to honour international agreements and the commitments that they made in them. The British government need to, and this House as well need to demonstrate that we are serious about a peaceful and progressive shared future for the people on this island, a future that has to be based on equality, parity of esteem, tolerance and respect for all. Thank you, and I call John O'Dowd. Oh, um, thank you, uh, Karen Collier. Um, I, I was just reading through again the New Deal, New Approach document, uh, which was published by the two governments and which led to the restoration of uh, this institution. And ironically, uh, this section is under the title of the British government's paper, delivering on our commitments. Now. Delivering on our commitments from the British government. I think we've seen in recent days what exactly that means. They will cherry pick on what they want to deliver, and they will deliver what suits them, when it suits them, and sometimes it can never suit them. And that's where the difficulty lies in regards to this, this proposal. And, and this is a take note debate, uh, and what we'll do at the end of this, we'll vote that we've taken note. That should be in no way interpreted by the Secretary of State or by anyone in this chamber, or anyone beyond this chamber, that we are supporting the notion that we need to fly more flags. Because we don't. What we need to do is ensure that the parts of, of, of the, 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 the paper, which was published by the two governments, uh, which is the responsibility of this assembly, are implemented and implemented in full. And that will cause challenges on either side of the House. But we have to do that. Uh, what the governments do with their commitments, we will see. But they can't cherry pick. And, and, and we've seen this uh, from the British government time and time again. And when you read through uh, what's entitled Annex A, UK government commitments to Northern Ireland, it's as if those of an Irish identity don't exist. And the co guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, which is the UK government, seem to have forgotten that they have signed up to the Good Friday Agreement, that the institutions are built on the Good Friday Agreement, and that a significant and growing population in this part of the island are Irish and want to be seen as Irish, and they want their identity recognised, and they want their identity acknowledged. But the government does not do that in any part of this document. So uh, what I'm sending out the clear message to you, and for Hansard, is this. Uh, the vote will go through today, but it's not an endorsement of this proposal. And what we have to do as a society is acknowledge that there are different identities in this island, and they have to be uh, acknowledged not only in word, but also in deed, and also in symbolism. Because what flags are about, flags mark territory. Flags are a symbol of power, that you have power in a certain area, or you have control of a certain territory. You can put one above this building, or you can put one on a flag post somewhere. They send out the same message. It's about power. And what we have here is power sharing. So we have to, in terms of our symbols, uh, 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 in terms of our acknowledgement of this society, there has to be equality or neutrality in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To say the flags are a vexed subject in this place would be, uh, would be to understate matters, and no one in this part of the world is ever given to understatement, certainly not in this Assembly. Um, this regulation, as people have said, implements one particular commitment in the New Decade New Approach Agreement signed at the beginning of this year in relation to increasing designated flag days. Mr. Speaker, I want to say two connected things about today's regulation. The first is about respect, the second is about consistency. First, in relation to respect, it cannot be said often enough that Northern Ireland um, is a shared space, and it will continue to be, whatever our constitutional uh, future. Mutual respect cannot simply be a phrase. It must be ingrained in how we think and talk about one another. Our identities our symbols and the space we share. It is often said that we talk far too much about flags and identity. Many of the young people who leave here and cringe at the idea of coming back do so because they feel weighed down by the monotony of debates over symbolism and identity. So it's true that, when we, that we talk too much about questions of flags and identity, but it's also true that we don't talk about them in the right way. Too often, we do not speak respectfully about what is valued and precious to others. We are quick to take offence, but slow to see why others might be offended. So it's worth me saying clearly, I respect the Union flag. 
and I respect the importance of the flag to many people in Northern Ireland and indeed in this chamber. And in response to what Mr Stalford, my constituency colleague, said, I don't just tolerate symbols of Britishness or indeed symbols uh, of, uh, of other things. I actively hope I actively respect them. The flag may not command my loyalty, but it should command my respect. If it matters to my neighbours, my, some of my friends and many of my constituents, and indeed many of my Assembly colleagues, it should matter to me. Indeed, for those of us who seek constitutional change in this island, it is incumbent for us to be clear that if we are serious about respect for Britishness in Ireland, it needs to not be in a grudging way, but in a clear and positive way. But, to be clear, mutual respect also means that in addition to the um, additional designated flag days, um, we need to have a better approach to unauthorised flag flying in streets and neighbourhoods across Northern Ireland. In many communities, flag flying clearly has the consent, either active or passive, of the people who live there. But in other places, there is limited consent or no consent. Many of my constituents in places like Carrie Duff, Rosetta or Finnehy live in communities that are proud of their integrated nature. They have a multiplicity of identities and constitutional viewpoints, but they also dislike public spaces being used to assert one viewpoint or identity for large parts of the year. And very often, the people who come to put up those flags are not known to them, let alone being accountable to them. I welcome what Mr Stalford said about tattered rags. I think he's completely right. Anybody who cares about a flag, whatever that national flag is, shouldn't want to see it, um, it become a tattered rag that intimidates people. Um, uh, but in the absence of an agreed and consistent approach to regulation, many of these communities feel powerless on this issue. They do not want to remove all symbols of identity. I certainly don't, but rather to have more transparency and accountability over these matters and the ability to have their voice heard. So, the two points are interrelated, Mr. Speaker. Respect for tolerance, respect for symbols of identity, but consistency in approach. And that's why we need to see the Commission, another part of Unidecky, new approach, the Commission on Flags and Identity, report to the First Ministers and create a more consistent approach on the interrelated issues of flags. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Justin McNulty. Accommodation can be reached. In the darkest of times, accommodation was reached on flags. In this, term, in this time of turmoil, I recall a different time of turmoil. Tuesday, the 3rd of March, I, along with my teammates, were training in a cut and thrust dogger training session in Davit Park in Lurgan when one of our joint managers, Brian Calvin, was called away urgently because there had just been a double murder in his family bar in Points Pass. In the following days, two great leaders walked the main street and points past together. They quelled anger and they quelled fear by their actions and by their words. Their spirit of accommodation, the spirit of accommodation exhibited by Seamus Mallon and David Trimble in those days has been shared by everybody in the community in points past. And thankfully, the following month, the Good Friday Agreement was signed. And further subsequent agreements and points passed were brokered by Tom Canavan, God rest his soul, and by Robert Turner. The following year, that same team were in Ulster final. The local GEA club approached the Orange Order, seeking guidance on where to source bunting, orange and white bunting. I believe the GEA and the Orange Order worked together to take down the, the, the red, white and blue bunting, which was there from the 12th, to erect the, the orange and white bunting for those to final. Thankfully, my team were victorious on that day. But that spirit of accommodation still exists in points past. The community there know we live in a shared home place. That's the, sort of, that's the type of shared home place I want to work towards on this island. A new Ireland of tolerance and respect and ambition. A new Ireland of energy, endeavour, enterprise and equality. A new Ireland where we spill our sweat and no, nobody's blood. Let's all work towards that new Ireland. A new shared home place. Our scatha kaila na marin na marin na denya. We rely on each other for shelter. Gurma yogat, and I call George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I wish to welcome the proposals <coughs> which correct mistakes in the original 200 order <coughs> and ensure that Northern Ireland is brought into line with the rest of the United Kingdom, in other words, equality for Northern Ireland. I wish to point out when the original order was made, the Queen Mother was still alive, as was Princess Margaret. 
With their deaths, there was a net loss of days that the flag could fly. New members were added to the royal family, for example, the Duchess of Cambridge, and her birthday is a day where the flag is flown in celebration. The proposed new arrangements ensure that Northern Ireland can mark that occasion along with the rest of the United Kingdom. Indeed, Northern Ireland will, under the proposals, have three additional days. The proposals recognise that change occurs and a proactive response to changes is essential to ensure Northern Ireland maintains the same statutory days as the rest of the United Kingdom. Mr. Speaker, for many in Northern Ireland, the ability to mark significant birthdays by the flying of our national flag is welcome, both culturally and historically. I sincerely believe these proposals are a positive move and urge the Assembly to support this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I was to call Dolores Kelly, which is not in the chamber. Uh, I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, John O'Dowd said that some people seem to have forgotten that they would signed up to the what he called the Good Friday Agreement. I think that's a message he and his party should take to themselves. Because whatever else the Belfast Agreement uh, can be faulted for, it, inv it involved, we were told, an acceptance that Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. Now, if that is correct, then how can it be that there is resistance uh, to the flying of the flag of the United Kingdom on government buildings in Northern Ireland? If there is recognition that we're part of the United Kingdom, then one inevitably follows the other. And instead, what we've had today, particularly from the first Sinn Féin speaker, uh, Ms Sheeran, was bile against all things British and the flag. And yet these are the people who tell us there's a great new dawn awaits us in a new Ireland. And here they are today. How about you take all the privileges of being part of the United Kingdom, bursting to get us out of the United Kingdom, promising a new Ireland, and yet within Northern Ireland they cannot even accept the flying of the flag. Well, I don't think I get extra time, so I think I won't. Uh, and then the, the Miss Ennis told us she sees nothing in this building that accommodates her culture. My goodness, I walk out of this building, I walk up the steps uh, from the main hall, and I'm faced with a portrait of an IRA commander responsible for multiple murder of my constituents and others. Coming back to these regulations, I do welcome the fact that they are bringing things up to date. I welcome the fact that the two Sinn Féin ministers for community and finance will now have the union flag flying from their headquarters, and I welcome the addition of days. But I do say to the Assembly Commission, there is a test coming for respect within this community. The 7th of June is the centenary of the formation of, of the first sitting of the Northern Ireland Parliament. It will show whether or not there is any respect from the Assembly Commission and those who govern this place for the people who want to be part of, North, of the United Kingdom if the flag flies on this building. If it does not, it will be a calculated, deliberate insult to everyone who values their place in the United Kingdom and another confirmation of just what would await us. Member's time, so member time is up. As to leave the United Kingdom. Thank the member, and I call Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, we do have uh, more pressing, pre uh, pressing matters to discuss today in the flying of flags. So, I'm not going to speak for long uh, on this issue. But I do raise to put on record my opposition to the extra days uh, contained within this motion. Uh, I, for one, happen to believe that we as a society need to get away from the flying of communal flags. And as a socialist, I certainly do not support the expansion of flying flags in honour and to glorify any monarchy, never mind the British monarchy and the role of uh, British imperialism in Ireland, which, for the record, was not good for any uh, working class communities uh, in the North. This motion on flags, of course, stems from agreements that were signed up 
two by uh, Sinn Féin and the, and the DUP in the new decade, new approach agreement, and in a small way sums up a major problem with the agreement, namely how it doubles down on the two traditions schema where communal forces are elevated in politics and certain sectarian practices are given cover by the law. For example, this agreement uh, on flag flying came alongside a proposal, proposal to create a commissioner whose task will include, uh, and I quote, protecting the Ulster British tradition as if such a thing was an endangered species and not the historic ideology of elites here. So all these things are co connected to the way that this state uh, is the ultimate guarantor and cements sectarianism at the heart of it. Uh, and people before profit, for our part, will continue to be a vo uh, voice for socialist politics inside and outside the chamber and have no truck with this approach. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Robbie Butler to wind. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> may I may not use the five minutes. Uh, first of all, I'll be speaking on behalf um, of the uh, Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to all the members who have made a contribution. I intend to be very brief in concluding this debate. Uh, the Business Committee's intention in bringing forward this motion today was to give members an opportunity to express its views on proposed amendments to the flag regulations Northern Ireland 2000. The Business Committee, uh, I had spoken on behalf of the, uh, the Commission, but I'm actually speaking on the Business Committee, and uh, it's not considered the proposals are taking a view on them as a corporate body, but the Secretary of State only wrote to the Speaker on the 1st of September asking that the Assembly considers these draft regulations, which is what we are about today. The Secretary of State asked for the Assembly to provide a report of its views by today, the 14th of September 2020. Consequently, in order to meet that very tight deadline, the Business Committee was required to ensure that the Assembly had an opportunity to debate those proposals today. Members have now set out their views on them. And on behalf of the Business Committee, I'll not go through those views, although I may pick it up myself. The official report uh, records those views. The Business Committee has been advised, uh, Mr Speaker, that you, the Speaker, will today send a copy of the official report to the Secretary of State, who may then choose to amend the proposed regulations before laying them uh, for approval by resolution of each House of Parliament. So on behalf of the Business Committee, I ask all members to support the motion today. And now I will speak on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party and uh, myself. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I just want to commend all the speakers, uh, firstly, uh, for the matter and tone of the uh, speeches so far uh, on this issue. Flags have for many years uh, been an issue of either pride uh, from a union's perspective or a nationalist perspective, depending on the flag that you like, but also been uh, a, a course uh, for much angst and many sad debates in this country. But uh, these are regulations which the Secretary of State are bringing before us as part of the new decade and new approach, which, as was pointed out by a number of the speakers today, uh, is uh, a mixed bag of, of regulations and priorities for much of us. And uh, it's something that we're going to have to show a lot of respect to each other with regard to, to bringing into line. Uh, just with regard to a number of the points that were picked out uh, by some of the speakers today, um, it was moved by uh, Keith Buchanan, um, and he talked about the the, the value in the identity to unionists uh, and to that British identity is something that I share and I know the Austro Unionist uh, Party share. Um, Emma Sheeran then spoke and I mean uh, Emma obviously has um, her, her, her background and, and her pain that she's felt and the fact that she doesn't feel that her Irish identity has been uh, 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 something that's been celebrated but as someone who is British I can assure you for 40, 48 years it's living somewhere which is supposed to be British and part of the United Kingdom you want to try it from my shoes when people are picking at you all your life from 1972, it's not an easy ride. And when we come to something that I'm proud about, which is a flag, I understand the need to be respectful um, and, and, and to fly it appropriately. Um, and I don't see that as, as something that knows to anybody's uh, identity at all. Um, he's not here now, but, but, but Colin there, um, he, he talked, he was actually very good. He talked about it uh, sometimes controversial and sometimes has negative connotations, but he at least showed the respect that, uh, that has been probably missing at some times over this past few years um, with regard to the institutions not being running. But again, he showed that need, that, uh, which was probably born out of the Good Friday Agreement, where, where we actually all have to move a little bit and show that respect. So that was, that was welcome. Kelly Armstrong talked about the sovereignty of the flag. She talked about the, also the priorities that needed to be addressed as well. So whilst this uh, debate may be important to some of us and less important to others, there are other priorities 
uh, that need to be talked about. Christopher Stolford uh, spoke actually really well today. I give him a compliment. I don't think he's here. But he did today speak about flags and the need to fly them appropriately. He talked about his distaste for tattered flags and lampposts. And I don't think there would be too many in this House, including myself, that would disagree with that statement. And he talked about the need uh, to embrace the centenary and show generosity which obviously works both ways. Sinead Ennis then spoke about her frustration on uh, what type of society and how will we treat each other. But that's, uh, that's something, that's a mirror we need to hold up to ourselves as, as well, I believe. Um, moving on to the, the final comments. Um, Matthew O'Toole talked about respect and consistency, which I would echo. Justin McNulty uh, in, in Irish spoke about relying on each other for shelter. I can't do it in Irish, Justin, but thank you for those, those words. And Jim Allister then reminded us of the need next year when the centenary celebrations will appear that we need to show that generosity. Um, the final comment will go to Jerry Carroll. This is why I will not be a socialist, because if socialism cannot uh, show anything but opposition um, and is, if has a failure to show tolerance or accommodation, then, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that will not be for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, the question is that the motion standing on the order of paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Would members take a raise for a moment to be changed the table? Thank you. Okay, order members. <clears throat> I could ask members to resume their seats. Thank you. Next item on the order paper is a motion on a living over the shops scheme. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That this assembly recognises the rule that repurposed and attractive residential space above retail premises can play in promoting the success of town centres across Northern Ireland notes that making high streets high quality locations to live as well as work can aid the economic recovery for COVID-19, and calls on the Minister for Communities to consider establishing a live, Living Over Shops grant scheme to assist landlords to convert space above retail premises into residential accommodation. Thank you. I call Mr Jonathan Buckley to move the motion. I to move. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. Uh, one amendment has been selected as published on the Marshall list. I call Mr Buckley to please open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. This year has brought challenges that were previously unimagined by members in every corner of this House. We are facing a battle that was entirely unforeseen and it will be hard to estimate a time when we can re re resume some element of normality. When this assembly was restored in January of this year, after a long absence, we joined with a keen desire to confront issues that have long plagued this country. One such issue is the decline of the high street and economic activity within our town centres, coupled with chronic housing stress. Of course, these particular challenges long predates the viral pandemic, and societal trends have long forecast that less people are living and shopping within our town centres. With this in mind, we need to be prepared for the realistic possibility that COVID-19 will vastly accelerate the decline of our high street and be prepared to take action to mitigate against this. This is why I stand here today in supporting the establishment of a Living Over the Shops grant scheme and call upon the Minister of Communities to take, into serious to take this into serious consideration alongside uh, direct actions right across the executive to reinvent our town centres and address the lack of affordable housing stock.
The Northern Ireland Executive first introduced the Living Over the Shops scheme in 2002 to provide grants for the conversion of empty or underused space uh, above rental, uh, retail and commercial premises into private rental units. This grant scheme ran until 2008-2009 and contributed to the creation of 101 new properties within our town centres before it closed due to budgetary pressures. An analysis of the need and demand for a new lots type initiative commissioned by the Department of Communities was published in January 2017. The analysis reported that over the last decade, demand has strengthened considerably for private rented units within our town centres due to increased uh, due to reduced mortgage availability to younger households. This de demand is compiled by an increase in the vacancy levels of non-domestic properties across Northern Ireland. Another report commissioned by the Department indicated and identified that there, the vacancy rate of non-domestic properties in the 41 towns across Northern Ireland was estimated to be at 22.3% in 2016, which is considerably higher than any other region within the United Kingdom. This totals 3,595 non-domestic pro uh, property vacancies, of which 1,015 were quantified by Northern Irish councils as being suitable for residential conversion. These statistics are clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, and visible proof that the total vacancy of non-domestic properties within town centres more than satisfies supply if we are proactive in encouraging conversion under the Living Over the Shops scheme. And to, to satisfy that potential supply meets a convincing demand. As I have previously alluded to, there are substantive demogra demographic and population trends which impact considerably on housing needs. Northern Ireland's population is expected to grow an estimated 8.6% by 2039, taking the total population to be on 2 million people. This increase, coupled with an ageing population and changing trends in home ownership and composition, places further pressure upon the need to improve housing supply stock across Northern Ireland. Age-based demographics also tell us that Northern Ireland is projected to face the challenge of supporting an ageing population with the number of people over the age of 65 set to increase by approximately two, from 260,000 in 2016 to approximately 410,000 by 2039, an increase of almost 60 per cent over 23 years. In addition to this, a falling birth rate also suggests that the working age population will decrease. This will have the same knock-on effect and implication for housing, as housing supply of smaller homes, one or two bed units, it will be important in meeting this demand, particularly as younger generations have smaller families on average and older people seek to downsize from larger homes in their later years. Whilst this evidence uh, serves as evidence for the long-term challenges that we are set to encounter, we must also recognise the very present task at hand in relation to COVID-19. The viral pandemic has already compounded the difficulties faced within many departments, and we need to be realistic about how that will directly impact the high street. Emerging evidence suggests that lockdown is set to change consumer and business behaviour on a long-lasting basis, with a more permanent shift towards working from home and favouring digital retail. The knock-on effect of less footfall has been well documented in Belfast in previous months. As offices adopt to a new normal, droves of staff working remotely have weakened retail and hospitality units that were heavily reliant upon their custom. In addition, the seismic shift in internet sales presents a real threat to the high street, as online sales have soared, now accounting for over a third of all sales across the United Kingdom, up from less than 20 per cent the year previous. Statistics produced by retail expert Springboard estimate that the footfall in our high streets fell by a staggering 79 per cent in April 2020 compared to the same period last year. This evidence very clearly raises profound questions about the future of our town centres, which must be scrutinised and addressed in order to prevent the continued decline of our Northern Ireland High Street. If COVID-19 continues to accelerate the shift towards online retail and service access, shop vacancies rates on the high street and in retail parks could rise rapidly 
as stores inevitably become financially unviable. With all of this in mind, we must ask ourselves the question, is now the time to seriously re-image and reimagine our approach to urban planning? In addressing the onset struggles we face with COVID-19, we must now be willing to reflect the changing role of town centres from retail-led to multifunctional. With respect to behavioural change, we must recognise that there is less demand for retail space in our urban centres. Rather than letting high streets fall into an urban decay, we can revive our urban spaces by repurposing them, replacing shops and offices with desirable and affordable accommodation. Further provision of housing within our town centres has the potential to generate social and economic benefits, including increased investment and spending and the creation of jobs. Following this path has the potential to curve behavioural changes and to broaden the appeal of our town and city centres. The case for demand of such residential properties is compelling, and in establishing a living over the shop scheme, we can grasp the real opportunity to revitalise and re-image our town centres. With the vast array of vacant non-domestic properties available within our towns and city centres, there is a role for government now to take the initiative in encouraging such plans to repurpose urban centres. I believe that now is the time for action. Now is the time to re-image our towns. And while I fully recognise that a living over the shops grant scheme cannot in its own right address the challenging challenges facing Northern Ireland in relation to housing supply and regeneration of local communities, but it is it's a start and it can help set the tone following the global pandemic that we've faced in COVID-19. As a party, we have in the past raised the prospect of town centre regeneration challenge funds with local councils. Chamber of Trade and others could bid for annual money to help them develop a range of projects in town centres. In terms of housing, we are clear that there is a need for a comprehensive look at whether the current structures are fit for purpose. So we must accept there is a need to work together holistically but proactively on these issues in the days ahead. It is vital that any future programme reflects the challenges of COVID-19, market fluctuations as well as the ideas of those who stand to be affected if it is to demand confidence and ultimately uh, realise the clear potential it offers. We accept that isn't going to be one, something which one minister should be left to take forward on their own. The establishment of High Street ta uh, Task Force provide a useful vehicle to take forward this work in a timely and effective manner. I appeal to the House today to support me in my desire to re-image and reimagine our town centres as we uh, react to one of the most uh, affected uh, periods in our time, the reaction and the response of government in tackling the decline of our high street and the demand for social housing in a post-COVID environment. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. And before I call the next speaker to move the amendment, can this old Belfast councillor welcome that old Belfast councillor back from his period in isolation? You're very welcome back. I call Mr Framakan to move the amendment. How long have we got, Chair? <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes. That's good. Kion uh, Kolya, I want to begin by thanking you and all of those within this assembly who have sent me kind words during the course of my Ill illness. It was much appreciated. Karja, the motion we debate today, which calls on the Minister for Communities to consider establishing a living above the shops grant scheme, which would assist landlords to convert space above retail premises and turn them into a res residential accommodation. On the face of it, it would seem to be a good proposal and it says that it will play an important role in promoting the success of our town centres, making high streets high quality locations to live as well as work and can aid the economic recovery uh, from COVID-19. Again, on the face of it, this proposal seems to be fine and of course, we should consider all proposals which come to the table for discussions. I just wonder if this, this is the right way uh, to, to pursue this particular allocation of housing. We have always believed that any proposal which helps in dealing with the dereliction of the many business premises with empty spaces above their premises needs to be looked at, but it can't be looked at in isolation and has to be looked at with the other serious difficulties we face across the housing sector. The proposers of this motion 
do not speak of the problems uh, which this area might bring, especially how it was run the last time round. We pursued the policy of living above the shops, not only the cost, but what areas will benefit from this proposal. Some thoughts I've had which came to mind are how areas will be chosen for development, what the development cost will be, who controls the new build, how they will be allocated when completed, and will they be allocated on need? It does not lay out the many difficulties there will be in, in overcoming the serious problems of access uh, to proposed homes. Uh, moreover, regional planning policies state that they would need to comply with normal planning and environmental considerations. For example, facilities for the storage of fuel and refuse and the space for drying clothes. And what of parking? Planning talks about level access, which would be considered in the circumstances of each particular case. How is rent set in the new refurbished properties? Do they remain in the ownership of the property owner? Or are they handled? Uh, are they to be handed to a social housing provider to allocate from increasing waiting lists, or are they purely a private development? In one of the papers we received, it listed rent charges on the private rented sector throughout the north, but they were old, old figures. Who will set the rent to ensure they are affordable? These are just a few thoughts that come to mind. I have looked through the research papers, much of which were based on English schemes that were heavily funded. But the paper provided by the public and corporate economic consultants who, working back then for the Department of Communities, issued a report in September 2016, which stated on page four that Belfast is identified as an area with significant challenges regarding its non-dependent domestic vacancies, and the LATS scheme is only likely to work in areas outside Belfast city centre. In fact, it seems to remove Belfast city centre from any possibility of developing a LATS housing scheme, especially at a time uh, only a number of years ago when there was a campaign in inner city communities to have housing in all its aspects uh, built in the centre of Belfast. As a member of the old Social Development Committee, back then when looking at town, the town centre regeneration strategy, we realised from early on that housing was crucial uh, to the future of towns and villages. These strategies offered hope, and I believe pe uh, people were disappointed that they never materialised. I believe that when looking at strategies for the future of towns and villages, they can only work with other sectors, especially local government. In fact, today many councils are actively working on the development of major proposals on major shape-changing schemes, which will change our communities for the better. It includes business, sport, environment, and housing, and much more. City deals which takes in, uh, takes in council areas surrounding, including Belfast, Derry, and councils in the northwest uh, have their own city deals, as does other councils who are working uh, growth deals. All of these will have as part of their proposition housing growth over the next 10 or 20 years. I believe that councils need to be convinced that the LAT scheme will provide the type of housing which will make a difference to their area. I believe the proposers of this motion need uh, to be working with local government to ensure all aspects of dereliction is dealt with, including how to deal with the dereliction in our town centres, especially shops and waste land which has lay vacant for many years. I again emphasise that this should be part of a strategy, not just a scheme chosen in isolation uh, from a housing strategy. The proposers of this motion know that and all, housing in all its aspects are right up there for the Minister. She has committed herself to come in front of our committee and cover any issue we want raised. Uh, she has spoken of her commitment to start dealing with the tangled web uh, which makes up housing and to put a, strate a strategy in place which deals with the many problems we face. I have no doubt that she will look at this motion and, and do her best to deal with this matter. But I again emphasise that this cannot be done in isolation from all other aspects of housing. So I would argue that our amendment offers the best way forward and I would ask the proposers to reconsider their motion and allow the amendment to have the unanimous support of the Chamber. Let, it, let this be part of the uh, overall strategy which will ensure that all future decisions made in housing developments and allocations are based on objective need. Karja, we're in difficult, difficult times, but I have no doubt we will work our way through this. 
When we do, we will need to work together to provide decent housing. I believe we have a Minister for Communities who is deeply committed in tackling the question of housing, especially the provision of modern housing for all people in need. I would ask that you support the amendment. Thank you. Can I ask you just to formally move the amendment? Just I beg to move. Thank you. I call Mr. Mark Durkin. Deputy Speaker, every member of this assembly will be all too familiar with the long waiting lists for housing across our constituencies. 38,000 applicants in total, but with fewer than 2,000 new social housing units being built every year. With the greatest need being in my own constituency of Foyle, where we have nearly 3,000 households on the housing waiting list, I welcome any innovative measure that will help to ensure that everyone across the North has a roof above their head. So I commend the members from Upper Ban and North Belfast in bringing forward this motion. I will also be supporting the amendment, which I believe to be complementary as I believe a living over the shops scheme that begins and ends with grants to landlords has more potential pitfalls than benefits. A 2016 report, Fran McCann has referred to it, by the Department looked into the need and demand for such a scheme. I'm sure the Minister is familiar with it, and updated information on the data provided would be very useful for a fresh look. I do hope, however, that the Minister will go beyond it and undertake a comprehensive assessment of the viability of such a scheme, taking into account how many homes such a scheme could create in each constituency, affordability and town planning issues in terms of convenient access to public services and facilities. An updated, an updated assessment would also, of course, have to reckon with the brutal reality that many shops in our towns and city centres will struggle to stay open in the coming months and years ahead. There are few areas of public policy that housing does not touch. The labour market, education and health are chief amongst those that it does. That is why we in the SDLP have called for a 20-year housing strategy that would incorporate supply, affordability, regulation of the growing private rental sector and tackling homelessness. The solution to our housing crisis is not simply increasing supply. It is about increasing supply of affordable, high-quality housing for sustainable communities. Encouraging private landlords to develop empty space above commercial properties requires careful consideration and strategic planning. There are clear benefits in terms of repopulating our town centres and generating much more economic activity. Living over the shop schemes also make use of existing infrastructure and provide housing much more quickly than it takes to build entirely new houses. Yet, while we all want to see new homes built or provided, there is a risk of rushing in with grants and ending up with housing that is both unaffordable and unsuitable for the people in the greatest housing need. The departmental report I have mentioned cited research from the Centre of Cities that shows that city centre living is most likely to appeal to young, single professionals. They certainly do need housing and are part of what makes city centre living so vibrant. But the majority of people I need that are in housing need are families with children. It is not just a case of making space above commercial properties habitable. We should identify the potential pitfalls and learn the lessons of such a scheme in the late 90s in England. The weakness in that scheme stemmed from its failure to consider access to public services. Families, in particular, need convenient access to doctor surgeries, schools and play parks, as well as needing parking. Without consideration of these issues, accommodation above shops, I fear, will only promote transience rather than the long-term sustainable communities that we want to build and that we need to create. I support the amendment. Thank you. Mr Roy Beggs. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I too uh, rise to support the motion uh, as listed, and I would like to thank Mr. Buckley for having uh, brought this motion, uh, indicating the importance of a new living over the shop scheme or something like it to uh, promote and encourage our town centres and to address this change in retailing, the high level of vacancies that exist there. There is a problem and we need to address it. Um, once the pressure has, uh, was on our town centres from out of town shopping centres, but as others have indicated, it's actually even moved on from that. And this recent period where uh, we have been uh, having the effect of COVID and having to live with it has exacerbated this situation, exacerbated perhaps the movement of retailing to the online retailing and has reduced the footfall and the turnover in our town centre shops. So there's additional pressure there. This in turn has created further vacancies. And it's important that uh, we arrest that decline and get footfall into our town centres. If there are vacancies, it makes our town centres less attractive. So it's important that we address those vacancies, uh, that we encourage such schemes as delivering over the shop schemes, which can reuse that, uh, that vacant property. And I think, as Mr Buckley has indicated, we may need to look at the overall uh, planning policies within our town centres. There is no point having planning policies which were there assuming shopping patterns of yesterday. We need to be more flexible. I myself recall, uh, when coming to this assembly, getting temporary accommodation uh, for, for an office in the town centre. It was the only location I could get with disability-friendly access, and I literally had a front each access, no shop window. But I had to apply for temporary accommodation for a number of years, and eventually that, that, that moved on. So it's important that we look at reusing our town centres, getting sustainable use from them, and I have no doubt that living in our town centres is an important element for that, and it's important that we refresh our planning policies and the support and grants that are available to support it. As has been indicated, there was a, a previous living over the shop scheme which supported some 11 areas throughout Northern Ireland. My constituency, uh, in particular the town centres of Lauren and Carrick Fergus, was not supported. Many other town centres were not supported from the previous scheme. And therefore, the potential for it and the potential for it helping those town centres and helping the level of homelessness in those areas uh, is perhaps greater than others. Now, in moving forward, it's important that we come up with a scheme that will work, not one that we tick all our own personal boxes. I think in terms of other schemes which have tried to improve the town centres in my constituency, the Heritage Lottery Fund has been useful for some properties, but it uh, brings out specifications, which means other property, property owners leave them vacant. They don't think it's worthwhile. They, they, perhaps it's in a conservation area where there's a very high cost to follow what would be required by Heritage Lottery. So it's important we adapt our planning policies to actually make sure something happens, to make sure the high levels of vacancies are addressed, to be bringing life back into those town centres and provide the homes that we all want. Others have talked, Mr. Drucken earlier talked about how there is a potential of actually bringing about quick change here. Uh, we have the, the building already made. It's, you're talking about modifying buildings. And I suspect, in terms of the overall cost, it's probably more efficient than building new homes from scratch. So we have a, a homeless issue throughout Northern Ireland, not just in some areas. There are huge pressures of finding homes for families, for individuals. Uh, uh, throughout our towns and cities of Northern Ireland. And I think it's important that we come up with a scheme that will apply widely and not just concentrate in some areas. I think going forward, uh, I, I would like to highlight the, the report uh, which was commissioned, uh, or was, sorry, was published in 2016. That's been a useful review of the Living Over the Shop scheme uh, and it's very, very detailed. For instance, it identifies 30 properties in the town of Larne with the potential for such a scheme being rolled out, 10 in Ballymena and, and, and 20 within Carrick Fergus, the other uh, town centre within my constituency. So, yes, I certainly will. I thank the member for giving way. And, and in reference to the very report, would he agree with me that it is quite clear that the evidence 
and the analysis of a living over the shop scheme is there and it's in place. Now is about getting on with the job and delivering practical schemes which support our town centres. The member has an additional minute. I, I, I agree entirely with the member. And looking at this report, I think it was September 2016, that report has sat on the shelf for virtually four years when this assembly wasn't here. We've had the homeless issue get worse during that period. The, the ideas that were contained in the report have sat there. They have not been addressed. It's important that we go on and deal with it now. But it's important also that we come up with pra pragmatic schemes that will work. If they do not work with those who ha or own the property, if they do not work with potential tenants, if they do not work with perhaps other uh, uh, potential uh, partners, perhaps uh, housing associations, they will not happen. So it's important in designing a scheme, we get a scheme that will work so we, we can provide the homes that are badly needed and revitalise our town centres and improve the footfall and the feeling of safety of people who are living there. Thank you. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I've listened to the debate today. Um, I can see the merits in both the main motion and the amendment, but I have to say on behalf of the Alliance Party that we will be supporting the main motion and not the amendment today. And the reason for that is, is if the grant scheme had have been included in the amendment, then we could have supported both together. I think both are well-intentioned and both are needed, but there does need to be the grant scheme. The report that uh, Mr Beggs has talked about today back in 2016 has already identified that people, uh, businesses, landlords, and departments have recognised the need for a grant income to convert those spaces above um, commercial properties in order to make them habitable. Um, communities is therefore already aware of the need to grant support um, and the establishment of living over shops scheme. Um, in the new decade, new approach, the executive parties all agreed to a housing outcome. Um, I'm looking at Mr Durkin here, it was an SDLP approach that was brought forward and we all agreed to it. I look forward to seeing that outcome developed with clear, clear indicators to achieve better housing. And I think that, to be honest, the living over the shops is one of those aspects that needs to be concluded if we are to achieve the amount of housing that we need for all of our people across Northern Ireland. It is time to move forward the option to develop more living spaces, given the demand for housing is growing. And that's why I can't just go with the amendment, because it talks about the minister who is very committed to housing, going to the executive co colleagues to talk about it. In the situation that we're in at the moment, to be honest, there's so much on the executive's plate. I want to see the action as opposed to just um, considering what might happen. And I do believe that the minister is the person that will take this forward. What I would like to say about the living over the shops scheme is the reason why we need a grant for it. The shop owner may not be able to provide the money themselves to develop those units. When I mean, you think how many of our towns outside Belfast are charity shops. They can't afford to develop residential places above. There's an opportunity through this grant for us to do something different. And a grant that comes with a caveat, it's not a contract, but a grant that comes with a caveat can provide this. So we can consider things like Mr McCann has brought forward, for instance, um, ensure that bins are not stored on the street, that there's actually somewhere provided with the residential property, that it's not, that's not going to happen that it's sustainable living space and it has to include alternative fuel sources to reduce carbon emissions and meet our targets. Innovative alternatives to oil tanks is desperately needed if we're to move away from fossil fuels. The space needs to be inclusive, not exclusive for people with limited mobility. There are an awful lot of our older generation who are looking for town centre living because they can no longer drive and they use public transport. Living in towns, being together safely in towns, is more important than sitting in a three-bedroom house in the middle of nowhere. We have to consider lifts and accessibility options to residential properties that are above ground on, on the first floor. There needs to be consideration about rates and water charges, because as we know, commercial premises would need to split that off from the residential premises. But we need to think about some other way of getting houses and house space available when there is so little land available. We know that work has been done. There have been mapping out made, for instance, in Belfast, and the amount of land that's available for new housing is very low. Meanwhile, we have a number of single men who are still being denied access to the housing market and a number of older people who are faced with bedroom tax. I know we're paying that for them at the moment, 
but time will come when more and more people move on to the benefit system and they will be faced with bedroom tax. I think that we could consider the, town, the Scotland Town Centre Housing Fund, where there's a mix of grant and loan funding. They've done it on a 50-50 basis, and that could reduce a cost to government. Architects and town planners have said to us for years that we need to develop town and city centre living with services that make these spaces welcoming and inclusive rather than frightening and isolated. The last thing that we want to do is to put people into places that, where it's uncomfortable for them. But we have the opportunity to say to those people who owned commercial premises, we have social landlords out there, social housing options, who could come in and take over that space for you. They could buy that space and develop it in a way that would be good for people and meet the objective need. Because there is no point in putting someone into a house that they're not going to be climb, able to climb stairs, they're not going to be able to afford to hate it, or it's not going to be the right space for them. I welcome the motion today. I think that living over the shops is one way that we can get our towns and, and city centres revitalised. But all I would say is that it needs done. It doesn't need to be talked about anymore. We need the grants to become a reality. And I absolutely appreciate that money is going to be extraordinarily tight over the next wee while. The but member's can... time is up. Thank you very much. I call Ms Sinead Ennis. I get, uh, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. I suppose that the crux of Sinn Féin's amendment to the motion uh, before us today is really the need um, to bring the necessary focus on the fact that many people and families do live in housing stress, as a number of members have already outlined, and that we simply do not have the housing stock to meet the need, that we need to begin to address this immediately. And I'm sure members would agree that it would be a far more effective use of public finances. Um, we need our towns and city centres to be vibrant and thriving places to live and work, but that cannot be at the expense of those in the, uh, the greatest need of a home. New Decade New Approach brings focus to build housing in locations of objective need, and Sinn Féin believe adequate housing is a human right, and we will continue to promote this across the island. The level of homelessness north and south needs to be addressed, and Sinn Féin have an ambitious and viable target of building social and affordable housing in line with objective need. While this motion and the amendment talks specifically about our towns and city centres. As a rural MLA in South Down, I feel it would be remiss of me not to mention that rural housing needs have been neglected for far too long. The housing executive retains oversight of new build, but has a poor record of coordinate, coordinating new build in line with objective need and in line with the Rural Needs Act. Housing development in rural locations has missed its target over each of the last five years, and the, the housing executives, rural and place shaping teams need to work with rural communities and their representatives to examine their housing needs and support housing associations in the delivery of new build schemes to address housing need. There are approximately 60 housing association, housing association houses sold each year and 300 housing association homes, sorry, housing executive homes. This stock, as we know, is never being replaced. New build isn't adequately, adequately located in the areas of highest need. The latest housing figures show over 37,000 applicants on the social housing waiting list, and of these applicants, more than 26,000 were in housing stress. The private rented sector plays a big role in meeting housing need, as, as does the social, social housing sector. And therefore, there has been a significant increase in the proportion of households with children living in the private rented, um, private rented accommodation. As the member for Foyle has already outlined, research undertaken by the Centre of Cities 2015 has shown that city centre residents are more likely to be young, single students or professionals. However, almost a third of those experience, experiencing housing stress are families. Indeed, many families are already struggling to obtain their own home in unfair conditions of overcrowding and young families still being penalised for the housing crash over a decade ago. And this amendment brings a further emphasis to support them. The DEP's motion, while on the surface, may look to have merit. It does, however, exclude public money being used to help support those into accommodation who need it most and on the basis of objective need. Sinn Féin supports efforts to revitalise our towns and city centres, and we are very much open to exploring the best options to enhance both social and economic recovery. But the social aspect is completely omitted from the DEP's motion, and that is why we would find it difficult to support the motion as it stands. Go ahead. Does the member accept that some 11 areas already had this scheme and there are many other parts of Northern Ireland that has never been afforded as of yet and that that should be a major consideration? I didn't actually quite hear your comments there, but I mean, go, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I, I remember the scheme uh, back then and it was brought in, I believe, under 
the, uh, the housing led regeneration, which had a particular focus. And that if you look at Belfast, the five areas chosen uh, for it were five unionist areas, and there were, was very little uh, resources pointed towards nationalist areas. And that's the facts of life of this scheme back then. Thank you. Um, the just, member has an additional minute. Okay, thank you. Just, I'm going to conclude anyway. Sinn Féin's amendment is about maintaining the support and supply of accommodation necessary to help struggling families, along with their most vulnerable, to access housing and have security and dignity. And therefore, I would ask members to support the amendment. Gormoigat. Thank you. I call Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, though COVID has added focus to the need to aid the prosperity of our city centres, the issue impacting on them have long predated COVID and will exist even after we recover from this pandemic. The benefits of living over the shop scheme are not just economic. We have a massive housing shortage and affordability issues. Anything that can be done to tackle this must be welcome. Living over the shop properties are also more affordable. They are more affordable to create than new residential bills, and more importantly, they are cheaper to buyers and renters. Changes in demographic and household types are also apparent. Living over the shop schemes provides vital accommodation to our young and single persons' households. We have severe lack of one, two bedroom properties, which is putting stress on our private and social housing market. This is a simple and effective way of dealing with this. Living over that shop schemes are also tied into urban regeneration work. They revitalise town centres without the need for destruction and the eroding of character of our town centres. They enhance the areas, bringing life and vibrancy back into them. In fact, I just want to say quickly uh, that my mother and father lived above the shop in the city centre. Uh, the only other two people in behind that ring of steel, which was then the commercial heart of Belfast, was the caretaker and his wife. Uh, who lived above the Masonic Lodge in Corn Market. The point I'm trying to make by bringing this to, uh, to your mind is this has to be done with planning, and we can't use a blunt instrument like compulsory purchase in order to move those people that find themselves living in city centres out. The benefit to our town and city centre economies cannot be more clear. My parents, as I've already said, lived above the bar for most of their lives. They brought groceries in a family-owned store across the road, brought food from the family-owned butchers on the next street, and brought their clothes in the family-owned stores next to them. In turn, these family businesses and their owners and their customers came into the bar and helped my parents in order to sustain their businesses. In the days of online shopping, these micro-economies are the only way to keep our towns and city centre businesses going. Statistics show our own town centres have an average of 20% non-domestic vacancies uh, levels. A mix of grant and loan schemes for over-the-shop properties in Scotland have proven to be popular. This can bring populations into our city centres and therefore bring revenue to our city centre businesses. In closing, these schemes will help our small business owners, Mr. Speaker, help provide regenerate our cities and town centres and provide people with affordable and practical housing that allows uh, them to live, prosper and enjoy the places where they live. It is a simple solution with a massive impact. I urge you all to support the amendment and the motion. Thank you. Mr John Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I rise to support the motion. Thank those uh, through you who brought it, uh, but cannot uh, support the amendment for reasons, mainly those highlighted by my colleague Kelly Armstrong, which I don't need to repeat, um, around grants and other issues, but uh, more importantly, the need, Principal Deputy Speaker, to move from exploration to action. The motion provides a new opportunity, I believe, to uh, the member for given way. I, I was going to interject it, Ms. Armstrong. Well, I, I certainly concur that it is the time for action rather than exploration. But will the member accept that the motion that he is going to support merely calls on the minister to consider? such a scheme. That's the action, which is about the same as explores such a scheme that the amendment calls for. The member has an additional minute. Thank you, President. Deputy Speaker. I am content with the wording of the motion as illustrated, and I am sure that the member would agree that some of the reports we have talked about and heard about here already today have been around for, for, for years, so we could resume. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, the motion provides a new opportunity to kick-start initiatives aimed at refreshing town centres 
It also offers the potential to revitalise town centres by, by repurposing empty premises above shops, accommodation which in many cases has been vacant for some time, or has been neglected, or has fallen into disrepair. Such initiatives could provide additional housing at competitive prices also, simply by, you could suggest, looking upwards and provide opportunity to tackle the acute shortage of housing, particularly social and genuinely affordable housing, which, as we know, has led to spiralling rent and house prices in many parts of the country. There is, I would suggest, also potential economic benefit. The return of residents can benefit the business below commercially, provide potential staff, perhaps, and repopulate urban twilight zones. People will be interested in the local area, its upkeep and its amenities. There could also, in some instances, be, of course, a greater contribution to local rates revenue. We should, I think, also try to harness the environmental benefit of ideas on this issue, around us on this issue. Not driving to the shops or to work, but rather walking or cycling reduces congestion and consequently air pollution, which is good for the environment, of course. There are, Principal Deputy Speaker, some matters, however, on which I would sound some caution. Living above the shop can have a downside, or potential downsides. A previously desirable home may lose its allure if the retail outlet, such as a bookshop downstairs, suddenly closes and a fried food outlet opens in its place. There could be issues around social isolation, having no immediate neighbours, particularly for those who are vulnerable or those in need of support or a social network, a neighbourhood feeling or, for some people, belonging to a community. Other issues that need to be looked at include security. Sure. Except that living in a town centre can bring opportunities as well, because there are libraries, there are numerous um, groups that will meet in the town centre. So yes, I appreciate there are risks and there's a potential for isolation, but there's much potential for networking and benefiting those individuals who choose to live there. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for the intervention. Hopefully, you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and members will agree. I have just previously highlighted a number of positives around living in a town centre, and I will come to some potential solutions for the, the uh, notes of caution that are rising now. I mentioned fire precautions separate from the shop, uh, probability of high traffic noise, access issues. There needs to be a separate entrance, and ideally one in a well-lit and clearly visible place. Uh, there are ways to ensure that these areas of concern do not outweigh the benefits that I have highlighted previously through, for example, coordination of planning and implementation, by ensuring interdepartmental and interagency working on the issues that I have highlighted, through area planning and joined up working between different levels of government to highlight those pitfalls and provide solutions. Uh, with those in mind and the fact that those, those potential problems do not outweigh the benefits, happy to support the motion, Principal Deputy Speaker. Ms Clare Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I am raising, and the Green Party will be supporting this motion as amended today. And we do that because we believe that housing is a right, not a luxury, and neither is it a commodity to be bought, sold, and traded for financial gain. But unfortunately, that's what we have become, uh, and this is leaded leading to inflated prices, inflated land values, and inflated profits within the private housing sector. We are not in the same situation as our neighbours in Dublin or London just yet, but we are heading there, make no mistake about it. For example, as of March 2019, there were just under 40,000 people on our housing waiting lists, um, and yet in the financial year of 2018-19, we built less than 1,000 new social homes, and at the same time, 7,000 were built in the private sector. This Assembly cannot stand over a situation that places restrictions on our largest housing provider, our largest house, social housing provider, sorry, um, to create new homes while simultaneously providing grant incentives to the private sector. And the Department of Community's own review into a previous similar scheme remarked about the relatively low risk and high reward available to the prospective recipients of grant funding. It seems that some have not learned lessons from previous mistakes for this type of proposal. The over-provision of HMOs in areas such as my own in South Belfast, which have decimated some neighbourhoods and communities, 
created social and environmental problems and have cost millions each year for statutory agencies in trying to manage. But HMOs and lots do serve a purpose, but only when used properly and only with appropriate controls and planning. So that's why I believe the amendment represents a much more balanced and proportionate response to this issue. We do need more high quality, affordable and long term homes. And we do know that single men between the ages of 26 and 59 make up the highest proportion of people on our housing waiting list. We know that we need more one and two bedroom housing units, which lots type of accommodation could help with. But driving more people into the private sector with rising rents is not the answer. The Nevin Economic Research Institute research on housing in Northern Ireland is very clear that affordability is a major issue in the private rental sector because costs are simply too high. And sadly, some of our own housing association rents are also pushing up the boundary of what we consider affordable. We know that we need to reimagine our towns and city centres long before COVID hit, but it has provided us with another reason and opportunity to build back better. And housing-led regeneration is a way forward. Our towns and city centres should be places where people want to live, and there's no quick fix. We can't just throw public money at private property owners to create some new flats and bed sets and expect regeneration to somehow happen on its own. Certainly will. Way. But I want to just ask the member that sometimes some of these old buildings are historical buildings, uh, like Victorian buildings, and we have lost an awful lot of our built heritage. It's just a case of trying to give another lifeline to those businesses which are trying to operate within them. I'm sure the member sees that as a risk as well. Thank the member for his contribution Ms. there. Billy, it's something that you, I will be. You'll have an additional minute. Thank you. Sorry, I'll be addressing exactly that point in a second. Um, but we do need to create livable, breathable urban spaces with good quality housing, green spaces, no congestion, access to health centres, schools, parks, and have a butcher, baker and candlestick maker all within your living space. We do not need to give away grants to create more private rental accommodation um, to make any of this happen. Would the member give away? Yeah, go ahead. I, I share uh, the, the idealistic vision that, that you are creating. But I'm just wondering, how is it going to be delivered? There is government uh, borrowing restrictions which limit the public funds that is available. So if there's not a partnership of some sort with housing associations, with the, public, with the private sector, are you not going to just be looking for a vision and not deliver it? Thank the member um, that for your contribution there. And I assure you that it's not idealistic. It's experience that I'm speaking from. I'm speaking from the experience of a mother who was forced out of private rental due to high rents and lived in a hostel for many, many months before being offered a house and social housing. So there's where my ideals come from. But it's not enough that landlords uh, to make lots available. Um, then perhaps we should be looking a wee bit more closely at why this might be happening. What public policy could be contributing to this? Landlords are already incentivised to sit with vacant commercial property in terms of our rating system. Developers are also incentivised to knock down and rebuild rather than repurpose and reuse um, under our VAT system. In the context of our climate emergency, the impact it has on our carbon em emissions is unforgivable, never mind what this has meant exactly to the point that the previous member made on our built heritage across our province. We can do things better. We can encourage landlords to use their properties better, but we should also be using public money better. So let's work on that. Let's put our focus in, the meet in meeting the needs of our constituents in a sustainable way. Let's use public resource to create public housing at a scale that is actually needed. I'm sorry, Let's redesign our planning system and make it fit for purpose today and focus on creating happier, happier and healthier Northern Ireland for all. Thank, Thank you. you. I call Mr Jerry Carroll. Uh, thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. It, it is uh, undoubtedly the case uh, that city centre and town centre live in. 
uh, would go some way to alleviating local housing crises across the north, in particular in inner city communities. And we must ensure that when we're talking about uh, increased housing across the north, uh, it is first and foremost about getting people the homes they need, and secondly, about doing it in a sustainable and affordable uh, manner. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the intention uh, behind the DUP motion here today. And to me, uh, it seems to be in line with the recent approach to COVID. Uh, the motive is highlighted blatantly to simply get businesses in city centres generating profit again. Um, indeed, this motion comes hot on the heels, Mr Deputy Speaker. You'll be well aware of the sign off of the Tribeca um, development at Belfast City Centre, which was opposed by campaign groups uh, and the thousands of submissions because it presented a threat to social housing, open space, uh, arts and culture, built heritage, as we heard already, uh, and included uh, thousands of square feet uh, of office space. But unfortunately, it was pushed ahead by both the DUP and Sinn Féin. Uh, we can and must do better, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, when planning the future for our town centres to put people's needs first and guarantee sustainability over making a, a quick buck for landlords or big business owners. How many? I'll take a point, yeah. Thank the member for giving way. And while I welcome his initial comments about the need for, for housing space, particularly in our town centres, would he not note the intention and genuine spirit of this motion, which is to look at the thousands of vacant properties within our town centres and note that without a scheme in place to support landlords who are already struggling, we will not be able to provide this additional space within town centres to allow people to live and make our cities and towns vibrant once again. Before I call Mr Carroll, can I remind members intervention should be brief. Uh, Mr Carroll, you have an additional minute. Thank you. Well, I would remind the member that there isn't a, a great practice of uh, grants uh, being handed out in this uh, building uh, through various departments and them being for accessible uh, and uh, public money well spent, a remind him of RHI. So I think there, there has to be concerns raised over uh, the kind of grant scheme that, that he is and his party is suggesting. Um, and I would just to continue in my speech, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, um, how many high quality premium apartments did we see flood the market in Belfast alone when COVID hit and tourists couldn't travel uh, here? enough to prove that these kind of apartments aren't always built with the people uh, who live here in mind. And to go further, Mr Speaker, uh, we would like to see the executive uh, enable uh, the housing executive to, to buy and develop many of these spaces to uh, throw open uh, town and city centres to people stuck uh, on waiting lists. We think that's the best approach to dealing with the housing crisis in our communities. We're not in favour of plan ahead with the profit-driven development of our city centres that has seen hotel hoteliers, businesses given primacy over the objective needs of our communities for uh, too many times. And we're not alone, Mr Deputy Speaker. Academic research says we must uh, move towards more sustainable planning, and the COVID-19 crisis has exposed this um, more than ever, and has exposed the uh, problematic fragility of the direction taken by the executive over the past 10 years. In, in this matter. Mr Speaker, we are for the development of homes in the city centre, but they must be built or developed so they are affordable and up to environmental standards. Therefore, I cannot support the DEP motion here today, but I will support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no other member has indicated they wish to participate in the debate, uh, so I call the Minister to respond to the debate. Uh, the Minister for Communities, Carol McKillen, will have 15 minutes. Minister. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to thank the contributors to the debate up until now, and I also welcome the opportunity to speak on the motion. So, firstly, uh, in relation to addressing the question about living over the shops, um, and the, indeed the debate brought this out um, in a much broader sense, but however, uh, I fully recognise the role. Um, of repurposed and attractive space can play in the success of town centres and making high streets a desirable place to live. Um, however, my priority is providing accessible, quality public housing for those in most need, housing in quality neighbourhoods with access to suitable amenities, repurposing vacant or underused commercial premises as homes can have a role to play. However, the basis for my department to intervene with a subsidy to the private housing market will always be around the provision of public housing 
allocated on the basis of objective need, given the scale of housing stress that was mentioned here today as part of this debate. You have all got the background notes on the Living Over the Shop scheme. The Department funded the scheme for conversion projects from commercial to private residential properties, and the scheme is aimed to encourage the development of homes in empty spaces above high street shops and was targeted primarily at creating private homes for sale or rent. So the LOT scheme was then an attempt to help urban centres by providing housing and reusing buildings. However, the scheme closed to new applicants in 2009, not only due to budgetary constraints, but its failure, absolute failure to deliver on anticipated outcomes. An independent review of the scheme supported this analysis. It was a grant scheme. It did not make any significant difference in, in terms of housing supply or regeneration, and focus then moved on to other work which held more promise. The result the report was clear that there were numerous issues causing the underutilisation of formal, former commercial space in towns and city centres. And some of these issues have been raised today, issues like planning, building control, health and safety, financing, insurance, rates, the layout of the building, disability access. The provision of a small grant scheme or any grant scheme did not significantly overcome these issues, and as a result, the scheme hardly managed to deliver any homes. And moreover, as funding was directed, private and public funding was directed towards the provision of private dwellings, there is no increase, there was no increase in the delivery for public housing. So I personally see no evidence that any of this has changed. And I want to be clear, I do not have any plans to reinstate, under any circumstances, living over the shop scheme. Indeed, the provision of a public subsidy to support the creation of new homes by private developers, potentially at the expense of additional public housing, is something I will not support. No. Given the high level of housing stress here, my primary focus will be on increasing the supply of public housing in future. A grant scheme for developers which does not aim to specifically increase the provision of public housing is not part of my plans. As I mentioned at the start, that does not mean I am not going to look at options or a range of other measures to help reimagine or regenerate our towns and cities. However, uh, putting public money into vacant shop spaces while there is such a growing need for social housing, cannot be reconciled. My department is therefore committed to finding new and innovative ways of increasing the supply and indeed the affordability of housing. I welcome our councils are supporting us through their local development plans to increase the provision of housing in their towns and cities. My department has undertaken a wide range of work to assist councils to develop and implement affordable house, housing policies through the local development plan process, and my officials are keen to continue to collaborate with councils on this very important work. And some of this work includes an advice note on delivering affordable housing with planning conditions for new, any new housing development, a new definition of affordable housing, scoping new types of intermediate housing, including new initiatives within the private rented sector, such as below market intermediate rents. Partnering with Belfast City Council, in part to fund a study to understand the viability of housing development, including affordable housing provision. The housing executive is also engaged with councils at a strategic and scheme basis to ensure housing need is addressed locally. My officials are also working with local authorities on urban regeneration projects and programmes which have a strong housing element, and I would like to highlight some of the work that we are doing. So, for example, in Belfast, a key policy objective we share with Belfast City Council is to increase the residential population living in the city centre and around the city core in line with the local development plan. And this will include the provision of 20 per cent social in, a, in affordable housing and proposed schemes. One example of this process in action is my department's input into the strategic site assessments 
con conducted by Council, which identified a number of key sites currently owned by Belfast City Council. But it's not just Belfast, where my department is taking practical steps to help regenerate our urban uh, centres and provide housing. Right across the north, we are involved in mixed use regeneration schemes, which will deliver affordable and more, so, more social homes. These efforts will undoubtedly improve the economic and social fabric of our town centres. It is clear that there are problems currently faced by towns and city centres, and this needs to be addressed as part of the TEO High Street Task Force. There was a clear lesson in the Living Over the Shops pilot. There are fundamental and, be, and, and issues which went beyond the influence of this scheme. The focus on any future intervention from my department will always remain to target those in most need, and I firmly believe that this focus should be increasing supply to reduce the demand. In the meantime, the Department for Communities will continue to work actively to engage with councils and indeed with other, body, other bodies, uh, particularly in rural communities, to work with their local plans. Now, in relation to some of the um, contributions, um, Jonathan Buckley moved a motion and spoke about the need to revitalise, revitalise our towns. Uh, and city centres, um, and certainly given the economic conditions that we're living in, hardly anyone could, you know, dispute that. However, you know, wedging public money for housing for landlords isn't happening. Fran McCann moved the amendment and spoke about the previous policy and the previous spend, and highlighted the roles that councils are playing and other plans and developments, and spoke about particularly the, the, the challenge that was faced in the past about delivering effective outcomes, and one of those was about inclusion. Mark, you can check these figures out, but I think West Belfast is the highest, North Belfast is next, and then Foyles after that. But to be frank, they're not good. They're in the top three. They have been persistently in the top three because there's been systematic inequality in housing for decades, and that needs to change. So, for example, Mark, spoke about, Mark Durkin spoke about the need to look at opportunities, not only just to have greater supply, but also to ensure that as many housing delivered, good quality housing delivered, without rushing to give grants out, and that's, that's quite appropriate. Roy Beggs uh, spoke next um, in relation to supporting the motion and not the amendment, and spoke about planning concerns and con conservation concerns and planning policies. Um, and while all of those are correct, um, I think it goes back to the point that Pat made. I grew up in Carrick Hill, very great Victorian character, not great plumbing, outside toilets, overcrowding, four generations living under one roof. As twee, not as twee, but as good as our upbringing was, and we have happy memories, and there were good memories, and they did ground us all. Um, I know that given the housing figures and some of the areas of highest demand, you're going to have families getting brought up in a, 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 in a place where it's only meant for a, a one or two bedroom person on their own with no children. Um, I also felt that you know, Kelly and I were on the committee along with Fra and Mark. Um, <clears throat> and I do think there's a nervousness with the alliance around objective need. I honestly do, because I found both your contribution and John's convoluted and confused. While you support the motion and not the amendment, you spoke about NDNA, they spoke about the need for inclusive space, and then went on to talk about some of the concerns around Minister, access. Minister, I'm, I'm loath to interrupt, but you really shouldn't refer to other members as you or you in the debate. If we could just try to keep it through the chair. So, uh, uh, apologies. Apologies. Um, so, um, but the, the issue for me is that I think there's a general acceptance that we've got a housing crisis and we need to look at ways in which to do it. But I just don't personally agree with some of the no thanks with some of the um, ways in which um, the members had suggested. Sinead Ennis also spoke about the NDNA uh, commitment around objective need and particularly in relation to some of the uh, Sinn Féin proposals as part of those negotiations were around removing corporation tax and removing the historic debt to allow the housing executive to 
built more homes, despite the fact of pointing out and she is right that they've missed targets each year. While some years is an explanation, they need to be a bigger champion and they need to be a better advocate for people who are homeless and on the housing waiting list than what they currently are. Um, I want to thank um, Claire um, for bringing her experience in, because I sometimes think that that's missing. Um, and I, I commend the member for South Belfast for her dignity in not responding to the mansplaining that was tried by Mr Beggs. Um, anyone who loses her home in the private rented sector with two small children to go into a hostel is exactly the reason why this amendment needs to be supported and not the motion, in my opinion. And Jerry Carl spoke about the sustainability and the affordability as an issue, as did many other members, and that is the case. Um, housing executive and housing association rents need to be better reconciled. As we've mentioned before, we have people who are refusing housing association homes because they can't afford the rent. And the rent within the private rented sector, even with a public subsidy, is higher than it needs to be. And I do think there is a mission creep going on here. It is a renter's market. And I believe that some of the people who really need social housing not only deserve it, but you know, been held in a, in a situation where they're almost locked into private rented accommodation and feel of nowhere to go is absolutely horrendous. And I too have been there myself with small children. Um, I do think there's a lot to be said, particularly in relation to when we talk about city centre living, and I just want to end on this. Carrick Hill, the market, the Strand, um, all around York Road, they have been part of the city well before a lot of these other places in Belfast emerged. And those communities are still there generations later. And I do believe each of us would have examples of that in our own towns and villages. And it is important to try and sustain communities and try to sustain families. But we also have to be honest. The by and large, the private sector has played a role and has played an important role. I'm not saying that it hasn't a role to play. However, what is not acceptable is that the private rented sector has now been used to deliver a public and statutory duty and obligation, and that is not acceptable. And public money should not be put into the private rented sector at the detriment of people who need a social home. So I thank the members for their contributions uh, and the opportunity to contribute to this debate. Thank you, uh, Minister. As question time begins at 2 p.m. and there are then two oral urgent questions after that, I suggest that the House take its ease. Until then, uh, this debate will continue after question time and the two uh, urgent oral questions. And the next member to speak will be Mr. Cahill Boylan to wind on the amendment. So the House can take its ease for a few moments for a change to the table, please.
Okay, members, it is time for questions to the Executive Office, and we will start with the list of questions. And I call Mr. Pat Catney to ask the first question. Mr. Catney. Thank you. Uh, question one, First Minister. Thank you very much. And we are currently considering the final report of the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition. We will then decide on appropriate next steps, including a decision on the publication of the Commission's report. Call Pat Catney for uh, Minister, I thank you uh, for your answer. At the start of the summer, I was contacted by a young mother with two young children under seven. Uh, she moved into a lovely new home in my constituency, and some people in the area made assumptions about her background and put a union flag and a UVF flag outside her house. In her own words, she said, I don't want this to happen, but I fear for my children if I complain. I was told if I tried to remove the flags, there would be other consequences. Never come to this question. Uh, First Minister, does this sound like the Northern Ireland that both you, I know that you you want, and I want to live in a better Northern Ireland than that. Well, I do thank the member for his question, and I'm very sorry that one of his constituents has had difficulties uh, in this area. Can I say the uh, Commission has had a very extensive stakeholder engagement? Um, they've met with a, a number of people face to face, have received a wide range of written uh, consultation responses as well. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I received uh, the report, I think it was on the 17th of July. Uh, we're currently uh, going through that report with officials and we very much hope that we will be able to come back to uh, the committee and to the Assembly in the near future in relation to our response to the report. Okay, before I call the next uh, question, um, can I remind members who wish to ask a supplementary that we need to uh, remember to raise in their seats? I call Matthew O'Toole. Number two. Thank the member for his question. And, and in response to the Speaker about preparing for Assembly business in the autumn, Deputy First Minister and I provided an early indication of the volume of legislation required for the end of the transition period. The legislative requirements include devolved, reserved, and accepted matters, which means that legislation will be brought forward in both the Assembly and at Westminster. The, identi the identified requirement is focused mainly on secondary legislation and therefore it is anticipated that most of the pressure will in the first instance be on the relevant committees. Departmental officials are briefing their respective committees on the volume of EU exit legislation expected to be brought forward. Call Matthew to supplementary. Mr Speaker, thank you and I thank the um, First Minister for her answer. Um, we are in a very dangerous situation in Northern Ireland. In a few months' time, we will crash out at the end of the transition period. We may or may not have a deal with the EU. Can I ask the First Minister, can I ask both First Ministers, that they urgently step up together and make a joint united plea to the UK Government for serious engagement on delivery of the protocol, protection of all citizens in Northern Ireland, and to stop messing around with our fragile society and protections that exist for everyone here? Member for his uh, supplementary question, uh, and of course, uh, across the executive, we want to see uh, that our businesses are protected at the end of the transition period. That we have unfettered access for our businesses into the GB market, uh, and indeed uh, that the joint committee, which is currently uh, tasked to use their best endeavours uh, to deal with a number of issues identified in the protocol, deal with those issues that are in the protocol, particularly around state aid and indeed around goods at risk of entering the single market, which comes through Northern Ireland. I am uh, amazed that that issue has not yet been solved uh, because it's a very straightforward issue. I know a number of our businesses want to see the certainty around that, and I would again call on the Joint Committee to find solutions to these issues that the member has identified. I call Daglan Magalier, supplementary. The Minister indicate what Brexit-related areas will require assembly primary legislation? Sorry, Speaker, I didn't quite catch that because there seemed to be interference uh, there. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry, uh, can the Minister indicate... Sorry. Can the Minister indicate what Brexit-related areas will require Assembly primary legislation? Yes. 
Sorry, uh, I I didn't hear that initially. Uh, the most recent returns uh, from the 10th of September indicate that consideration has been given to the potential need for three Assembly bills and eight Westminster bills. Um, however, the numbers do remain fluid uh, and, and may change. So it is important uh, that we continue to work uh, with uh, UK Government on all of these issues. The three Assembly primary legislation pieces are an education bill, uh, a health and social care cross-border health care bill and an infrastructure omnibus bill. So those are the three that are currently uh, identified and I hope that's helpful for the member. I call Chris Stafford. Uh, Mr Speaker, could my right honourable friend tell me what her opinion is of the um, assessment that was given by Lord Frost recently that Monsieur Barnier and other EU officials deliberately threatened the food supply of the people of Northern Ireland. Does the First Minister agree with me that such antics are despicable and reflective of an EU bureaucracy that's overplayed its hand? Well, as I think I've already indicated uh, to the member for South Belfast, I do think that the Joint Committee uh, could have dealt with these uh, issues uh, in a quicker fashion. Uh, I do also, and I hear the member for South Belfast saying that uh, what Lord Frost had to say yesterday uh, was a lie. Uh, I have to say he'll need to take that up with Lord Frost. Uh, but I have to say I find it wrong, uh, and I did say at the Joint Committee last week when the Deputy First Minister and I joined the Extraordinary Joint Committee that the EU needs to stop using Northern Ireland to get their own way. We are not the plaything of the European Union. It causes great difficulties here in Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker, when people use Northern Ireland in that fashion. I do recall when the then Taoiseach, now the Taunashta, used a photograph of a blown-up border post to make his point uh, in the European Union in, in October 2018. That was wrong as well. What we need to do is to focus on getting answers for our consumers, for our businesses and for the citizens of Northern Ireland. And it's quite wrong to use hyperbole uh, to get their own way, what we need to see is the actual protection of peace in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Nicole. Steve Egan. May I thank the First Minister for her answers so far? And I note she used the words very clearly, best endeavours. And what I asked the First Minister uh, to uh, discuss with the Executive, uh, making sure that both the EU and the British Government, through the Joint Committee, make a very clear statement very soon about the implications to our food supply, the implications particularly to do with state aid rules, and above all, what may indeed be the very onerous position that we may be placed in as an assembly under the jurisdiction of the ECJ coming the beginning of next year. Well, I thank the member for his question. And when I refer to best endeavours, of course, I am specifically referencing Article 6 of the protocol, uh, which uh, says very clearly that the European Union and the United Kingdom shall use their best endeavours uh, to facilitate the trade between Northern Ireland and other parts of the United Kingdom. I think what we need to see is more of that best endeavours actually <laughs> being put into action so that we can get a solution to some of the issues that are still outstanding uh, in relation uh, to the protocol. And uh, neither the Deputy First Minister or I, or indeed the entire executive, will be found wanting in our engagement with the UK Government and indeed with the European Union. We have had the extraordinary uh, Joint Committee just last Thursday, at which we both attended. Uh, the junior ministers attend on an ongoing basis uh, meetings with the Paymaster General in relation to the negotiations, and we will continue to engage at the highest level that we can to get across the fact that we need solutions for the people of Northern Ireland. That's what's important. Again, I call Andrew Muir. Uh, Mr Speaker, the House of Commons will consider the Internal Market Bill today. Does the First Minister not agree it is entirely inappropriate for any government to announce its intention to break international law and is precisely not the way to successfully conclude negotiations? Well, I think as I understand uh, the Internal Market Bill, they are notwithstanding clauses uh, and therefore the hope is that there will still be a negotiated settlement through the Joint Committee and in particular around a, a free trade agreement in totality. Uh, that's certainly uh, what we want to see, uh, an agreement which gives us clarity for our businesses, our consumers uh, and indeed our citizens here in Northern Ireland. We want to see that agreement put into place. We recognise that time is very short 
in relation to all of this, and we will not be found wanting in our continued engagement, despite all of the other pressures, because we recognise how important it is to find solutions in these matters. Okay, thank you. Moving on, I call Linda Dillon. Where am I, I'll get case number three, question number three. Thank the member for her question. The member will be aware that we have indicated that it is our intention to appoint an Attorney General by means of an open competition based on the principles that apply to public appointments. And while the post of the Attorney General is not regulated by the Office of the Commissioner for Public Appointments for Northern Ireland, it is our intention to adhere to the spirit of the Commissioner's Code of Practice relating to public appointments. We have also decided that it would be timely to review the various aspects of the role of the Attorney General since the post has now been in existence for over 10 years. The outcome of this review will feed into the appointment process and we will be considering proposals on the review process in the near future. Linda Dillon, supplementary. Does the Minister agree that given the very significant challenges that we face at the moment, particularly around COVID and, and Brexit, that it is important that this process is completed and I accept what you're saying around the process, and I think that that is important, and it's good that you're following the process. But it is important that we have some time frame for this. I thank the member for her, her question, and I am advised by the office that an open competition can take in the region of six months uh, from start to completion. Uh, that's why uh, Deputy First Minister and I have appointed the interim Attorney General for a period of one year, so that we can have continuity of advice. And can I just take this opportunity, Mr Speaker, to pay tribute to the outgoing Attorney General. It's the first opportunity I have had to do so. Um, Mr Larkin QC has been in place for over 10 years, uh, over some very turbulent times. And I believe he did uh, discharge his functions in a, in a very good way towards all of the ministers of the executive, because, of course, he was the executive's principal legal adviser, an onerous task. And I just want to wish him well for the future and in his future career. Thank you. Moving on, I call Mr Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, First Minister, that will be question number four. Thank you. Thank the member for his question. And discussions take place on a regular basis between the four nations of the United Kingdom on a range of matters, including the communication of public health information. Our overall messages are aligned and consistent. These are regular hand washing, social distancing, and the wearing of face coverings. The executive has set out its own roadmap to recovery and renewal. Decisions on the unfolding local context are based on medical and scientific evidence. We have deployed a high-impact public information campaign using television, radio and print and digital platforms to ensure people in Northern Ireland understand how to stay safe and save lives. Sir Harry Harvey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, First Minister. First Minister, at the multiple Four Nation meetings, has the idea of an agreed joint position on the fight against COVID heading into the winter period been discussed? Thank the member for his questions. And indeed, uh, there is currently a proposal for a UK-wide public information campaign. Uh, this is entitled Hands, Face and Space and is currently being tested here in Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland and in Wales. I think this will be a heavyweight uh, UK-wide campaign. Uh, it is consistent with our messages and will amplify the call to adhere to the public health advice. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who chairs our quadrilateral meetings, is very keen um, that we have an agreed platform for the UK nations, uh, and he's keen to have that signed off uh, as soon as we can. I'm going to call Jerry Carroll. Ask the First Minister, in regards to the recent uh, changes to restrictions, can the Minister provide us with the evidence that says this virus can spread in homes of over six people, but not in workplaces or schools of more than six people? Yes, uh, absolutely. As you know, the executive acts on the advice given by the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. And based on our very good track, trace and protect system, uh, we have been able to identify that the source of most of the COVID uh, spreading in the community is caused by household activities, whether that is people going around for coffee or mixing socially in people's homes, uh, or indeed the dreaded house parties, which unfortunately are still taking place. 
So the reason why we've acted in the way that we have, in this graduated way, is because the evidence is pointing to the source of uh, the spread of COVID being from our homes. I wish it was otherwise, uh, but that's unfortunately, Mr Speaker, where the evidence is pointing to. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, whatever confusion might arise within the Four Nations, I suspect the First Minister will agree that the greater challenge lies at home in the undermining of the Executive's message by the episode and the Deputy First Minister's attendance at the story funeral. Can I ask the First Minister, has the Deputy First Minister apologised to her? She hasn't apologised to the public, but has she apologised to the First Minister for attending the funeral and breaching your own joint regulations? Well, I think the uh, Deputy First Minister has uh, acknowledged that the events at the end of June fundamentally undermined uh, the messaging from the Northern Ireland Executive and that there was a, a, a confused message coming out. Uh, it is right that we have had an acknowledgement uh, of that undermining of uh, public health messaging. Uh, and now investigations will continue, as you know, in relation to police investigations and assembly investigations. But let me say this to the assembly and indeed to anyone else that's listening. We are at a tipping point in relation to COVID-19. And I know, Mr Speaker, that there are those who think um, that we are scaremongering about this issue. And I just want to address that. We are not. We are not. We are in constant contact with our chief medical officer. And again today, I am advised that the postcodes which we have particular concern about, uh, that concern is very much still there. And I do not want to see that spreading across Northern Ireland. We have to act to stop that spreading across Northern Ireland and actually stop people in those postcode areas from uh, spreading COVID-19. Because whilst hospitalisation numbers are not yet growing, we all know that there's a lag in terms of hospitalisations and ICU admissions. And I don't want to be standing here in four weeks' time and talking about the huge rise in hospital numbers. I want us to act on it now so that we can get on top of this COVID-19 issue. And when you look at what the BMA is saying today around the fact that over 80% of doctors fear a second wave, Mr Speaker, I think it would be very remiss of us if we did not act and if we did not take action. And I call Martina Anderson. Um, Minister, given, as you know, Ireland is a single epidemiological unit and the virus doesn't recognise in any borders, do you agree, Minister, that there needs to be a consistency in message across this island uh, on public health approach as well as across the islands? I thank the member for her question. As she knows, we have said in our own plan for dealing with COVID-19 that it's important uh, that we continue with our Four Nations approach, particularly in relation to how we fight uh, the virus through the Joint Biosecurity Centre, where the Health Minister receives a lot of his high-level engagement around other jurisdictions across the world. Uh, but of course it's important that we continue to work with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland as well, so that we can understand what is happening in that jurisdiction, and that if we have to take a, a different route uh, in any one uh, case, that we understand why we're doing that and we can then talk to each other uh, about the messaging. So that continual um, conversation with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, as well, of course, as with the other four nations, uh, the other three nations, will continue. And indeed, we have another conversation this afternoon uh, with colleagues from Scotland and Wales uh, and the Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster in relation to these issues. And I call Robbie Butler. And I thank the First Minister for answer to Mr. Wells, uh, Mr. Wells, Mr. Alistair's supplementary question. But on the topic of confused messaging, why would the increasingly erratic MP for East Antrim have formed the opinion that the First Minister was not on the same page as the Health Minister in regards to local restrictions in Ballymena and Belfast? Well, can I say to the member, I think it is important to acknowledge that those of us who have the privilege of sitting on the executive have then the onerous task of taking decisions that impact right across Northern Ireland. That is a big uh, onerous task to have, to have on our shoulders. And I totally understand that other colleagues, and indeed those from other parties, may want to challenge us on the decisions uh, that we take. I stand full square with the decisions that we took in the executive last Thursday. I think they were the right decisions. They were the appropriate, proportionate decisions at that time. 
I know that there are concerns about those decisions, but I am asking the community in Northern Ireland to work with us to defeat coronavirus and to minimise the number of deaths from this dreadful pandemic, because it is so important that we continue to give leadership in that way. And moving on to question five, Joanne Bunding. Question five, please. Thank the member for her questions. Officials have held meetings with representatives of the main institutions found responsible for systematic failings in the Hart report. These have focused both on providing relevant information to the redress board and on the moral obligation to contribute to the redress costs. Now that the redress scheme has launched, we are keen to begin negotiations with a view to ensuring a fair and proportionate outcome. The next steps will include a roundtable meeting with all the institutions to set out the principles for negotiations. Ministers are currently considering how best we can give visible leadership to this very important process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Uh, given the Roman Catholic Church is as wealthy as some countries, have the bishops given any indication of a notional figure uh, that they will contribute and a timescale for payment? And also, are ministers willing to be directly involved in ensuring the church and other smaller orders make appropriate reparations? Well, I think in, in terms of the latter uh, question, very much so. We will be uh, involved in, in that discussion uh, and negotiation. Um, in terms of the cost estimates for financial redress, they range from about $149 million at the lower end up to $402 million. Uh, as a central estimate, and then up to $668 million at the upper end. And of course, co uh, contributions from institutions could help defray some uh, of those costs. And a meeting with the two uh, archbishops, that is the Roman Catholic Archbishop and the Church of Ireland Archbishop, uh, had been discussed, uh, and we will shortly be writing uh, to both archbishops and indeed the institutions, because I think what we need to try and understand is the fact that the institutions are separate. Uh, institutions, and that sometimes makes it complicated in terms of uh, gaining contributions and having those conversations. So, absolutely, we're going to continue with the negotiations. We're going to have those conversations because we think there is a moral imperative in relation to this issue, so that we can put an end to this very dark stain in our history. Thank you, Nicole Framacan. Don't call you. Uh, can the Minister advise if any progress has been made on the apology as recommended by Judge Hart? I thank the member for his question. Uh, as the member knows, there, was, uh, there has been an interim uh, advocate uh, in place, and he was working uh, with the groups in relation uh, to the apology. There has been, uh, I think it's fair to say, a bit of a breakdown between some survivors and the interim advocate. And so the executive office was separately engaging with one of those groups in a, in a parallel process, if you like. So uh, we're waiting to hear uh, from the interim advocate. We're also very close to the end of a process in connection with the appointment of a full-time commissioner. And we very much look forward to making an announcement in relation to that issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know it's something that this House has taken a keen interest in. Uh, and it's also something that we want to pursue as well. So that commissioner, when he or she is appointed, will certainly be taking up the issue of an apology, an issue of the memorial, as well as, of course, of dealing with victims' needs uh, and, indeed, the redress scheme as well. I call Cara Hunter. Mr Speaker, uh, and I thank the First Minister for her answers uh, so far. We welcome all and any progress uh, in victims receiving payments. Um, can I ask the First Minister, uh, you had alluded to previously that you're in conversations with um, other uh, aspects of the Christian belief, but is there any money secured in addition to the Catholic Church, or are you still having a conversational, is that still in a conversational stage? Thank you. Well, uh, of course, the um, government, when we set up uh, this process, said that we felt very strongly that we had a responsibility to uh, give redress to the people who had been through such a horrific time uh, as a result of being in an institution. But we do fundamentally believe that there is a moral imperative upon some of those institutions to come forward. 
uh, and to talk to us about reparation uh, for what happened in those institutions. So we will be pursuing those conversations, Mr Speaker, because we believe it's something that this House wants us to pursue and indeed the public in general. Okay, and I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Question eight. Sorry, sorry First Minister. I thought you were asking a supplementary. You were, you were ahead of yourself. So. Okay. I'm moving on then to... Uh, I'll move on to uh, Michelle Magaldine. Question six. Thanks to the member for her question. And the Executive Office has designated the Department of Justice to exercise the administrative functions of the Victims Payment Board and has agreed to provide grants to the Department to establish the scheme's administrative arrangements. This will allow the recruitment of board members, IT developments and other steps needed to establish the board to proceed. A substantial programme of work is underway with the Department. However, more work remains to be implemented before a scheme of this complexity and magnitude can become operational. Deputy First Minister and I will be meeting the Justice Minister shortly to discuss next steps. Michelle Magalveen, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the First Minister for her response. Further to that, could I ask the First Minister if all ministers in the executive are now committed to ensuring victims who have already been waiting far too long receive their payments at the earliest possible point, regardless of any dissatisfaction that they might have around issues such as eligibility or indeed any other matters? I thank the member for her supplementary question. I very much hope that it is the case that all ministers are on board for this now. We've had a, a court case which has been quite divisive, Mr Speaker. I think it's important that we now move on and get the scheme uh, implemented as quickly as possible. As I've indicated, there is a substantial programme of work that has to be uh, carried out by the Department of Justice. We will support the Department of Justice where we can uh, in relation to that. So, for example, to give an indication of what needs to be uh, achieved, we need uh, an appointment for the President of the Victims Board by the Lord Chief Justice, um, and then the appointment and induction of board members by the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Committee. Uh, we need to secure additional funding uh, from Westminster in recognition that this just isn't a scheme that operates here in Northern Ireland, but across the United Kingdom. Uh, we need the finalisation of an IT system, an appointment of an assessment services provider, the development of an assessment process, and then agreement by the Victims Payment Boards of its government and decision-making policy. So there's a big job of work to be done. We're up for that job of work, uh, but we need to do it in quick time so that we can get funding out to many victims who need to have their victims' needs acknowledged, first of all, by the payment, and then hopefully the payment will ease some of the suffering that they're currently enduring. Thank you, Nicole. Colin McGrath. Mr Speaker, would the First Minister agree with me that it's important that the First and Deputy First Minister offer an apology to those victims that they forced to go to court to secure their right to that pension? Well, I have to say to the member it is a matter of deep regret uh, that, uh, that members, not just one member, but indeed um, many members of the victim community and survivors community felt that they had to go to court to have this matter dealt with. Uh, I hope now that we can move on in a fast time and that we can support the Department of Justice to have this issue dealt with as quickly as possible. We do, of course, need to deal with the funding issue, and we will deal with that. Uh, but it's important that we have all the processes in place uh, as well. And as I've indicated, there are quite a number of processes that need to be dealt with. So very much want to see this dealt with as quickly as possible. It would, of course, have been my wish that it was dealt with in the appropriate manner. Olivia Flynn. Uh, yes, Gormi Agakan Kolya. Um, does the Minister agree that there would be a compelling responsibility on the Westminster Government to help fund this scheme? Well, I think that that is right because uh, if you look at the uh, Treasury's own guidance in relation to uh, funding, it clearly says that funding follows the person who has made the policy decision, and the policy decision uh, was made at Westminster by the, Secretary, by the then Secretary of State. So it's important that we continue to work with the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Finance, the Deputy First Minister and myself so that we can get the appropriate funding in place. We have to do that. Uh, it's not a we would like to do that. We have to do that to make sure that the funding is in place. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And uh, I call on Ms. Uh, Martina Anderson. Before doing so, I just to notify members that 
questions two and four have been withdrawn. So, call Martina Anderson, topical. Um, Minister, do you agree with the assessment from Nicholas Sturgeon that the Internal Market Bill is a full frontal attack on this Assembly? Um, well, as the member knows, um, there are differing views on Brexit in the uh, executive. Uh, each of us uh, took different views at the time of the referendum. Um, in terms of the Internal Market Bill, uh, it is to try and deal uh, with non-discrimination and mutual recognition for goods going from the Northern Ireland market into the GB market. As the member will know, uh, the GB market is our largest market, so it is important that we have unfettered access into that market, and that is what I hope this bill will achieve. Supplementary. Minister, part six of the bill, as you know, it gives uh, it empowers British ministers to override the budgetary role of this assembly and to make spending decisions without consulting with you, without consulting with the ministers and without consulting with the finance minister. So, Minister, are you saying that this unacceptable level of interference and the undermining of the Good Friday Agreement is justified? I think what I'm saying to the member is that it's important that the UK market succeeds into the future, uh, because as I've just indicated, the UK market uh, is the most important. When you add all of the other markets together, it's not as big as the GB market. Therefore, it's important that we have uh, a free flow, and that internal market bill uh, goes some way to dealing with that. Not dealing with all of the issues, deals with some issues, deals with uh, issues around uh, unfettered access, the export declarations. And I am sure that no one in this House would want to see a fettering of access to the GB market uh, for all of our businesses and consumers. One of the things that concerns me is that the Joint Committee still has not come to a determination on goods at risk. And therefore, that still remains a huge issue for us. And as I've already indicated, that should not be used as a bargaining chip, but instead it should be dealt with as quickly as possible. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, would you agree with uh, the Lord Chief Justice Sir Declan Morgan's comments that breaking of international law could undermine trust in the government and the administration of justice? I think it is important that all of us uh, look to the law on these issues and that we look back again at the protocol, which of course my party uh, argued against, voted against. We didn't believe it was good for Northern Ireland, still don't believe it is good for Northern Ireland. Uh, this internal market bill uh, is dealing with some of the issues in that protocol. But it's important to look back at, at that protocol, and that protocol says in its preamble that the application of this protocol should impact as little as possible on the everyday life of communities in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, having regard to the importance of maintaining the integral part of Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom's internal market. That's what I want to see happening. I don't like all of the protocol. In fact, I vehemently don't like it. But what we have to do now is to clarify those issues, which should be dealt with in the Joint Committee but they haven't thus far. So again, I make the plea that they're dealt with so that we can move on. Stuart Dixon, supplementary. Thank you, and thank you for your answer so far. Uh, Minister, Minister, would you not agree with me that um, any change to an international agreement undermines uh, trust and confidence of the nation that entered into that agreement, uh, and that it has the potential uh, to make the United Kingdom look like a rogue state in the international community? Well, I'm sure that the United Kingdom government will take all of the legal advice that is available to them on all of these issues. But I, I do say again to the member that the EU and the UK have a job of work to do. Uh, Article 1 of the protocol states very clearly that the protocol respects the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom. I have yet to see much evidence for that, Mr Speaker, uh, and we need to see evidence of that. Yes, for me as a constitutional unionist, of course, but also for our businesses and our consumers and our citizens. They all need clarity. We should have had that clarity by now, and unfortunately, we're still in a position where there's negotiations ongoing. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister what the key objectives that she wants to see as outcomes are the outcomes of the ongoing Brexit negotiations? 
Well, I do want to see uh, a top line. I would like to see uh, a, an EU-UK free trade agreement, tariff-free agreement, so that we can continue with that. And as I understand it, uh, what has been put forward by Lord Frost as the UK negotiator uh, is in line with other uh, trade agreements made by the European Union with other nations. So there is a. a he, he can't really understand why uh, the EU is putting up such a defence to some of the issues that has been raised. Uh, and then, of course, the key issues, as I understand it, from the chief negotiator that are, is outstanding at the moment is around state aid, uh, fisheries, uh, and then, of course, the protocol operation, which is dealt with in, in the Joint Committee. So there's much to do, and I hope we can achieve that so that we can have free trade uh, between ourselves and the European Union, but importantly for our main market, that we continue to have that unfettered access. Trevor Clark, supplementary. And can I thank uh, the First Minister for answering? I suppose, following the previous questioners, do you actually believe that the parties, all the parties, recognise the potential impact to Northern Ireland economy if there is an unsatisfactory conclusion to the talks? Sometimes when I, I listen to EU negotiators and they talk about peace in Northern Ireland, it, it is apparently only if we have free access north-south. There's very little uh, conversations about access east-west. And of course, we do need that in a more fundamental way. I can understand why the north-south issue uh, was such a big issue, uh, and I recognise that. But there were other ways to deal with that, Mr Speaker. Those other ways were poo-pooed and not listened to. And unfortunately, we now find ourselves in this situation. So there needs to be an acknowledgement that east-west the integrity of the United Kingdom needs to be protected uh, as much as having to deal with the North-South uh, trade. Thank you. And I call Emma Rogan. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on the Executive Working Group on, on Mental Health and Wellbeing, Resilience and Suicide Prevention? I thank the Member for a question. This is indeed uh, a very important issue that we resolve to, to deal with at one of our very first uh, executive meetings. Um, I think the Minister of Health, if I'm correct in quoting him, said it was one of the most apolitical meetings that he had ever seen, because everybody just wanted to try and find solutions, which at that time was pre-COVID. Uh, so now we're having to deal with COVID as well as all of the other pressures uh, facing people right across Northern Ireland. So we've had, our, we've had a number of meetings of the working group. It's something that we're very much all committed to working through. Uh, and of course, after that, we have to find the funding uh, to deal with many of the issues that will be identified. Amber Rogan, supplementary. Will the Minister reaffirm her commitment to tackle the issue of poor mental health and suicide in the areas of greatest social need? Member, and one of the things we're doing is having uh, some scoping work carried out for us so that we can try and identify where the need is uh, and also whether different aspects of interventions are needed in different areas. So I think that, that is important to acknowledge. Uh, I should have also said, of course, that one of our NDNA commitments was to appoint a mental health champion. Very pleased that Professor Siobhan O'Neill has been put into that role, uh, and she is already providing leadership in this area, and we're very pleased to see that she's doing that. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, returning to the issue of, of the coronavirus, uh, First Minister, can you confirm if a date has been set for a meeting of, of the British Irish Council? Uh, to discuss the issue of common messaging and common themes and indeed a common policy in relation to travel in the common travel area? Well, as you know, uh, the F Deputy First Minister and I have requested uh, this British Irish Council meeting. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, a date as yet, and as I understand it, uh, the standing date for a British Irish Council meeting is coming up very soon. Uh, if the, uh, we don't get the freestanding meeting before that meeting, you can bet your bottom dollar that we will definitely be bringing this issue up at the BIC. Answer in that regard, it is important that the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement are used in their totality, and they, have, they can come into their own here in terms of north-south and east-west relationships. So, uh, I, I welcome the fact that the minister is going to push for that date. And would she agree that it is vitally important that we have a common messaging and common uh, understanding of the issues facing us as a result of COVID-19 of COVID across these islands? 
Well, absolutely. It's important that we understand where every jurisdiction is in relation to the battle uh, against COVID. Uh, we did raise this issue uh, with the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster just, I think it was last week, the Deputy First Minister raised this issue again. Uh, and he said he was in favour uh, of holding a British Irish Council meeting to discuss these matters. So we hope that that will happen in the near future, Mr. Speaker, so that we can discuss the totality of issues that we want to discuss. Thank you. And I call Robbie Butler. Mr. Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister if she has a time frame for the setting up of the Office for Identity and Culture and the appointments of an Irish Language and Ulster Scots Commissioner? Well, as the member uh, knows, uh, we entered government again uh, back on the 11th of January with a whole raft of issues under the new decade, new approach. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, with the interruption which has been caused by COVID, we haven't been able to proceed in as fast a manner as uh, we would have liked. However, having said that, there have been a number of NDNA commitments that we have been able to proceed with, and those that we still haven't been able to proceed with, uh, we will certainly look to proceed with them in the 2020-2021 uh, period. Uh, so, for example, in terms of what we have achieved, we have appointed, or rather the Northern Ireland Office has appointed a Veterans Commissioner. We have an expert panel on tackling educational underachievement established, and the work is underway there. Uh, just today, we have had the flag regulations laid in the Assembly. We have had the interim mental health champion I have just referred to appointed and in place. And we have also had confirmation that contaminated blood victims in Northern Ireland will have increased payments in line with Great Britain. Those are just an example of some of the things we have been able to proceed with uh, in NDNA. But of course, there is much more that we need to do as well. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Uh, indeed, some, work ha some good work has already uh, happened out of NDNA. Would the uh, First Minister be confident that nothing has happened within this COVID pandemic to shake the, uh, the relationship within the executive to deliver on all the promises under NDNA? I think we have a very clear understanding right across the executive, right across the five parties, that the reason we came back into this place was on the basis of the NDNA agreement and therefore all of the things that we have committed to in that. And don't forget there are some of the things uh, in that NDNA that we need to discuss around prioritisation and funding and what have you, not the matters that he has discussed, but there are other issues that uh, are just mentioned in the possible or could. Uh, but there are things that we have all committed to and therefore we need to proceed. I get a call. Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister if the remarks today by the MP for East Antrim have undermined the Northern Ireland Executive's common message on COVID? Well, I think he meant the First Minister, not the Deputy First Minister. <laughs> Uh, Steve, Steve, it's good to have a bit of fun uh, in the Assembly. Um, I think what is important is that the executive continues to give a very clear message in relation to COVID and the fact that we are in a dangerous position. Now, I think I have underlined that through what I have said today. Others will uh, challenge and uh, maybe even criticise at times, but when we are in the executive office, uh, we have to show leadership in terms of the functions that are given to us and the advice that is given to us, and that is what I, I will continue to do. Before I call Mr Reagan for a supplementary, I would like to thank the, and commend the First Minister for her handling of that intervention. First Minister as well for handling of that intervention as well, but my supplementary is, bearing in mind the remarks from the East Antrim MP, would she care to comment on the remarks from her, further de from her Deputy First Minister? I'm not giving an apology to the people of Northern Ireland for the events of the 30th of June, which has considerably undermined the message for health for everybody who's trying to deal with COVID. Well, I seem to be answering questions for a whole range uh, of people today, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will want to address the issues that the member has raised himself. I've already answered Mr Alistair in relation to that question. I think it was important to uh, reflect uh, on what had been said and done back at the end of June. We now are very much focused on delivering very strong messaging in relation to COVID-19, and I think it's important that we continue to do that. They call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister for an update on implementing the Ulster Scots element of the new decade, new approach? 
Uh, as I've indicated, uh, all of those elements in the new decade, new approach that we haven't yet been able to implement, that doesn't mean work hasn't been ongoing from an uh, official's point of view. There have been a uh, number of meetings in relation to the Office uh, for Identity, uh, the Irish Language Commissioner, the Ulster British Commissioner. Uh, so it's important that we continue along the road and get uh, moving in relation to all of our NDNA commitments. It's important that we deliver on the reason why we came back uh, into this assembly. Brief question, Mr. Uh, Eason. Um, can I ask the, the Minister and thank him for her answer? What are your hopes for the new Veterans Commissioner? Well, I very much welcome the appointment of the Veterans Commissioner by the Northern Ireland Office. I think all of us in this House will know Danny very well. We'll know that he'll be very committed to working on behalf of veterans right across Northern Ireland. He has a big job of work. I think we all acknowledge that because there are some, some difficulties for veterans uh, in accessing what they need. And I very much look forward to meeting with him in the near future so that we can have a discussion on what he has already identified as the needs of that community. Members, the time is up, and I would ask members just to take a raise for a moment to switch the seats. Okay, members, we now move on to questions to the Minister for the Economy, and I call Daniel McCrossan. All right, that question has been withdrawn. I call John Blair. Number two, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I uh, thank the member? I lost you there. <laughs> can I thank the member um, for his? Uh, question. Um, it is indeed a very important one and one that's very close to my heart. Um, I have argued many, many times um, that young people should not be the casualty of economic downturn um, and providing them with uh, a place in university is of the utmost importance. So thank you for your question. We have a responsibility to our young people as I argued in August, if uh, additional places in the associated funding is required within the higher education sector to honour pre-existing offers, then it is incumbent upon us as an executive to ensure that these are provided. As such, I have already secured agreement from the executive to do so, with 3.2 million being allocated for additional places. This is a significant investment in young people's lives. However, anticipating some of the difficulties um, that would happen this year, um, my uh, department had already looked at the potential impact of COVID for the year 2020-2021, creating uh, additional uh, demand for local places. Through the June monitoring round, an additional allocation of 1.5 million was also secured, which would deliver an increase of 5% funded places over three years. At the end of three years, the recurring commitment to maintain that 5% uplift will be 7.1 million. 
This will see an additional 1,232 places available within the local uh, higher education sector, 410 of which are available also for this academic year. While we are still working with the universities to complete the process, Ulster University has already stated that it will not require further additional places. While Queen's is not yet in a position to formally confirm their additional numbers, current indications are that they are not as substantial as previously indicated. As a final point, I would note the wealth of higher education opportunities available at our uh, further education colleges, where available courses uh, offer outstanding education and opportunity for young people. Thank you. You will now call uh, John Blair supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for, for the answer and the, the information given? Can I ask further to that reply, uh, Mr. Speaker? Has the Minister identified any support that can be given to further educational colleges whose numbers and courses may be affected due to increase in uh, university places where, where that is the case? Um, I understand exactly uh, the question and uh, the problem that's identified uh, by the member. Indeed, I was up at uh, the Northern College in the Newton Abbey campus um, a few days ago um, looking at how young people are finishing their vocational courses and getting uh, their, um, on with their career paths and was really impressed by the standard of teaching and the interaction with those young people. There is no doubt um, that um, the additional places that will be created for universities and actually on the other side of the coin the additional places that will be created in sixth form colleges as a result of GCSE grade uplifts will actually pose a challenge um, for our further education sector and I will work with the sector uh, to deal with that we are still a couple of weeks away from knowing the full extent of that challenge, but I will be happy to report back to the House when we have those full figures. And of course, I'm immensely proud um, of our further education sector and look forward uh, to working with them to ensure that no child is left behind. I call Kiva Archibald. Uh, and I thank the Minister for, for her answer so far. Um, this will be a difficult and uncertain year for, for many students. Part-time jobs will be hard to come by. And at the end of the last academic year, the Minister and the Executive allocated additional funding to the Student Hardship Fund. Can I ask the Minister if she will consider doing so again this year to support students facing financial difficulties? Thank you. Um, as uh, the member uh, is aware, um, I had uh, taken some uh, fairly extensive steps to ensure that students were supported um, in uh, their route uh, through university, and particularly since many young students will not have the opportunity to have um, additional um, part-time work, etc. Um, and that is why um, we have a, an additional 5.6 million in the system to deal with the issue of student hardship. And of course, we will look at this um, throughout the year, monitor it, and see that we can uh, ensure that young people are able to stay on at our colleges and universities, because some of the money also went in that direction, um, uh, and ensure that they find career pathways uh, and profitable and genuine employment. Thank you. And I call Jim Allister. Uh, last week, the Health Minister announced that Queen's University was making available 80 extra medical school places. Can the Minister tell the House, does that meet entirely the demand from those disappointed with, uh, until their grades were upgraded? Uh, or is there any knock-on effect on next year, which would be most unfortunate for that upcoming cohort? Um, can I thank the member uh, for his question? Um, but the issue of medical places is a matter for the Department of Health, which has the policy remit in this area and sets the numbers that are applicable uh, for each course. So I would advise the member to speak to the Health Minister um, and get an indication from him uh, as to how those numbers uh, are progressing. In general, can I say, 
um, that um, for courses that are very, very high demand, like uh, medicine, nursing, midwifery, um, there will be um, potentially uh, a difficulty there. I understand that the health minister has made a bid to the finance minister to satisfy those place numbers, um, and uh, I'm sure he will update the member on the outcome of that bid. And I call Mark Durgan. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answers. Can the Minister, as the Minister with responsibility for further and higher education, explain why it has taken years, an extremely detailed uh, business case and unprecedented lobbying to get the medical school at McGee eventually approved, and yet these extra medical places at Queen's in Belfast can be agreed without such a business case and apparently at the drop of a hat. Um, well, of course, the member will know that we are in extraordinary and unprecedented times, and I apologise if those words are somewhat overworked uh, in the current context, but we are in those uh, extraordinary times. Young people this year um, did not have the opportunity to sit their exams, faced a period of great uncertainty I'm glad that my colleague moved to uh, take away that uncertainty, that the grades uh, issue was sorted out, and that many of those young people will find placements uh, in uh, medical school in Northern Ireland. I really look forward to those young people completing their courses and contributing to our society here in Northern Ireland. The member will also be aware that we have been supportive um, of uh, the Graduate Entry Medical School uh, at McGee. And that work is ongoing and will be ongoing. Um, and I understand that we will be on course uh, for an intake of students in September 2021. I call Catherine Kelly. To three, question three, please. Apologies, Mr. Speaker. Can I uh, thank the member uh, for uh, her question? Um, the executive has provided an unprecedented level of support to businesses since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The business support schemes introduced by my department on behalf of the executive have provided uh, around £340 million of support to over 32,000 businesses in Northern Ireland. This is in addition to the business rates relief from the Department of Finance, valued at over £300 million, and to a suite of other local support measures, including those introduced by local council. Um, and I was, um, and I know it's not the member's uh, direct constituency, but I was delighted to be uh, in Mid-Ulster for the launch of their uh, £1 million business support intervention scheme uh, just uh, the other week as well. And many working together, we're, there, there is many levels of support for businesses. Indeed, in West Tyrone, claims to the UK government's job retention scheme and the self-employed income support scheme together totaled over £50 million to that constituency. More widely, businesses throughout Northern Ireland have also received substantial support from the UK government schemes, with uh, um, almost 250,000 workers being furloughed um, and, and around 78,000 claims made to the self-employed income support scheme. I do acknowledge that not all businesses have received support to date, either through being ineligible for business support schemes or for the UK-wide schemes. Over the past six months, I have met with a wide range of business owners to hear their concerns uh, for their business. I provided a paper to the executive on the options to utilise available funds for our economic response and recovery. That included options for those that have uh, currently not been able to avail of support thus far. It will therefore be up to the executive as a whole, guided by the finance minister, to determine on the further distribution of any available resource. Thank you, However, sorry, sorry, just one second. However, I can assure members. 
that my executive colleagues and I remain committed to collectively agreeing further support measures as soon as possible, recognising that this is a very difficult time for many individuals and businesses, and some of the interven but also recognising that some of those interventions would be best placed at a national level to be truly effective. Do you need to remind the Minister that the questions should take no longer than two minutes? Thank you. I call Catherine Kelly for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Minister, with many businesses and their workers struggling to cope with the economic fallout of COVID-19, the delays in reopening wet pubs has further increased the risk to jobs and business in that sector. Minister, can you confirm if you will actively look at and introduce a new support scheme for these businesses and their employees? Again, uh, I want to thank uh, the member for her question. And you will know, and this House will know, that I have been extremely supportive um, of the opening of our tourism and hospitality sectors throughout Northern Ireland, indeed driving much of that process um, at the executive level. I am on record as saying that it is regrettable that the traditional pubs um, have not yet been able to open. However, I note that uh, we now have an indicative date of the 21st of September for the opening of those uh, businesses. And we will work with Hospitality Ulster and the wider um, industry to ensure that the conditions are in place that those businesses can open. I again am on record as saying it's particularly unfair that one small section of a sector is held back. We now need to get on with opening up our economy. The best way to help business is to have business open and ready for business. Okay, and I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her efforts to date. And we all do appreciate the significant support financially of £340 million that has gone out to businesses and which has been a real lifeline to so many. But can the Minister outline what further measures are available going forward to support and sustain especially existing businesses during this very tough time and the COVID uh, crisis? Can I um, thank the member uh, for his question? And it is really indeed um, a very uh, good question. We um, are undoubtedly seeing um, one of the um, toughest times for the uh, economy in a very, very significant uh, period. Um, that downturn um, will be significant. And of course, many of us fear as we look towards October and the end of the furlough scheme, that there could be ramifications for um, employment uh, of many uh, people throughout our constituencies. So therefore, it's really important that we get to a stage where we are continuing to announce and support schemes that will strategically support the economy and individual businesses to survive. I uh, have made um, around 32 bids to the Minister for Finance, um, each of them in line with uh, my published uh, document, Building a Stronger Economy uh, to Help Aid Recovery. Many of those bids are structural bids, looking at demand within the tourism and hospitality sector, trying to ensure that we help businesses to survive over what I think will be a very difficult period in the autumn. We have also made significant interventions in the economy in terms of skills. Very uh, important that when we get to the stage where we are, we are ripe for economic recovery, that we have the right skills to support the economy going forward. And that is why I announced uh, the apprenticeship schemes uh, around and, and with just over uh, about 22 million of support for those schemes uh, within the economy. Thank you. And I call Stuart Dixon. And thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, could you tell the House what engagement, if any, you've had with HMRC uh, to assess uh, whether your department can address the tax data issue for sole traders and those businesses that consider themselves and indeed are excluded from any of the schemes which you've so far provided? 
And I thank the member uh, for his question and also for facilitating the meeting uh, with members uh, of um, the, the group last, last Thursday. I think that it was a very important meeting. I always believe it is much better to talk face to face uh, than over social media. Um, so, uh, in terms of the HMRC data, I have written to HMRC requesting that we have access to the data that would help us uh, to look at the, the necessary verifications that would be necessary for such a scheme. I also understand that the Finance Minister has also written to HMRC to try uh, and ensure that this uh, agreement is made between us so that we uh, can look at how we progress with the issue. I call Justin McNulty. I welcome the news today, Minister, that Nicola Malin will be stepping outside of her remit to provide support for the private coach and bus industries and the taxi industry. Six months into this pandemic, uh, why did it take so long for you to admit that you weren't willing or able to offer support to, that, to those industries? Can I thank the member for his question? I think it's um, a really timely question. I'm delighted to be able to answer it. Um, the Department of the Economy, if you look at the Audit Office report um, that was recently published, is next to health in the level of interventions and work that it has done to support the economy, way beyond anything that any other department, uh, apart from health, and you would expect in a pandemic, a health pandemic, um, that that would be the case. So the Department of the Economy has not been found wanting in reaching out to support those sectors of the economy uh, that it can reach out to. However, ministers do have regulatory responsibility. And the executive has, and the First and Deputy First Minister, have made a decision that where that regulatory responsibility lies, that's where the responsibility should be for bringing forward those particular uh, types of schemes. I welcome that these schemes will now be brought forward. It is a pity that the Minister for Infrastructure was a little bit late in coming to uh, the, the um, decision that we would be able to do those schemes. Um, unlike, unlike other ministers across the executive, including education, who stepped in with childcare, including communities that has been working with disadvantaged groups, working with the arts sectors and working uh, with other sectors within their remit. It's important that ministers step up. I'm glad the First and Deputy First Minister have made the decision that they've made. I look forward to supporting the Minister for, Agriculture, or for Infrastructure as she brings forward the schemes, uh, which are much needed. A question four has been withdrawn, so I move on to five. Uh, Sean Edge. Question five. Can I uh, thank the member uh, for his question? Um, and with your permission, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to group question five and question 13 so that we can proceed with a range of the questions that are available uh, to uh, us today. Clearly, for those able to, working from home and the use of video conferencing has allowed many people to continue working throughout this pandemic and has been an invaluable tool in keeping parts of the economy going when others were effectively shut down. For certain sectors, for example, the digital economy, this has had little impact on productivity, with indeed some reporting an increase of productivity and has demonstrated the resilience of the sector. Now clearly a really good selling point uh, for InvestNI as they talk to companies interested uh, in uh, coming to Northern Ireland. One of the impacts of remote working could include the wider regional redistribution of some office worker spend by moving expenditure away from the area around the office to areas where workers uh, live. However, sudden moves of large-scale economic activity from one place to another will bring benefits to some and hardships to others, which is why any such changes will usually be based on extensive planning and gradual implement implementation. COVID-19 has allowed us um, time uh, for neither uh, and has been quite a disruptor um, in, this, uh, in, in this effect. Some commentators believe that these changing work practices are here to stay. 
with greater levels of flexibility for many uh, on when and where they work. One should be cautious about predicting these things though. And many of the businesses I speak to are already planning on returning to the office for a range of reasons, including the social side of work, the ability to enhance team working, and the informal engagement within workplaces which all contribute to the way a business operates. This trend has had a dramatic impact uh, in Belfast city centre, where footfall has dropped, and which in turn is having a severe impact on local cafes, coffee shops, restaurants, and the wider retail sector, as well as on the number of people using public transport to move around the city. Whilst I am on record as saying that I would like to see people return to their office as, as soon as it is safe to do so, this will ultimately be a decision for each business to make themselves. I am going to call Sean Lynch, supplementary. Uh, I will get Ara Dunn Fragrish in. I want to thank the Minister for her answer. And she did mention the Belfast uh, City Centre and returning to work to boost the, the local economy. But in my own constituency, local and small businesses have seen a footfall in trading in numbers. Uh, ask the Minister, will the Minister com commission a report to identify how remote working can impact on local uh, economies? They asked to remind the Minister that there's two minutes to respond to a question. If you think you need more, more time, you can ask for an additional minute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Again, um, I have recognised that uh, at the moment what we are seeing, and, and my local town is also seeing it as well in Upper Ban, um, uh, somewhat of a move um, from those people who would work in Belfast during the day um, and then um, are now working at home. Um, and therefore, the local economies are um, progressing and, and seeing some um, progress, again, in, in very difficult circumstances. Um, we will be publishing an economic strategy, and as part of the research for that, it would be welcome to do some research into the impact of working from home, uh, both on, on either side of, of the argument. I call Joanne Bunding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for answers, and I'm glad that she's well aware of the, of the troubles that there are in Belfast City Centre as a result of the dramatic reduction in footfall. And on the basis of that, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask her, to the best of her knowledge, because I appreciate it's not necessarily her remit, but to the best of her knowledge, would she outline the current percentage of full-time civil servants still working from home? And does she agree with me that we have to learn to cope with COVID? And that, it, is it, and that it's time for the civil service to lead by example and return to their offices. Can I uh, sorry, thank the member uh, for her question? Um, and uh, it is no secret, in fact, it was leaked to the papers, um, that I did write uh, to the then head of the civil service to indicate that I thought um, that we should be looking at a phased and safe return to on-site duties uh, for civil service staff. I think that that is important um, and it is a, a reasonable thing where it is safe and, and possible to do so. Um, I, I, and I would have to say that that uh, response, maybe because it was uh, the end uh, of uh, his period in office, uh, was not uh, that helpful in that respect. However, I will, uh, when the new head of the civil service is um, appointed, take the matter up again. Can I say just on a general note, um, this is about the balance that we will bring both to life and to the working environment. I don't think things will ever be the same again in a post-COVID world, but we will have to find that new balance and support city centres, which generally throughout uh, the region uh, are experiencing very difficult, difficult circumstances. And that will be also learning to live and work with COVID as a backdrop. Thank you. Moving on, I'll call Cara Hunter. Uh, question six, please. Can I uh, thank uh, the member uh, for her question? While my department is responsible for higher education policy in relation to teaching and research, 
As autonomous institutions, the universities are responsible for their own policies in relation to student accommodation. My department has no remit to intervene. It is clear, however, that universities will need to consider steps to ensure that young people are helped in relation to securing accommodation. Furthermore, universities need to ensure that clear information is developed with the public health agency and communicated to students to ensure that accommodation is provided in a safe manner consistent with the current health guidelines. I am aware that universities do offer a limited number of accommodation places in any given year to students and that off-campus accommodation is provided, uh, albeit through uh, private landlords. In this respect, the member may also wish to address her question directly either to the universities or indeed to the Department for Communities, which is responsible for private landlords and the legislation regarding houses of multiple occupation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for her answer. Uh, speaking on the topic of university admissions, um, I have spoke recently at length with several uh, Korean students. And this year is a little different for them. They will work predominantly more from home this semester over the internet and not in a lecture hall. Um, in the Minister's opinion, do you believe that because of this educational new normal that there should be a, a reduce in university fees at this time? I have spoken uh, to the universities on this uh, particular issue. Um, and universities are assuring me that while lectures, because they are so large, and it would be impossible to accommodate social distancing. Um, while lectures will be online, the tutorials and other elements of student life and teaching will be available to students uh, within the campus setup. It is not for me to comment on how universities organize this, except to say that my department will be monitoring this to ensure that not only do students get best value for money, but they get the best teaching that is available to them. That ends the period for listed questions, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call on Mark Durkin. Uh, I'm going to touch on a point made by uh, Mike McCatlake there during normal question time. The Infrastructure Minister, Nicola Mallon, has confirmed that she will step up and help taxi uh, drivers and bus operators when the Executive Office confer on her the powers to do so all because of the economy minister's failure or reluctance to use her own powers to help them. What is the minister's excuse for not doing her job and leaving these workers in the lurch for so long? As I have uh, said in my previous answer, um, and I revert to that as well, um, the Department for the Economy has uh, provided a huge range of support to businesses right across Northern Ireland Indeed, over a third of a billion pounds has been allocated uh, through my department uh, to help businesses in Northern Ireland. In fact, also including some uh, local uh, taxi firms who would have availed of rates relief uh, or the hardship fund um, or, or indeed the 10K fund. Um, so many of those firms have uh, already been helped. However, it is also important that those departments that have regulatory responsibility um, step up and actually take on that responsibility and look at the areas where they can provide help. In the case of, for example, Hollage, um, the Department of the Economy does not hold any of the stats or figures uh, or any uh, of the other information that would be needed uh, to have a scheme for the haulage industry. The Department of Infrastructure holds all of those figures. Therefore, it would seem sensible that the Department of Infrastructure steps up and gets uh, going with a scheme that will actually help uh, the industry, which in the height and the depths of COVID kept food supplies running to Northern Ireland. Mark Durgan, supplementary. I thank the Minister for my answer. However, methinks the Minister doth protest too much. She has always had the power to intercede, but did nothing. You can't cherry pick 
who you want to help. And I wonder, can the Minister tell the House if there are any other areas of her work that she's having difficulty fulfilling and she might be waiting for another Minister to come along and do for her? I appreciate, I appreciate that the Member is trying to spare his colleagues' blushes. So we will then move on from this. There are many areas of the economy that are suffering very, very deeply in this uh, economic recession. And we will experience even more difficulties as we come to the end of the furlough scheme. That is why I published uh, my economic recovery paper. That is why I have indicated that while we need to support those core elements of the economy, we also need to go out and grab new opportunities for Northern Ireland in the digital economy, in the green economy, really important issues for Northern Ireland. It's time now that we actually um, got on with doing those things. And to that extent, over the last uh, number of weeks, my department has submitted around 32 bids to the Minister for Finance, looking at interventions in the economy in a structured way that will allow our economy to grow and prosper and provide jobs for families in Northern Ireland. I call Jerry Carroll. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, your department in January uh, wrote that if you didn't give fracking licences to Tamboran and an EHA, this would leave the department open to legal challenge. Can the Minister explain why that is the case? And would it, uh, the same rationale mean that if I get refused plan or permission for my house, uh, I can sue as well? <laughs> um, can I thank uh, the member uh, for his question? Um, we are currently um, not um, exploring the issue of licensing. Um, in fact, uh, those licenses that are, are current, those applications, sorry, that are currently with us, um, we have uh, are looking at the responses. We are collating those responses, and we are currently um, doing some research uh, into the overall topic. Be assured that this is a controversial uh, and co cross-cutting issue. This will be a matter for the whole executive and every party across this executive to give a view on it. Um, and therefore, um, when the time comes, those recommendations, whatever they may be from the department, uh, will go right across um, the, the executive for um, decision. <coughs> Jerry Carl, supplementary. Uh, I would respectfully disagree, Minister. I don't think fracking is controversial. It's uh, crazy and it's dangerous to the environment and it's been proven by multiple people. Uh, one of the Aston Minister as well, I think this is something I raised with her already. Can she give a commitment uh, to my constituents and many constituents across the North who are still waiting a decision around an application which would give a private company uh, the right to drill for petroleum across the North that she will not proceed with granting that licence? I refer the member to my previous answer. Moving on to Gemma Dolan. Is the Minister concerned at the obvious confusion in Brexit preparations created by the UK Internal Market Bill introduced on the 9th of September, which the British Government has conceded is breach of international law? Since taking office, my absolutely top priority um, in uh, negotiations with the, our national government um, and uh, in conversations with my executive colleagues is to make sure that Northern Ireland firms and Northern Ireland businesses have that unfettered access to the United Kingdom's internal market, our own internal market. That's hugely important um, because jobs and families and prosperity depend on that access to that market. And I therefore think that there are a number of things that we um, need to consider around the Internal Market Bill. Not just the idea of unfettered access, the idea of state aid. I don't want Northern Ireland firms uh, to be uh, encumbered and lumbered uh, with EU state aid regulations um, and uh, the rest of the United Kingdom to be able to move on in that direction. So there are many issues that concern me around the Internal Market Bill, but my top priority my absolutely top priority for prosperity in Northern Ireland is to ensure that we can access that market 
in an unfettered way and that our firms do not suffer competitive disadvantage within that market. Gemma Dolan, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. The Irish Protocol was put in place to protect the Good Friday Agreement and the economy in the North and across this island. The withdrawal agreement and Irish Protocol are the result of hard-fought and hard-won compromises. Is the Minister concerned that the British Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, has stated that the IM Bill breaks international law? It is no secret to the member, uh, indeed all of the members in this House, that as a member of the European Parliament, I did not vote for the withdrawal uh, agreement and I did not vote for the Northern Ireland Protocol. I see the Northern Ireland Protocol as being absolutely disastrous uh, for the Northern Ireland economy. And I am concerned when I talk to firms uh, across Northern Ireland, firms uh, who uh, are producing medicines, firms, agri-food firms, other manufacturing chains whose main market is within the United Kingdom, I am concerned that they have that access to our internal market that will make sure that they are able to compete uh, both competitively uh, and without disadvantage within that market. That means, and again I make no apology for repeating it, that unfettered access to that market is of the utmost importance to me and that the operation of the protocol could be um, detrimental to that access. I don't understand why this House, I don't understand why this House wants so desperately at times to put up barriers between us and the biggest part uh, of our marketplace. That would be disastrous for business and disastrous for families and incomes in Northern Ireland. I call uh, Rachel Woods. Speaker, and back to the very important issue of fracking. With relation to the Petroleum Licence Exploration Application PLA 2-16 in Fermanagh, is a health impact assessment of the cumulative impacts of the full development of the Fervana Shale Basin across the life cycle of the project stipulated as part of the research process within the department. Can I uh, thank the member uh, for her question? Um, we are, as you know, currently doing research into the wider impacts. Um, health will be part uh, of that uh, research. Um, and I look forward to sharing the research and indeed to maybe sitting down with the member and discussing these issues uh, in further detail as we get to, uh, towards a conclusion um, of uh, the process. Rachel Wood, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. I'd be very happy to meet with the Minister. Um, the Department claims that although the adverse effects on the environment and human health can be associated with shale gas production, but there is evidence in scientific liter literature to demonstrate how effective measures can mitigate the risks to reduce them to an acceptable level. Can the Minister outline how fracking can be regulated for with limited impact on public health? We have uh, no uh, intentions for regulation in that direction at this minute in time. Um, and uh, as I said before, um, I am happy to talk about the health implications of any and all of these uh, processes with the member. Call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, in terms of the internal market bill, which was discussed earlier there, does the Minister agree with me that anything that reduces friction in terms of trade with the rest of the UK is to be welcomed? As I have said in this House many times, our biggest market is in GB. For our agri-food industry, 65-70% of everything we produce goes to market in Great Britain. Therefore, any frictions within that marketplace have potentially a detrimental impact on business and a competitive disadvantage to our businesses within the marketplace. Um, we also need to remember about two-thirds of everything that we need for uh, manufacturing and that very, very important supply chain for manufacturing and from retail comes from the Great Britain market. It is therefore absolutely essential that we do not have frictions in that way uh, either. Um, I think uh, that we should um, really focus uh, on this as an issue and forget the politicking around it and ensure that our businesses have the ability to survive
compete uh, and do well in what is our largest market. I will have a very brief supplementary uh, from Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister. Um, and would, would the Minister also agree that not only should the NI Executive be working together to protect trade with our largest market in Great Britain, but they should also work to ensure Northern Ireland fully benefits from post-Brexit international trade deals signed off by Her Majesty's Government? to Greg Hands, the Minister at International Trade, to ensure that the Northern Ireland Protocol will uh, not hinder Northern Ireland firms being able to be full parts of, that internal mar or of, of those trade bills. In order to really prosper and really to grow our economy, we have to look out uh, towards other economies. It is therefore absolutely vital uh, that we are able to be part of those trade bills. And I look forward to further discussions with uh, Minister Hans and would actually like to see legislative underpinning in the trade bill of our part uh, within it. And can I call Alan Chambers and can I say that uh, you're unlikely to get time for a supplementary? Uh, could I ask the uh, Minister what authority her department had to temporarily close down HMS Caroline? as a visitor attraction, as there is no written agreement with the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Can I thank uh, the member for his question? And indeed, I actually just signed off a priority written question uh, to the member uh, just prior uh, to coming down on this very issue. The member will be aware uh, that uh, the HMS Caroline um, issue uh, arose because um, while uh, we wanted to take uh, the issues forward, we wanted to settle the issues uh, with the, the Naval Museum, um, we also uh, needed to do so on what was a sustainable footing going forward. Um, however, um, they decided that they wanted to terminate that agreement, and that left us with little time to actually pursue a new operator for um, the HMS Caroline. But be under no illusion, and be absolutely clear, let me be absolutely clear on this. Um, I am committed to uh, this very important piece of our heritage remaining in Northern Ireland, being open again, and making sure that we can do everything to ensure that it's an, a sustainable way going forward. And I would ask the member to join with me in that commitment. That ends the period. Um for topical questions and uh, time's up. Could I ask members just to take a raise for a moment or two, please? Okay, members, before we move on to the next item, I just want to make these uh, few remarks. Um, upon the resumption of business last week, I wrote to all members to highlight that I had been in correspondence with the Executive about a range of issues in recent months. One of those has been about the importance of the scrutiny and accountability role 
of the Assembly and to remind Ministers of the key courtesies and conventions the Ministers are expected to observe towards the Assembly. So this includes Ministers coming to the Assembly to make major announcements and to take questions from members. In earlier months, we had many very good examples of Ministers coming forward to update members, particularly through the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 response, which was set up to make that easier. However, I have written today to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to express some concern about the timeliness with which Ministers are coming forward to update the Assembly and to take questions on changes to the COVID-19 regulations. The clearly significant announcements were made last week in relation to changes to the current regulations and the developing and worsening situation. Given the importance of public awareness to reduce the risk to public health, I fully appreciate and indeed often support why in this situation ministers would undertake press conferences and interviews before they have the opportunity to come and make specific statements to this Assembly. However, given the importance of these issues, it is regrettable that ministers have not always sought to come to the Assembly today or tomorrow indeed to address the changes in regulations which were announced by the First and Deputy First Minister last week. It is crucial that on major issues such as this, that this Assembly has the opportunity to question ministers. For that reason, I have accepted an urgent question so that ministers can answer questions on the changes to the regulations today. However, ministers should be proactively bringing these matters to the floor of the Assembly themselves promptly rather than requiring members to table urgent questions. I know that these are the most challenging times possible, but it is also difficult to defend the absence of ministers coming to the Assembly when they are frequently discussing these matters on the agenda. And this has been raised with myself on a number of occasions, particularly through the Business Committee and in other contacts with members generally. I have therefore asked again the First and Deputy First Ministers to ensure that all ministers ensure that plans are made to come to the Assembly promptly when key decisions are made. The member for Strangford, Michelle McElveen, raised a related point of order with me earlier about the importance of ministers respecting the role and the views of this Assembly. It may have been inevitable that there would be teething problems on the return of Assembly sittings after a three-year absence. In addition, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have publicly acknowledged the role the Assembly has played in being flexible and allowing departments to focus on fighting the endemic of the pandemic. However, I have raised many of these issues frequently since January, and departments should now be in a position to understand how they are expected to work with the Assembly. Improvement is required in this general area, and I hope that all ministers will take note of that and assure that I do not have to return to these issues so frequently. Thank you. And moving on to the urgent oral question, Mr. Colin McGrath has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Executive Office. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, following their announcement on Thursday, the 10th of September, what support the Executive will provide to customers, workers and businesses in area where Pardon me, areas where local restrictions have been announced and there is a financial detriment as a result of these restrictions. Can I call the Deputy First Minister? Sorry, I've been advised to uh, call the Deputy First Minister. I call the First I Minister. Think, Apologies. I think there's a conspiracy going on here, um, Mr. Speaker, and one is quite concerned. Just don't take that. it personally, all right. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, the local restrictions that were put in place last week were uh, a necessary and proportionate approach to address the increasing number of COVID cases that we have witnessed since early July and which have accelerated over this past week. If allowed to continue, this will inevitably lead to an increase in hospital admissions and deaths, something we cannot allow to happen. Let's be clear, rapidly rising rates of infections are not good for businesses and for employees. The executive is therefore bringing in restrictions now to try to slow and stop this worrying increase in cases. The new restrictions are focused on reducing contacts between people in household settings, which is viewed by the executive as the most effective way to reduce the interactions between people at this time. This is not a lockdown, so hospitality and other businesses will continue to operate, but subject to strict guidance, regulation and appropriate enforcement where necessary. The Executive has put a range of support measures in place for businesses to help deal with the impact of COVID-19, 
and will continue to explore ways of continuing support in the future. And I call Colin McGrath to ask supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First and Deputy First Minister for their attendance and response. I mean, once again, as you've mentioned, Mr. Speaker, it was TV where we heard about these matters, and then we're having to troll NI Direct to try and find what the outcomes and actions are, and just to continue to reiterate that it's not always a clear navigation through that website to find out what the regulations and the, the various uh, changes are. The public are rightly concerned about what they can and cannot do. And these restrictions, which came quite quickly uh, and for the right reasons, have resulted in changes in specific postcodes. And that has added and fueled to the concerns that people have. But given that the message includes suggestions of only travelling when necessary, uh, and some of those places have businesses that are already badly impacted from the original uh, implications of COVID. I suppose it would be good to know if you will introduce any additional specific help for those businesses, for those city centres, for those town centres that will be impacted with the lower footfall as a result of the new recommendations. Thank you. Thank the Chair of the Committee. Uh, for his question today. Can I, first of all, Mr Speaker, address the issue which you have raised uh, rightly? Um, the Deputy First Minister and I, at the beginning of COVID-19, felt that the Department of Health, in particular the Minister of Health, had a heavy burden in relation to a lot of the health regulations. And we offered up, not sure whether they were delighted about it or not, the two junior ministers to help navigate uh, the health regulations through this House. Given the pressures that are now on TEO around a number of issues, including high street task forces and other issues that we're involved in, uh, we've decided the time is now right to allow the health minister to bring the health regulations to the floor of this chamber. So from now on, changes to the coronavirus regulations will be led by the Department of Health. Why did we do that? Because often uh, we had to get briefing from the Department of Health to the Executive Office, and that was slowing the response down, and we didn't think that that was the best use of time. Uh, so that is one of the reasons, and we do apologise, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, that you felt there was a need uh, to make your statement today, but that is one of the reasons why uh, today uh, we find ourselves in a sort of a handover situation with the regulation. So I just wanted to make that point so people uh, were clear around that. In terms of, of the restrictions, uh, we received a very full uh, briefing from the Chief Medical Officer. Yes, I know, uh, uh, Mr Chairman, that some people were uh, rightly surprised by what uh, the level was in, in some of these areas. But if you look at Belfast City Council area, uh, some of the areas in Ballymena, some of the areas in Lisburn, uh, we were now looking at uh, over 80 cases per 100,000 in terms of COVID-19. When you look at other areas of Northern Ireland, it's as low as 10 and 11. So that is why we decided that we needed to intervene in those postcode areas of concern. And I know that some people in those areas feel um, that we should have put it right across Northern Ireland, but that would not have reflected the, the uh, danger that we felt some of those postcode areas were in, and that is why we took the decision to put what is, uh, I think, the House will accept, a minimum intervention at this stage, and we hope it works, and we will review it in two weeks' time, and if it hasn't had the desired impact, then we will have to revisit uh, these restrictions uh, again. It is a limited intervention. It doesn't impact on businesses at this stage. It's just about household contact. So whilst I understand uh, the member wanting to raise issues about support in the future, we are certainly keeping that under uh, review, and the Minister for Finance is engaging with his counterparts in Westminster, because you may have seen that there has been an announcement of support for businesses that have to close for three weeks of, in the region of £1,000 to £1,500. We're looking at that. The Minister of Finance is looking at that and, and indeed speaking with the Minister of the Economy on this issue. So it's something that we will continue to monitor. I call George Robinson. Does the First Minister agree with me that the key challenge for the Executive is protecting lives from COVID? but at the same time seeking to ensure our economy can function as best as possible. And I think the member has summed up the challenge that lies ahead of us. We do want to protect the citizens of, of Northern Ireland, of course, from COVID-19 and to alert them to the dangers that are there. But at the same time, we want to effect a recovery for our economy, and, and therein lies the challenge. Uh, we have 
taken these limited intervention uh, rules so that uh, we can say to people that they need to be alert, they need to be aware in household settings, and we hope that that will stem the spread uh, of COVID-19 uh, in, in that way. So it, it is a balancing act. We acknowledge that. Uh, that's why the executive spends quite a considerable amount of time looking at the evidence that is presented to us and looking at the interventions we can take. And we make no apology for that, Mr Speaker, because it is right that we have all the evidence in front of us. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, Minister, the businesses and workers have faced a, a very difficult few months. Some haven't yet been able to reopen and some, although not yet, may be forced to close again due to restrictions being reimposed. The furlough scheme has been an absolute lifeline. So can I ask the Minister what representations um, executive ministers have made to the British Chancellor about extending the furlough scheme and also the self-employed income support scheme? Go ahead. Well, I thank the member for that question. Indeed, we have made representations in relation to the furlough scheme, both through our own party representations and indeed through the Minister of Finance, who uh, wrote to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I think two weeks ago now, saying that a cliff edge coming on furlough was going to cause a lot of hardship for a lot of people here in Northern Ireland. And we have uh, looked on with interest to the economic indicators that were put out today and the fact that Northern Ireland is very low in terms of economic recovery. Uh, those are stats that we look at very closely to see what it is that we need to do to try and assist the Northern Ireland economy. You know as well as I do that we have very much a public sector focused economy here uh, and uh, we need to try and make sure that the productivity of the Northern Ireland economy grows again in a sustainable way and that's one of the issues I'm sure the Minister for the Economy is looking at. But yes, we have made representations on the furlough scheme. This is not about closing businesses. Uh, this is just about household contacts at this present moment in time, and we hope that it is effective. But it is only effective if people work with us. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, um, First Minister. Um, I was in the Holy Land this morning, um, part of my constituency, and there were 10, 12 young people standing in the front garden drinking away. Um, my specific question in terms of the announcements last week were, because we know that they're not socially distancing in, in that community, do you believe that the term avoid unnecessary travel relates to them in terms of them going home to their families at the weekend? And if so, can some further guidance be produced for the students? I thank the member for her question and declaring interest because I have two children uh, at university, <laughs> returning to university in the very near future. Um, look, we have an ongoing dialogue with Queen's University and the Ulster University. At the moment, uh, we're not advising that people shouldn't go home uh, at the weekend, but it's something that we're going to continue to work on uh, with the university, whether uh, we need to look at more online learning so that people can remain in their own homes as opposed to coming to Belfast. Um, but the published uh, guidance, uh, when it has, been, uh, it has been outlined on NI Direct, and when it comes to issues like travel, socialising outside the home, work, shopping, attending functions, people should use their discretion uh, and common sense and continue to work from home where they can. Um, so really ask yourself, uh, how important is the journey or, uh, or other planned activity and how much additional risk would we bring to others by going out uh, and engaging in that activity? How difficult is it going to be if we go to this activity to maintain social distancing? Uh, is there good hand hygiene being operated? Are people wearing masks? So it's about trying to strike the right balance at this early stage. It may be that we have to be more interventionist in the future, but we're trying to say to people at the moment, our evidence shows that it is around household contact, and that's why we've taken the measures that we have. I call Jim Allister. Um, Mr Speaker, you will know I'm not noted for my level of agreement with the uh, Member of Parliament for North Antrim. Indeed, maybe the First Minister could say the same. But uh, I must say, I do agree with his severe reservations on this issue. Uh, that He said, we have to learn to live with COVID. We can't kill our economy. And messages such as that are contradicted, I have to say, for a trading town like Balamina, when it is headlined as effectively a hot spot. You, know, you told us, First Minister, this didn't impact on business. Sorry, it does. When you pick out a town like Balamina and 
effectively headlining it as a hotspot, then the footfall is affected. And hence the question, I think, from the original questioner, what are we going to do for those businesses which are now going to feel the draft on all of this? They've really suffered more than they can. I fear for their future now. Thank the member for his agreement with the member for North Antrim. And uh, can I say to him, in relation to that, we do have to learn to live with COVID. So I agree with the member for North Antrim as well. And we do need to protect our businesses and to grow the economy. But we also have to protect people's lives. So it is about livelihoods and lives. And I say that very sincerely, Mr Speaker, today. But as I've indicated, in uh, Great Britain and in England, uh, they are looking at a scheme whereby if businesses do have to close, that they can support them with a grant uh, of £1,000 to £1,500 if they're closed for a period of three weeks. I think that's something that we would support, and we want to uh, hear what uh, we can do in relation to that and whether there will be Barnet consequentials, uh, given our very tight uh, budgetary position. But also, uh, on a, a quadrilateral call with Scotland and Wales, uh, both of those jurisdictions have also raised the issue that if people have to self-isolate at home, uh, due to COVID being in the community and they have to stay at home, then what support is available there for those people that have to stay at home and not go to work? Because we do know that for some people, people on zero hour contracts, issues like that, they won't have an income then if they do have to stay at home. So the Department for Communities uh, is looking at that issue. We already have a helpline to deal with uh, issues of, of severe stress. And again, Mr. Speaker, there's no perfect answer to any of this, but we're trying to make sure that we put in place, if we do have to move uh, to closing businesses, and I very much hope that that is not the case. Can I call Jerry Carl? Uh, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the Minister for her answer so, uh, so far. Uh, following my previous question and her previous answer about the evidence earlier today uh, that does exist to show that this virus uh, does spread rapidly in homes, require an action, but seemingly doesn't spread uh, as rapid in schools and workplaces not require an action, will the Minister commit that this specific information will be made available to the members of the Health Committee and this House? Well, it's not for me to commit on that. It's for the, the, the Minister for Health, of course, and uh, he has provided us with this evidence. Um, the reason we talk about households is because everybody is quite relaxed when they're in a household, as you would expect. It's their home. Um, but when you're in a regulated environment, and I've had the chance to visit some schools to see how they are managing uh, COVID restrictions very well, uh, uh, has been the answer I have gained from visiting some of the schools. And of course, even in hospitality outlets, uh, there has been very good regulation there as well. It is a regulated environment. People are taking uh, precautions, and that is why we're saying in the household setting, uh, we're asking people to be alert and to stay safe in order to save lives. And I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Sir, uh, can I ask my right honourable friend, the question that was tabled relates to business support. Uh, we have been discussing at the Economy Committee excluded groups. Now, I've been told that there's 30,000 of these, and if they were to be paid the minimum of £10,000 grant, that comes to a bill of £300 million. Is there anything like that available in the budget? Because ultimately, these interventions in the economy need to be paid for. Well, as, as a member knows, and as this House knows, we have been able to make a number of interventions, uh, both through our own interventions, through the Minister for the Economy, working with the rest of the executive, and indeed uh, through UK schemes that we've been able to take advantage of, the furlough scheme, the self-employed scheme. I, the furlough scheme, if you look at that, for example, and the scale of the number of people from Northern Ireland that have been put on furlough, I think it was in the region of 211,000, there is no way, uh, Mr Speaker, that we would have had the financial wherewithal to support that scheme. We needed the Whitehall intervention to allow us to be able to furlough those people, and that's why we're appealing to Whitehall again to intervene the Chancellor to intervene so that we can have a tapering off of the furlough scheme. I think we all accept it will have to end, but the point is we're saying don't have a cliff edge in relation to furlough. In relation to excluded NI, I know there's a, a debate in this House tomorrow around excluded NI, and of course we would want to help our citizens who are, who are in difficulty and who haven't been able to gain from some of the schemes that we have put out there. 
but it is around the financial wherewithal to be able to do that and indeed identifying those people in a way that doesn't allow fraud and, and make sure that we get the money out to the people in need. So again, uh, I'm sure the Minister for the Economy will address some of those issues tomorrow, but it is about making sure that we have the finances available and not making promises that we can't then deliver on. I think I call Martin Anderson. Um, Minister, it was very welcome today's announcement that the Infrastructure Minister will finally take the lead in providing a, a scheme for the transport sector. And as you know, that sector, particularly taxi drivers and others, have felt that it was like a game of ping pong between the Department of the Economy and the Department of Infrastructure. Um, and I would ask you that for those sectors in future, where there are two ministers engaged or involved, that um, help is provided so as to ensure that all the necessary assistance is put in place and they don't fall between two stools ever again. I thank the member for her question and she will know that the Deputy First Minister and I have intervened to direct that uh, the Minister of Infrastructure should take forward this scheme. It's disappointing that that scheme hasn't been put in place up until now uh, and I think it's wrong uh, that that uh, sector in particular hasn't had the help and assistance that they have been looking for. Uh, indeed, we uh, have also intervened in the area of childcare. Uh, so, and she will know that as well, ha having been to the Executive Committee and spoke about this. Again, that was a split between policy and regulation uh, and the difficulties that uh, pursued there as well. So we're trying to make sure that it's a whole of executive approach, and that's what it's about, trying to make sure that we identify the gaps in provision and then, if we can, to intervene and to assist. So I hope that that scheme uh, for taxis and for the haulage industry can come soon as quickly as possible. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, First Minister, for coming to the House today, and thank you for your answers thus far. Um, pardon the oxymoron, First Minister, but why are your party happy to brief against other ministers in the executive with false facts? Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, um, since this executive returned, we have seen parties briefing out putting things up on Twitter after executive meetings. Uh, uh, there was the case on Thursday evening after the EU exit meeting where a full summary of the EU exit meeting uh, was given to the BBC, uh, and that certainly didn't come from either the First Minister's party or the Deputy First Minister's party. Uh, so unfortunately, we have leaks. Uh, we have uh, some ministers who love to resort to Twitter, who love to brief Good Morning Ulster, uh, and then the rest of us are, are left having to deal with those issues. I say this very sincerely. Everybody should wise up. We're dealing with huge issues in the executive, and uh, people should stop briefing against each other. We're supposed to be in a five-party coalition dealing with all of these issues, and that's what I hope we do moving forward from now. Thank you, Nicole. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, First Minister, for your answers uh, in this debate so far. I'll save your blushes over the little local difficulty, which I'm sure you're having with the Member of Parliament for East Antrim, and cut to the chase. Those that have been excluded in Northern Ireland have been failed by the Economy Minister and have been failed by um, her uh, comments where she says that the responsibility lies with the executive and not her uh, to provide appropriate funds for, for any schemes coming forward. Can the First Minister explain to this House why um, if, uh, if an excluded business was located in any of the English regions, Scotland or Wales, today they would not be excluded? Well, can I say to the member uh, again, I hardly think Sammy Wilson would ever be called a little local difficulty, and I will defend him on that to the very end. Um, but I, can I also say that in terms of uh, excluded NI, we are, of course, wanting to assist everyone who has had difficulties in relation to COVID-19. That's why we introduced a range of schemes. But by introducing a range of schemes, there are always those who fall through the gaps. And what we need to do now uh, is again on the furlough, on the uh, self-employed scheme, we have the backing of Westminster in having to deal with those. And can I also say to the member, because we do not have tax raising powers here in Northern Ireland, we do not have the data in relation to uh, those people who were newly self-employed. Um, 
That is the reality, and a member may not agree with it, but that is the reality. And the member uh, should know that the Minister for the Economy and indeed the Minister for Finance has tried to get that data uh, from Treasury, but without success. But look, the debate will take, for, take place tomorrow. Uh, I've no doubt we'll have a full uh, debate on those issues. But be assured, we do want to help and assist where we can with our budget, but who we'll also lobby Westminster in relation to helping those who have been excluded. And I call Colin Gildernew. Gordon Mayagat, Con Corlea. Um, in light of the ongoing worry and rise in, in COVID positive cases and in the context of necessary restrictions which have, have had to be put in place, can I ask the Executive to confirm whether the Economy Minister intends to provide updated workplace health and safety guidance in order to mitigate against the spread of coronavirus within workplaces? Well, I said to the member that's a very good point, uh, and I'm sure he knows that the Health and Safety Executive have been quite proactive, also working with some of the employers and trade unions uh, in the LRA forum uh, to try and deal with some of the issues that have been brought forward. That LRA forum was a good sounding board when we were in the midst of COVID and trying to get people to come back uh, to work at that particular point in time. I think we do have good guidance at present. That guidance hasn't changed, uh, but we can always revisit guidance in the light of where we are in particular circumstances and of course he will be delighted as I that Fermanagh and South Throne continues to be a compliant area. I call Pam Cameron. And can I ask if, if this debate is a debate on whether the glass is half full versus the glass is half empty in terms of the local restrictions and does the First Minister agree with me that actually this is a way to live in a pandemic through COVID-19 by uh, introducing uh, uh, restrictions which allow a balance for our economy to continue and also, for me, more importantly, for the health service to remain open or to reopen. So if I can remember, remind members why we intervened back in March, it was to uh, try and push down the curve and, and make sure that we didn't have the number of deaths that was being predicted at that time, but also to protect the NHS from being overwhelmed. And of course, there are concerns about that, Mr. Speaker, at present, given that we're now entering the autumn winter period with all of the usual, usual seasonal uh, dysfunctions that happen during autumn and winter. So we're very conscious uh, of that. I, I agree with the member that the glass is half full. We are taking limited interventions. We are not closing down businesses. We're trying to say to people, the evidence points to household spread. Therefore, we're asking you to work with us in all of these issues. And I know people can come up with all sorts of scenarios where they think that there are difficulties. Well, that's fair enough. But what we're trying to say to people is, please, please use your common sense, work with us, try to stop the spread of COVID, and in that way, we can control the spread. And don't forget, Northern Ireland, out of all the regions of the United Kingdom, is the best performing region when it comes to COVID, and let's make sure it stays there. I call Paul Catney. Mr. Speaker, uh, First Minister, um, I noticed that the Finance Committee, whenever we were talking, and our honourable member from Derry had stated that it was a two, this had fallen between two, that is the Department of the Economy and Infrastructure. I wish to say that it fell between three because that was finance, and that question was asked in order to see where that's set, set with. But I wish to commend the Minister and the Deputy First Minister for at least bringing forward the regulations that that power would set with the economy will now be transferred to the Minister of Infrastructure, where we're used to delivery and things happening. Thank you. Well, to be, to be fair, uh, I think it is only fair that I say this, the power does not sit with the Department of the Economy. Um, uh, the uh, Minister for Infrastructure has argued that it doesn't sit for, with her. So what we have done is actually say you could use the financial assistance order, which is in place, I think, after the local government flooding, if I'm not uh, mistaken, sometime back in 2007. I think I was in the Minister for the Environment at the time when that financial assistance bill came through. So we're designating that department to take forward uh, the actions in relation to taxi and haulage. I call Meg Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, just to, to, to return to Sammy Wilson, um, I must say I, I find his party leader, let the odd elected rep go, is profoundly positive for, for party discipline. Uh, but my question to the First Minister is, has she any idea why did Sammy Wilson come to this apparently mistaken belief about what you were lobbying for around the executive table? 
well, if I can point the member to some of the tweets that was put out by some of my executive colleagues, he may find the answer there. And that concludes this item of business, and I would ask members to take your ease for a moment or two. Thank you. Mr. Colm Gilderney has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, uh, then they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health what actions he is undertaking to ensure that COVID-19 tests are accessible locally. And I call the Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, testing capacity in Northern Ireland has increased significantly since the beginning of the pandemic and is delivered through two routes. Firstly, we have increased capacity through our HSC Trust laboratories and through local testing partners as part of our Northern Ireland Scientific Advisory Consortium. This is known as Pillar 1 testing. My department continues to work very closely with the network of local partners to enhance testing cap capability and capacity. And there are active plans underway to develop this further in response to the recent increase in demand for testing. Secondly, testing is delivered through participation in the national testing programme managed by the Department of Health and Social Care in London. This is known as Pillar 2 testing and currently includes four drive through fixed testing sites and six operational mobile testing units. And two more mobile testing units are due to be operational shortly. MTUs are deployed in towns and villages across Northern Ireland in response to local need. There is also the home testing option through postal order uh, service, which is delivered direct to a person's home. Demand for testing has increased significantly across the UK in recent weeks, and I am aware that the National Testing Programme is currently experiencing exceptionally high demand. This has at times made it more difficult for members of the public to book a test slot at a time or place that is convenient. Anyone who tries to book a test and is unable to do so, or who is offered a location or time which is not convenient, is strongly encouraged to wait a few hours and then try again. I am advised that more appointments and home testing kits are available nationally every day. I am aware, Mr Speaker, that there has been some problems with the digital portal, impacting cases in Northern Ireland, which has caused testing slots to be offered at sites which are outside Northern Ireland. I understand there have been similar issues across the UK. Matt Hancock has personally advised me that a fix to the digital portal is being developed. And again, our key message is that if you experience problems booking a test, please leave it a few hours and try again. Overall testing capacity is continually reviewed by my department, and plans to further enhance capacity are kept under active consideration. I met with Matt, or spoke with Matt Hancock on a number of occasions through the last week, and the four, health na four nations health ministers spoke on Friday. And my officials continue to be in contact with counterparts in London on a daily basis to ensure that capacity for Northern Ireland is maximised through the national testing programme. I call Callum Gillerney for supplementary. Gormiagat, Chan Kolya, and uh, Gormiagat, thank you, Minister, for, for coming to the House today. And I think we're all very conscious, and I'm sure every member around this House has been receiving a uh, representation from constituents in relation to the difficulties in testing. I'm also deeply conscious that we have unfortunately recorded there has been another two 
uh, bereavements as a result of COVID-19, and I extend my, my condolences to those families impacted. Um, I would like to ask the Minister, uh, considering your recent announcement that you have written to Matt Hancock in relation to this, I would like to ask, is that the first time that you have formally raised issues of problems with testing with your English counterpart, and also what your assessment would be of any impact this testing disruption has had on the spread of, of COVID-19, given how many people have been unable to access tests? And I, I thank the, the Chair of the Committee for his supplementaries. Um, Matt Hancock and, and well, the four health ministers speak regularly. Testing has been something that has been on the agenda uh, for nearly every meeting. We have had intense, um, co well, intense number of meetings over the past week, specifically in regards to testing and also the access using the digital portal, because what we have experienced has also been experienced by my counterpart in Wales and Scotland. And I think the particular peculiarity that we are seeing is when the digital portal sees a postcode, it's simply measuring it by, by miles and not taking into consideration the Irish Sea um, in the middle. Uh, my Welsh counterpart, Von Gethin, actually said they had experienced a similar pro problem with the, the Bristol Channel. So it's not a peculiarity or problem that's particular for us, but it's something that has been looked at in regards to the digital programme and how that is actually assessed. So we do have continual engagements. Um, we're also aware today that there is a, a significant backlog in the tests that are being processed through the National Testing Laboratories. Um, we have raised that issue, and I am looking to see what impact that actually does have on Northern Ireland testing capability and results on the National Testing Pillar. For more data, there does not seem to be a significant impact in Northern Ireland, but it is something we want to see to make sure that it is not affecting, affecting us on the number of positive cases um, coming through. We are aware that the, the Department of Health and, and Social Communities in, in Westminster is also uh, working with Germany in regards to picking up some of the backlog that, is there in, that there is in our testing capability, similar to the Republic of Ireland government done in the past as well. I call Palm Cameron. And thank the Minister for his uh, attendance. Minister, schools are back, and there is no doubt that there is uh, confusion amongst schools, amongst parents, and even amongst workplaces. And, and there are many schools that are struggling to get through to the PHA to receive that appropriate guidance around risk assessments. Um, and they're sending large numbers of children home. The reports then are, are of schools and workforces then demanding a negative COVID-19 result before individuals can return to work or school. So I do welcome the information produced by the CMO last week. Does the Minister agree that it is vital that he takes any offer of help or assistance offered from the Education Minister to bulk up the level of support from his department required to deal with the volume of queries coming from schools and parents at this time? And again, I, th I thank the member because it, it, it is a valid point, and we, we did expect an increase in the number of tests being sought when we did see the return, return to schools because we saw something similar um, in Scotland, just not to the extent that we actually have. So we have been working very well um, between the two departments with, with the Minister of Education. We have a weekly, uh, I think, sorry, uh, we have two meetings per week between my department officials and department officials within. Uh, education to make sure that any peculiarities or any misconceptions or, or misinterpretations of guidance is ruled out, and that resulted in the, the CMO issue in that specific letter um, last week to school principals to make sure that we had that clear sight and guidance. Also, over the weekend, the PHA has established a dedicated telephone line for school principals so that those school principals can seek direct guidance from the PHA because we do re realise it is a very pressurised but also a very trying time for school principals who want to make sure they are giving the parents and their pupils and their staff the correct advice in regards to, to COVID-19 and how they should be managing each situation. I call Justin McNulty. <coughs> Will the Minister advise um, what has been done to ensure that staff and patients are being test, tested in a timely manner and that was, test results are available in a timely manner? And I refer specifically to what is happening in Daisy Hill over recent days in relation to some staff members and some patients of the medical wards. And I want to offer my condolences to the families who have lost loved ones in recent days and also to wish uh, well those people who have contracted COVID and hope they can make a full recovery. Thank you, Minister. Again, I, uh, no, I thank the member for his comments and especially welcome the, the support that is there for those families uh, and staff um, who have lost or been been involved in the loss of a life due to COVID-19. Um, in my opening comments, I, 
I explained the, t the two pillars that we work on, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Pillar 1 is our own in-house testing capacity, that's our health and so HSC systems, and that is available for our staff and for patients to ensure there is uh, accessible and timely testing, but also the reporting of tests on results as well. So that's why we have the two pillars. That one's very specific to, to those staff and to patients who need that quick turnaround. And then pillar two is used for, for the national programme as well, which is accessible uh, to the general public should they develop symptoms. Nicole Allen Chambers. Uh, Minister, uh, whilst noting the very high demand for testing locally, as well as the increase in our own testing capacity, how important have the over 204,000 tests that have been provided by the UK Government under Pillar 2 been to our efforts in Northern Ireland to tackle this pandemic? Um, again, I, I thank the, the member for, for his comments, and I think it is important to note that our access to the National Pillar and the National Testing Programme has been vital. Um, for our response to, to processing tests and also to making sure that there is avail availability for testing for those, those people who need it. And I think in, in regards to the past, you know, to the past five days, uh, Mr Speaker, we're averaging around 7,400 tests in Northern Ireland, so it is a significant amount of testing that we're, we're completing per head of population. And we would be above, I th we would be above testing per head of population uh, not only in this island in comparison, but also across these islands. So access to Pillar 2 is vital to the programme that we carry forward, because that Pillar 2 in the National Testing Programme is also the testing support that we use for our care homes and the care home staff who are currently green and are to experience or don't have COVID-positive tests. So, so that Pillar 2 is vital for our response. Call Paula Bradshaw. Okay, Mr. Speaker, um, Minister, my question um, follows on from Mr. Giller news there earlier regarding the number of queries we're getting through our constituency offices, and I'm wondering, are you minded to set up a public representative's um, phone line to, to sort of filter those through, so we're not going through um, just the um, general um, helpline? Thank you. Okay, and uh, I thank the member for her question. We are exploring with NI Direct the possibility to do that because even with the with schools come back, we were seeing I think was it something. Like 1,600 calls in the first week, so the ability to filter out, um, and well, not filter out. Sorry, I, I apologise. Direct to the right location um, is crucial to make sure we get the right information to the right people who deserve it. So it's something that has been taken forward and, and explored both by by NI Direct and the Public Health Agency. Nicole Jerry Carl. Thanks, Minister, for your answers uh, so far. The Minister may or may not be aware that uh, Cambridge University is testing every student uh, once a week, Boston University every student uh, twice a week, and he obviously will agree with me that mass testing is fundamental to uh, el elimination, um, and especially as we just heard as you enter the chamber, a vaccine will not be likely available until 2024. Uh, is there any plans for mass testing to be um, available outside schools, universities, colleges, workplaces to ramp up testing that's required? And I thank the member. Um, Again, I don't know if he's been following announcements by my colleague Matt Hancock in regards to, I think it's Operation Moonshot. Um, I did guide him to suggest he maybe look for a better name, but unfortunately that's, that, that's the direction that they, they went with, which does look for that national testing capability to be ramped up. And I know they're talking you know, some time in advance. Uh, we will be part of that again, as I think Mr Chambers pointed out, because of that national input that we do have to our national testing programme. So when that mass testing becomes available, Northern Ireland is integral to it. Northern Ireland will be part of it. But at this minute in time, due to the capacity that we do have under Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, what I would say to people is use testing capacity wisely. Use it if you are guided to go there and get, use it if you have symptoms. Don't simply use it to see if you feel as if you may have COVID. It's not something that there that should be abused and something that should be used wisely. Nicole Liz Kimmins. And thank the Minister for coming this afternoon. Just in light of the previous members' comments uh, around the, the confirmed cases at Daisy Hill Hospital, um, can the Minister reassure me that health and social care staff will have access to COVID testing? Um, as over the weekend, I have had contact from staff members who have stated they have been refused testing um, despite in the vicinity. So, thank you. I thank the member for that. If she wants to contact my office specifically with 
with those concerns because if staff are experiencing symptoms, they have direct access to Pillar 1 under their occupational health contacts, so they should be able, if they have symptoms or are in contact with a positive case, they should be, access, they should be able to access that testing um, through the appropriate trust procedures. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the Minister for his answers thus far. There is no doubt that the um, improving crisis around testing and the accessibility on a local capacity is important, and I hope that we can address those issues soon. The Minister will be aware of the ongoing issues surrounding the local testing centre in Craigavon, which is being used via the MOT centre, and the backlog that that has caused both on MOTs and in relation to holding up the decision to start uh, driving vehicle tests. I wrote to the Minister some uh, two weeks ago on this, and I was wondering if he had considered any alternative sites, as had been indicated by his department. Well, well again, you know, it, it's something that I appreciate the, the Minister of Infrastructure's support from the beginning when she was able to make MOT centres available for, for COVID-19 centres, because they were very suitable and fit for purpose for what we needed to do at this moment in time. My understanding is that site is due to close uh, in October, which will allow it to be to be reutilised for MOT testing because I know it is something that is of a particular interest in that specific area. But if, if my call is if I have to make a toss, toss up between testing cars and testing people, I'll come down on the side of testing people. So it will be a managed process while we look for a new suitable site and we'll make that transition as soon as possible, but ensuring that we have continuity of testing in that area. Can I call her Leah Flynn? Uh, Gormi Ogut can call you, and thanks for the answers thus far to the Minister. Um, an issue has also been raised with me locally around uh, variations and sensitivities between the different testing kits. And I'm just wondering, is the Minister aware of any of these differences between the kits that are used by the Trusts, Car Homes and the PHA, as this would be particularly worrying given their use when discharging uh, vulnerable and um, elderly people from the hospital back out into the community? Thank you. Uh, and again, you know, the, the specificity on, on I can never get that word, but anyway, the guidance that we have from um, I take from my scientific advisory consortium in regards to what tests uh, are utilised in each set, setting, but also what tests are applicable to use um, are, is vital in regards to the work that we do, because I would rather have a, a test that errs on the side of caution. Uh, than one that produces a number of false positives. So the tests that we do use have been through the system, have been approved for the results that they give and the reliability. So I don't think we're using any test, in, any test system or any test um, out there that would be something that I would be concerned about, because if we had, I'm sure my scientific advisory consortium and my expert advisory group on testing would have highlighted it by now. Call Pat Kettner. Mr. Speaker, I thank you, Minister, for your questions and your answers so far. Minister, I'm trying to look at the, uh, the procedure and the percentage at Pillar 1 as against Pillar 2, noting that most of them are within the healthcare system in Pillar 1. Is there a percentage uh, line between both of those which are coming out, which are testing negative, to find out is one test exactly coming out on the, on the figures against the other one, and we're not missing something on that? I don't have that specific breakdown of Pillar 1 versus Pillar 2 because, as I said earlier on in my answer, they are looking at two different cohorts uh, within society. Pillar 1 is very focused towards our health care system, whereas Pillar 2 is for the general public. But what I, I, I can say to the member across our, our entire testing programme, um, we're now looking at, at the region of over 15 per cent of the population in Northern Ireland um, has been tested, um, which is quite a high percentage. So, again, the access to testing is crucial to us, um, but also the reliability. What we're also seeing in the number of people tested is a higher percentage of those people being tested are now coming out positive. So it's not just the fact that we're increasing the amount of tests we're doing, the amount of people who are testing positive is actually increasing disproportionately to the increase in testing as well. So that is what is raising the concerns that we have raised and the Department of Health has raised. Call Meg Nesbitt. Speaker, thank you. Just to, to, to follow on from the concerns expressed by Mr McNulty with regard to the timeliness of testing for, for patients and staff in hospitals, uh, I should declare that, that a couple of weeks ago I had to undergo um, 
a process at Belfast City Hospital and as part of the preparation, a COVID test and a serum it was delivered, not only in a timely manner, uh, but by a team who offered professionalism and empathy in equal and, for me, equally important measure. So while I accept there may be ongoing issues that the Minister will address, uh, as indeed there must be for, for all aspects of our reaction to COVID-19, I would hate for this House to send out a message to those involved in testing that they are delivering anything other than a first-class professional service, and I would ask the Minister to make sure that those professionals are aware of our gratitude. Yeah, um, again, I, I thank the member for his comments and his sentiments uh, towards the staff, and I'm glad to see him back after, after his procedure, because the point he makes is a valid one. When testing began in Northern Ireland a, sh a short five, six months ago, and that's something we need to, to keep in mind, those staff who stepped outside their normal roles and their normal routines to take up positions uh, within our testing system, I think, have to be applauded and also acknowledged because they do continue that piece of work um, outside their, their, routine, their routine work. And I, think one of the, I think it was when I actually visited the Newton Orange MOT Centre, um, I realised the diversity of those volunteers who had actually come forward uh, to, to, to provide the, the staffing complement for, for those testing facilities everything from student nurses to speech and language therapists uh, to professional nurses. So they all played a part and they all continue to play a vital role in our combat of COVID-19. I call George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far. <clears throat> Minister, is, is there any local mechanism that can speed up test, testing results? As I have a constituent who is a health worker and who has been waiting since Friday to 2 o'clock for the results, and why is there no PHA service at weekends to answer local queries? In, in regards to, to PHA, it's, it's not a, a public call centre. There is an NI direct line which can be used to get guidance in regards to, to regulations. If the member wants to supply me the details of his constituent who is waiting for, for that result, so follow it up and pass it to the Trust for concern. Members, that concludes this item of business, and could I ask members to take your ease presently.
Okay, members, we now return to the debate on the motion living over the shop scheme, and I call on uh, Cahill Boylan to wind on the amendment. You will have five minutes. Uh, Malgut, John Corlea, and thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to take part in the debate. And it has been an interesting debate. Um, and we all know, many as a member will certainly support our towns and try and revitalise our towns, there's no doubt about it. But um, in listening to my colleagues, and, and I, I'll bow to Mr. Fran McCann, he's not, he's not in the chamber at the minute, but he's been an expert in this field for a long many a day. He was in the old DST committee, along with my former colleague Mickey Brady, so he's well, he's well versed. But there's just a, a few points that I, I want to pick up, and then I'll pick up on some of the members' comments, because it's quite interesting. Obviously, some of the members didn't read either the motion or didn't read the amendment, um, because the original motion is asking for consideration of the minister. Um, and members, clearly, some members who commented, um, especially Mr. Blair, um, in an intervention with uh, Mr. Durkin from Derry, uh, it was clearly seen that they, they hadn't really read the. Uh, the motion or the amendment. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting um, if you look at it, because Mr Begg is not in the chamber either, and he mentioned, he mentioned the 2016 report was sitting, sitting on the shelf for uh, four years. But if you read some of the um, comments from some of those, I mean, there was um, in 2016, in June of 2016, I remember the proposal of the motion would know this here. Because if you he, he read this at the time, you certainly wouldn't have included this in some of, his, some of the original motion. Um, in June 2016, a selection of property agents across all 11 council areas were consulted to obtain their views on revitalised living over the shops scheme. All of the agents felt that currently the refurbishment of vacant accommodation in city and town centres is not currently viable as the level of rents are not sufficient to provide an adequate, adequate investment return on the cost to carry out refurbishment to a standard that will meet building regulations and a finish that will attract tenants. And if people had been listening to that or had seen that, they certainly would not be coming along um, today in relation to... Yeah, OK. Yeah. Thank the member for giving way, but on that point, would he, would he not, uh, if, if he had, I think he was in for the start of the debate, but I did mention that of the 3,595 non-domestic property vacancies, Northern Irish councils have identified that 1,015 of those would be suitable for residential conversion, and as, as he well pointed out, the housing stress that we're under, certainly that could go some way in helping. Mr. Barnum. Thank you, and I thank the member for the intervention. Yes, I've, take, I've taken notes, certainly, in relation to uh, the member introducing his, his motion to the floor. I mean, when you're talking about levels of 25,000 and up to 50,000 pounds of interventions in some of these cases, which is in the report, um, it's a lot of money. It, it's about public spend and it's about um, looking after people and proper spend within our town centres. And that's what this is about, to be, to be honest. Um, but I just want to turn to some of the members' uh, contributions, because it's, it's interesting. The member did release it when he, he moved the motion. He turned around and he talked. Um, he's referring to the minister, mentioned the minister, um, consider introducing the scheme. But still not in his contribution, he said he wanted direct action across the executive. And if he had a say, like, he's saying one thing, why then didn't he remember consider? putting something in the motion in relation to direct action, because I think there's other ways and other means, and obviously the Minister has already resp responded to the debate. I'm not going to uh, repeat all she said. But it's interesting, you know, when the member is talking about the footfall being down 79 per cent, certainly in April, and all, all the points he's mentioned, nobody would argue uh, about the decline of our high streets, there's no doubt about it, but it's how we go about revitalising them. He's talking about online shopping. And, Online shopping has hit all of the towns. There's no doubt about all the areas. So it's just in some of his commentary. Um, there's other ways and other means. And I think there's other agencies has to play a part in local councils. Mr Begg talked about uh, planning, and he's, he's mentioned planning on a number of committees and a number of things. 
yes, plan and policy, the local area plans has a, has a big part to play in the revitalisation, and, and the Minister alluded to, to some of the stuff that the, um, that the uh, Belfast had done in terms of trying to revitalise theirs. Let me finish. It is, I'm afraid, because sorry. it's a time debate. You sorry, I thought, I thought the next amendment. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I just support the amendment. Grand. Um, the next person then to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion, who will have 10 minutes, is Mr. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I thank uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Buckley, and indeed my colleague, Pam Cameron, for bringing. Sorry, Pam Bradley for bringing the motion forward, and Pam should have been winding up, but has unfortunately had to go home because of some domestic uh, problems. Uh, when I was uh, asked to, to wind up, I was trying to think about some uh, initial introductory remarks uh, uh, about uh, the motion itself and about the issues uh, around the motion. And it was sort of came to mind that I, I suppose if you think about maybe who was the most famous politician ever to live above the shop, you come to the name Margaret Thatcher uh, and, and her political career. But then we were reminded during the course of the debate that Pat Catney also <laughs> lived, lived above uh, the, the, the shop. And it certainly hasn't done him any, any uh, great harm. In, in his political career. And I suppose uh, I was, and I have to say this, I was extremely disappointed, extremely disappointed by the minister's response. Because I know the minister, I know the minister wants to provide housing for constituents. I know that. But I was extremely disappointed with the minister's response where she just dismissed it. In fact, a forceful rejection of the scheme. And indeed, she said she wouldn't even be considering such a scheme. No matter how good, no matter how different, no matter how it might be worked up, no matter what the priorities were, no matter where the finance come from, she wouldn't even be considering such a scheme. And I have to say, Minister, for all of those people who are currently on the growing waiting list, I would feel for them in their need for, for housing. And whether or not you like, whether or not you think, whether or not you think it's appropriate for people to live in the city centre and contribute to the city centre. I was also looking at the, the value of, of city centre living. Now, in London, you can buy, and this is a buy situation, in an area known as Buckingham. You can pay £240,000 for a, sh a flat above a shop. If you want to live close to Del Boy, you can buy in Peckham a two-bedroom flat for nearly £300,000. And if you want to live above a fish and chip shop in Mayfair, you can pay £5 million for that privilege. Now, that's successful use of housing in London. Maybe not the intention, maybe not the area that we want to cover, but it indicates that it's possible to do the job of successfully living and that people will pay huge amounts of money to live there. So we need to consider, Minister, we need to consider how we can make use of vacant space in city centres. And I do know, I do know Minister, that and it has been referred to by, by others, had been referred to by others, the need for a, a strategic approach to, to delivering such a scheme as this. And Mr Buckley, uh, eloquently in, in his proposing of the scheme, indicated that you would need to have the statutory bodies such as the councils uh, on board and that they have a major role to play in how this might be developed. My own feeling is you also need to have the arterial routes as suppliers of folk to, 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 to uh, uh, live in the city uh, and feed into the city. We also need to consider, and Mr Buckley in his remarks indicated this, that the outlying towns and villages also need to be considered and how their high streets 
might indeed benefit from such an initiative. And that strategic approach, Minister, does need to be considered rather than just dismissed. Such major schemes, uh, I don't think, cannot go forward without the specialist input. Those who are experienced in town and country planning, those who are experienced architects, those with imagination on how such a scheme can contribute. And I, and I noted that uh, Kelly Armstrong in her remarks indicated about the need for uh, play areas and, and green spaces and so on to, to make sure that it's an attractive area for family to live and work and play. I mean, such schemes, I think, do need to be, to be considered by a holistic approach and a team approach and everyone playing their, their part. We also need the potential of residents, tenants who may live in the properties, to have a need for security of tenure. And this is where uh, the Minister for Communities, whoever that minister might be, has a role. need to make sure that the, the shops that are existing in close proximity need responsible tenants. And there's always the fear, I think, if you're living a, above a restaurant or fast food outlet or that nature, of, of the potential dangers that, that, that you, you, you're, you're perhaps increasing. Families need, obviously, the facilities. They need the play parks. They need the, the doctor's surgery. They need the schools close by. But these are all factors that can be taken into consideration, Minister, as such a scheme makes its contribution to solving uh, the housing problem. I'll turn now to the sort of winding up and what others were saying. And obviously there was a, a, a variety of, of, of responses. Um, Mr McCann, he indicated that he was not uh, for he's not in the, 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 the chamber, indicated that he would not be supporting the, 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 the uh, motion, but would support the amendment. And indeed, he indicated, and I use his expression, that there was a, 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 a need to deal with the tangled web, was how he put it, and that the minister was willing to discuss all issues with the committee. The minister is not willing to discuss this issue or this approach uh, with, with the committee. Mr uh, Mark Durkin, and he highlighted the need for his own city uh, uh, and the needs that are there uh, and the problems in his own constituency and acknowledged that there was a need to address this issue. And I know from my, my time on the committee that this is a, a, an issue that is close to his heart as well. And uh, he said, we need to learn from the failed schemes of the past. And I agree with him. We do need to learn where there have been failures uh, in, in the past. Mr. Beggs uh, indicated a need for flexibility and the reuse of town centres, indicating that they need to refresh also the planning uh, policies in order that such, a, such schemes as this can go forward. And again, highlighted the homeless uh, problem in his constituency, something that affects all of us. Kelly Armstrong, I've already uh, mentioned what Kelly Armstrong, she ha highlighted the need, can't go forward without uh, grant support. Uh, Sinead Ennis from Sinn Féin, she uh, would support only the Sinn Féin amendment, uh, and she so uh, stressed the need to address city centre development. Now, when I look at the, 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 the proposal and the amendment, I'm a bit flummoxed, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, because in Mr. Buckley's case, he's saying we want to make use of the high streets for high quality locations to live as well as work. And the amendment says city centres, by pr providing additional affordable, accessible, and high quality accommodation. And yet we have a big issue. Now it seems to me that we are actually all on the same page on the issue of addressing this, uh, providing additional homes and regenerating at the same time our city centres. Uh, Mr Pat Catney, I have already referred to him, but he stressed the affordability 
of, of lot schemes, potential affordability of lot schemes, and the potential to enhance the area. And I assume he's talking also about, about his constituency and his city uh, uh, of Lisburn and what could happen there. He also indicated that professional experience needs to be, to be brought into play. Uh, Mr John Stewart indicated that uh, certainly this would contribute to the increasing of local uh, rates uh, uh, and indeed highlighted the social potential of, of, of this uh, scheme. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm sorry I haven't got to everyone's comments, but indeed I think most, most of the members, uh, if not all of the members, made a very positive contribution, albeit I may not have agreed with all that they said. Thank you. The question is that the amendments standing in the names of Sinead Ennis, Fra McCann, Karen Mullen and Cathal Boylan be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, if any, no. 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 Okay. I think we're going to have a division. It's always good fun. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. The House will divide. Order. Order. Members will resume their seats, please. Thank you. Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. 
The question is that the amendment standing in the names of Sinead Ennis, Fran McCann, Karen Mullen and Cathal Boylan be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. no. Aye. Do we have tellers? Order. Members could resume their seats, please. Thank you. The tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the eyes are Sinead Ennis and Cathal Boylan. The tellers for the nose are Jonathan Buckley and Robin Newton. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I also remind you that social distancing continues to be observed whilst the division is taking place. Please be patient at all times and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Clear the lobbies, the assembly will divide, eyes to my right, nose to my left.
<laughs> Secure the doors.
Order. Members can please resume their seats. And I'll ask the clerk to please read the result. 81 members voted. 40 members voted aye. 41 members voted no. The amendment therefore falls. The amendment has fallen. Unfasten the doors. Question. No, it's okay. The question therefore is. 
that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary if any. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary if any. Mr Carroll is now in the Hansard. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary if any. Thank you. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Members, this relates to the business of the House. I have received notification from the members of the Business Committee of a motion to extend the sitting past 7 p.m. under Standing Order 10.3a. Can I ask? Oh, I beg your pardon, your division clerk. I had to get, let you get out of the way. Sorry, Leslie. Bit of musical chairs here. Just one wee second. Going ahead. I ask the clerk to please read the motion. That in accordance with Standing Order 10.3a, the sitting on Monday the 14th of September 2020 be extended no later than 8pm. Call Mr John O'Dowd to move the motion. Moved. The question is that the motion standing in the name of the Business Committee be agreed. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Contrary, if any, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is carried, and the Assembly may sit until 8 p.m. this evening, if necessary. If members could please take their ease for a few moments, just for a change at the top table. Thank you. Order members, the next item on the order paper is a motion on race equality. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. Clerk. That this assembly recognises that the racial equality strategy 2015 to 2025 was not fully implemented and is now significantly outdated. Acknowledges the commitment contained in New Decade New Approach to the publication of a new and updated racial equality strategy within 100 days of the restoration of the Assembly, further recognises the positive contribution made to society by those from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds, de deplores the discrimination black, Asian and minority ethnic communities face regularly, condemns racism in all its forms, commits to act urgently on the forthcoming report on the review of hate crime legislation, calls for the promotion of an anti-racism ethos in our schools, and further calls on the executive to formulate and implement urgently a meaningful racial equality strategy. Thank you. Nicole, Emma Sheeran to formally move the motion. Well, William Boggy, I'd like to move it. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion with 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. And I invite you to open the debate on the motion. 
I rise today to urge members to support this motion, to send a clear and unequivocal message to the population of the North that racism is a scourge that the representatives in this chamber take seriously and will act with urgency to stamp out. Sinn Féin believe in a society that cherishes equality and respect as central tenets, a society free of discrimination in all its forms. This House must send a resounding signal that we have zero tolerance for racism here. We have brought this motion forward today to prioritise the updating and implementation of a racial equality strategy. In 2016, the UN Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination called on the executive of the day to adopt a comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation without further delay. Yet the racial equality strategy of 2015 has never been properly implemented. We need to acknowledge the blight of racism and the very real and lasting impact that it has on the lives of many within our community. Racism thrives where it is not challenged, where people turn a blind eye to insults and derogatory remarks. Violent attacks and vandalism are the symptoms. Hatred and intolerance are the cancer that caused them. Racism is not an arbitrary pie in the sky notion that exists in books and films and stops there. It is 100% true that it should have been relegated to the dustbin of history long ago, and it wasn't right then either, but it hasn't been. It's something that impacts upon real people today. Families, mothers, brothers, fathers, daughters. Growing up as an other or feeling the constant need to justify your identity is not acceptable in any 21st century society. And given the history of Ireland, it's certainly not acceptable here. Obviously, as recently as 2018, the British government themselves have exacerbated the hurt felt by the very people who they called upon to rebuild their country when they needed help by criminalising an entire generation of immigrants from the West Indies in a debacle that has now become known as the Windrush scandal. Racism, like any form of prejudice, is a mould. It grows under shadows, fed by hatred and intolerance, and curtained in a shroud of secrecy. It is only allowed to fester when it goes unchallenged, and as we are no strangers to in the north of Ireland, when discrimination becomes institutionalised, when it is practised by those who make and enforce the law, it is legitimised. In a year unlike any other, in the middle of a global pandemic, we watched the fallout of the deadly virus called racism in America, as the murder in cold blood of George Floyd on the street in Minneapolis played out on our televisions and our timelines. People took to the streets again. A few years ago, on a holiday in the deep south in America, I stood outside the Lorraine Motel and I felt the sadness of what had happened there overcome me. To think that the children and grandchildren of the Freedom Riders, the marchers, the students who staged sit-ins in diners are still having to walk behind placards to be treated with decency and respect is beyond belief. It's shameful that in 2020, protest is still required for a life free of harassment and bullying because of the colour of your skin. We can dismiss this as something that happened far, far away across the Atlantic, but the reality is that racism is experienced every day on these shores as well. Countless accounts of members of the black and ethnic minority communities who have made their homes here told the same stories of verbal and physic physical abuse, remarks and messages from behind a keyboard. In 2018, a Life and Times survey in answer to the question about whether there was more racial prejudice in the North now than 40 years ago, 41% of respondents said more now. That's not acceptable. The European Court of Human Rights describes racial discrimination as a particularly insidious sign kind of discrimination. And in view of its consequences, they state that it requires from the authorities special vigilance and a vigorous reaction. Yet in the North, we have less protection for victims of racism than anywhere else in these islands. We need to address this. We need to see the implementation of stronger hate crime legislation, the report on which we await. This legislation must tackle institutional racism at its core and should be based on international best practice. It needs to be clear in people's minds that bullying on the basis of race is a crime that carries a penalty, something that is unacceptable before the law here. Supplementary to this, 
we require affirmative action to ensure proper representation of black, Asian and minority ethnic communities within our public sector and on the boards that make decisions. We should be, as part of this strategy, properly furnishing the groups who represent these communities with the resources that they require. There is an absence of ethnic monitoring, which means that we lack data relating to the presence of black and ethnic minorities in government and in industry. If you haven't got the full picture, it is difficult to address the issues. Much has been made in recent times about how this is a decade of centenaries. We're also in the middle of the UN decade of persons of African descent, something that we should be honouring within this chamber. What greater legacy could we have than to create a society where racism is nothing more than a horrible memory? For anyone who is brave enough to leave their home to make a life elsewhere, far from family and surroundings that they are used to, Ireland should be a warm and welcoming shore. We all have a duty to call out racism when we see it and act together to create a society built on justice and respect that treats everyone equally. We, as an executive, have to demonstrate that we have zero tolerance for racism here. Gormagath. One amendment has been uh, approved and is published on the Marshall's list. And I now invite uh, Paula Bradshaw to move, formally move the amendment. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to also moved. To formally move it. Okay. Okay, I think you said moved, yes? Yes, Okay, it thank you. <laughs> you will have 10 minutes to, uh, to uh, debate the amendment and a further five minutes to wind. I now invite you uh, to open the debate on the amendment. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to propose the Alliance Party amendment to the motion, but I thank the members of Sinn Féin for bringing forward this important subject for debate today. I represent the South Belfast constituency, noted as the most culturally, ethnically and socially diverse constituency in Northern Ireland, and it is this diversity that makes it all the more enriched and prosperous in all senses of the word. The frustration, therefore, for many, not least the minority ethnic community, is that the issue of race relations does not appear to receive the attention and concentration of effort that it deserves and requires. As such, our amendment is to provide a mechanism for fully engaging and drawing on the lived experience of the BAME community to co-design and co-produce an updated race relations strategy for Northern Ireland. Their input will not only provide space to make the amended strategy more closely linked to the issues faced, but will also ensure greater buy-in from this diverse community. The premise for wide and authentic co-design and co-production is that firstly, we have the identification of all the problems and solutions. Then we ensure that we translate the solutions into firm actions, outputs and outcomes. This is where I feel that the current strategy from the Executive Office is light on detail and needs to go further and be more ambitious. And that is why I'm calling for an update as opposed to a replacement. Our amendment also calls for a timetable for this work to be completed and, more importantly, implemented. The BIME community has been raising concerns for many years, not least at the lack of a sense of urgency in addressing the issues they face in many aspects of their lives. To address the substance of the motion, I very much welcomed the inclusion of the, in the New Decade New Approach Agreement, the need to produce a new and updated strategy within 20, or sorry, 100 days. To be fair to the Executive Office, nobody in January could have predicted that our lives and the work of this Assembly would be so significantly disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, it is entirely reasonable and understandable that this target of 100 days may have slipped. However, it is now time for this work to recommence. And so moving on from here today, while it is important that the Executive Office leads on this work with full engagement from the BAME, BAME community and other voluntary sector stakeholders, it is also vital that, uh, that there is cross-departmental feed-in to this strategy and in turn complete cooperation in terms of the agreed actions and their timeframes for implementation. This departmental cooperation will be vital to ensure that existing and forthcoming uh, forthcoming work complements the content and aspirations of the race relations strategy and this will make this will require some work in terms of assimilation and coordination but it is very much necessary the next stage from this will be the requirement that sufficient funding is allocated so that the actions can be fully delivered in a timely fashion where there is cross departmental working required it is absolutely vital that there is agreement from the start 
that the collaboration is forthcoming and not wrangled, especially as regards financing, which we in this chamber know has been the reason why many a fine project has not gotten off the ground. <coughs> Further to this, I have met with numerous voluntary sector groups, especially in my constituency, who are doing the most amazing work with ethnic minority communities from origins all over the world, from all parts of the world, and yet they are operating on an absolute shoestring um, with stressful levels of funding, uncertainty and risk. If we are serious about empowering and integrating people who choose to live here, then we have to properly support those groups who have the connections, understanding and ability to properly engage with them. Taking forward the themes of empowering and integrating people, we need to ensure that members of the BAME community are educated about all aspects of our public services, with particular reference to providing them with an understanding of the standards of support and duty of care that they should expect, and in turn equipping them with um, the power to stand up and speak out for these rights. As regards integrating, we know that individuals and families are coming to Northern Ireland to settle here for many years, decades and even centuries. And it has long since gone time that we remove some barriers to their full assimilation into life here in our schools, workplaces and community life in general. On this, it is equally important that we put in place measures to ensure that this integration is not blocked nor frustrated by others through covert or, or overt racism and in, in extreme cases, hate crime. And I very much work, uh, welcome the ongoing work in the Justice Department into the review of hate crime legislation. It is this type of robust work that needs to be replicated across many departments to ensure that the relevant legislative framework is fit for purpose. There may also be measures required in addressing educational achievement amongst BAME pupils, which can be the result of, or at least um, partway perpetuated by bullying and marginalisation in our schools. As such, there may be the need to produce anti-racism or update ant existing anti-bullying policies to reflect, reflect the needs of these pupils in securing appropriate support. Another key area that I feel that the race relations strategy has a huge role to play is in the workplace. From the time of recruitment processes in terms of fair employment through to access to training and promotional opportunities, it is in everyone's interest that the legislative and policy frameworks are workable and effective in ensuring harmony and integration for all BAME employees. In closing, um, Mr Speaker, I hope MLAs here today can support our amendment and I would like to place on record my thanks for those groups and individuals who have worked so hard over the years at campaigning for the rights of BAME members of our society. Their efforts are very much appreciated and welcomed by the Alliance Party. Lastly, I wish to send my best wishes to those members of the British, sorry, the Belfast Multicultural Association, whose cars were damaged at the weekend. If ever there was a stark reminder that we need a fresh look at race relations here in Northern Ireland, it was this. Thank you. Members, all other speakers in this debate will have up to five minutes. I call George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I do not believe that any MLA would support anything but racial equality and condemn all racial attacks in Northern Ireland from whatever quarter that it came from. We must also remember that while the motion states that, and I quote, the Racial Equality Strategy 2015-2025 is outdated, progress was prevented as the Assembly was not sitting and dealing with this matter in a timely manner for three years. It is important that the strategy is moved forward and this must be done with care to ensure whatever decisions are made are practical and most importantly workable. While I appreciate that speed is desired, it is, not, it is better to ensure a practical and workable strategy. I fully believe that an interdepartmental approach is required and I am glad that there is a racial equality champion in every department. I also see benefit from each department's observations being brought to an interdepartmental forum, so best practice can be seen to be the result. Speed is not the most important aspect. Accuracy is. Any conclusions must be informed by the ethnic minorities. This is a positive way to produce the best possible strategy, fully informed by those it is intended to help. A good example of best practice for greatest results, which will be truly beneficial. 
As I said earlier, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I fully support the need for the racial equality strategy to be completed and implemented, but this must be a workable strategy with genuine beneficial results for Northern Ireland and the increasingly multi-racial population which we should all embrace. Thank you. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome this debate today because I think it is timely. Uh, we have seen over the summer in places like America some of the most atrocious behaviours from those that are meant to uphold and protect the law against those that should be protected. And it would not be an underestimate, an understatement, to say that in places like America, racism still remains and is not on the decrease. However, to simply look at such a splinter without acknowledging the plank in our own eye is wrong. We have racism in our society. The things that are said and done, the things that aren't said and aren't done, and the things that are said and done and left unchecked. These are all existing in our society, and we have not yet successfully challenged or removed them. The scourge remains among us. Now, many lauded the launch by the First and Deputy First Minister of the Racial Equality Strategy here in 2015. It was a comprehensive document and contained 11 key actions. Sadly, many of them have never been introduced or developed. This is sad and an indictment of where this executive and to a lesser extent or sorry to where that executive and to a lesser extent this executive places the challenging of racism these matters contained in the racial equality strategy of 2015 to 2025 are as relevant now this second this minute this hour the strategy doesn't suffer from being outdated it suffers from never being implemented would members consider a review of the current race relations Northern Ireland order significantly outdated? That piece of legislation has not been touched for eight years. Surely that legislation requires a review. It is, uh, is it outdated to seek a review of fair employment legislation? What about working with the Department of Education to tackle racist bullying in schools? We have anti-bullying legislation which the Minister is yet to reenact. However, this legislation places the onus entirely on schools to record and monitor without having to actually report back to the department, so we don't get a wider picture of what racial bullying actually looks like. Ethnic monitoring. This is such a huge element within the strategy. However, it drastically needs to be introduced. Without any form of ethnic monitoring, we will be searching for a solution to an issue that we do not even have the full picture of. There will be a new census taken next year, and at present there are 16 ethnic groups to choose from, with titles as generic as African, yet there are literally thousands of ethnic groups and cultures in Africa, yet there are, um, how on earth do we expect to gauge the needs of the people who live here if we don't know where they are? Racial equality champions, that's something that I've been asking all ministers about, about the champion raising the awareness of the racial equality strategy and Department's commitment to it. The authors and contributors and ministers lauding the strategy then knew what they were challenging was so deep-rooted and so systemic that it was going to take time to challenge. That is why the strategy was set for 10 years, a generation nearly of schoolchildren and wider society that could learn the benefits of a multicultural society where all are accepted regardless of their backgrounds or beliefs, their colour or their creed. The only outdated action is the lack of action that has been taken to implement that strategy. Now, the passage of time means that all strategies should be reviewed and assessed, and having a living document is uh, much more preferable. And I'm not under any illusion that the current strategy does need some amendment. But I would like to see more concrete outcomes, more measurable activity to observe how it's been implemented to make sure that we can see progress. Although some of the activities from the summer will have sparked new thoughts and new ideas and new approaches, these can also be incorporated into the strategy. But it isn't substantially out of date. This doesn't require renewed formulations. All the ingredients are there. It needs action, not more discussion. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to highlight that the party that's proposing this motion today, highlighting the inactivity and suggesting that the strategy is out of date, 
is the very party that launched the existing one five years ago and then oversaw no implementation and co-contributed to three years of inactivity here on the Hill and has been back in charge since January. I think that there is more headline chasing here than substance. Many in the sector think that if what we have is grand, let's implement it alongside a review and polish up what we have. People want action. I want action. And getting on will deliver action. Let's do the right thing. I call Doug Beebe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, and I rise um, to address this important uh, motion uh, and in doing so uh, support it. I, I shall keep my comments, I think, uh, quite general, um, uh, as opposed to maybe getting into some of the detail due to time. The very fact that we are still talking about discrimination due to somebody's colour or ethnic background uh, is really quite depressing. Um, dealing with it is, is long overdue. I simply cannot fathom why some individuals within our society feel they have a right to treat their fellow human being in such a derogatory way through intimidation, discrimination, threats of violence and violence based purely on the colour of their skin. Of course, these same people will argue uh, a variety of reasons for their bigotry and will use the terms like, I have black friends. But the reality is, if you treat someone differently, purely because the colour of their skin, ethnic background, you are a racist. And you are in denial if you say you are not. I have been very lucky in my life, uh, is that I have lived in many different countries uh, around the world and spent a lot of time uh, in Africa, uh, in Uganda, in Sierra Leone, in Kenya, in Somalia. And while I was there, I immersed, immersed myself in the culture that was there. Wonderful, rich cultures, wonderful, rich people, giving people. It has broadened my horizons. It has given me a wider left and right of arc to understand why they may come to here to wish to eke out a better life than where they have in some other parts of the world. It has allowed me to see people as people, because that is exactly what they are nothing more, nothing less. Within Northern Ireland, the black, Asian and ethnic minorities work in our factories, in our shops, garages, in our hospitality sector. They are in our care homes. They are in our hospitals. They are paramedics. They are clinical and non-clinical staff. They are doctors. They are surgeons. And without them, we would be a poorer place. So therefore, we need to ensure that our black, Asian and ethnic minorities are valued, cherished, supported and protected. We need to do this through legislation, through a racial equalities strategy and anti-racism ethos, through education and through civic society with better understanding. We must address it through our justice system, and I am disheartened that we are not doing more. But to do that, we need data to inform any strategy, and the final draft report on a review of ethnic monitor monitoring gave a list of recommendations, including appointing an independent advisor on race equality, setting up an ethnic monitoring unit, extending fair employment legislation, enacting a public sector equality duty. It's not hard to do. It will take a resource. It will take money. But it is the right thing to do. There is no place for racism in Northern Ireland. There never was. There never is. There never will be. It is important to future-proof our society and put a firewall in place between our young people and racism. This is not just for the executive office. This is a cross-cutting where all departments have a part to play in this. It's as much an issue for justice and the economy and education as it is for the executive office. There is no point trying to package this in one place. Everybody needs to be involved. Everybody needs to take ownership. Everybody needs to be a part of this. Uh, we will be supporting the motion. I call Christopher Stolford. 
Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, much like Mr McGrath, the one element of the motion that I disagree with is the reference to the strategy being significantly outdated. The strategy was put in place for the period 2015 to 2025, and we're here in 2020. I think you can probably say, OK, we know things now that we didn't know in 2015 that we should maybe include in the strategy, but I don't think it's fair to say that it's significantly outdated. And like Mr McGrath, uh, I would point out that we were without a government uh, for a period of time, and I don't wish to rehearse the reasons for that. Uh, I represent, and I'm privileged to represent, the constituency that I was born and reared in, in South Belfast. It is a very diverse and a cosmopolitan constituency, and it has always been thus. Much like the rest of Northern Ireland, South Belfast has always been a welcoming place from pe for people from beyond our shores. If we go back on a Northern Ireland level, 70 years ago, lots of Italian people came here in the immediate aftermath of World War II to make their home. 50 years ago, or 60 years ago, I suppose now, 1960, early 60s, it was people from an Indian and a Chinese background who came here and put down roots. And in my constituency, I'm very proud of those communities and the contribution that they make to our society. These are people who came to Northern Ireland and invested in Northern Ireland at a time when nobody else wanted to, because we were thought of as, <laughs> frankly, a hellhole on the edge of Europe that no one wanted to be in. But these people came and made a contribution to our society. Children aren't taught, or sorry, children don't naturally hate. They have to be taught it. And I'm a father of four young children, three of which are primary school. And I see, for example, the school that I went to, Nettlefield Primary School, at the bottom of the Woodstock Road. When I went there, there would have been very, very few people from a, a different background, whether it was from Eastern Europe or Africa or anywhere else. There's now probably about 25 languages spoken in the school. Fane Street Primary School, as my, my colleague can attest, uh, Paula Bradshaw can attest, I suspect it's probably more than 50. Botanic Primary School is the same. So I represent a, a very, very diverse constituency. But as the father of young children, you see the children play peaceably, happily together. They have to be taught to hate. And I think it's important, therefore, that we recognise the contribution that schools are already making to ensuring the children grow up respecting each other, loving each other, and being kind and decent with each other. And certainly the school that my children attend, where I have you know, a daughter with her best friends from Romania and her other friends from Estonia in the same class. And you see the contribution that the schools make to fostering a spirit of togetherness amongst the children. So I absolutely accept the reference to schools and why that's important. All I'm saying is that there's already important work going on uh, orchestrated by schools. I think co-design in any strategy going forward is a really important principle. We do not have the lived experience of people who have travelled here to make their home. We can never have that lived experience. Most of us, I think all of us in this room certainly, were born here and we have known nothing else. And therefore, the significant obstacles and challenges that people face when they come here to build a new life for themselves and uh, to make a contribution to our society. Those challenges, especially if you're thinking about things like getting access to healthcare, getting access to education for their kids, getting access to uh, social services or benefits, all of those things that people who were born here know inside out, those people don't know that, so help needs to be given there and assistance. And so I think it's really important that let's not throw the baby out. Much I will. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there is good work that the executive can point to, but of course we can always do better. Thank you. I call Linda Dillon.
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The stats highlight clearly the increase in the number of hate-related crimes and racially motivated attacks, and that's extremely concerning, particularly given that we're all well aware that many incidents and crimes in this category go unreported for many reasons, including language and cultural barriers, but also due to the fear of reprisal, especially where there is concern that there may be paramilitary involvement. A 2018 Police and Board report found that some victims suggested that PSNA officers had assessed their credibility based on negative stereotyping, and whilst paramilitary groups targeting minority ethnic communities has been evidenced, no joint strategy appears to have been put in place to tackle this. Current legislation in the North is failing victims, as highlighted by the previous DPP, Barr McGrory, when he stated there is no easy opportunity to identify the race element in court. It's the law, it's the way it's, it is framed, and certainly the policymakers and lawmakers on these issues may want to revisit this. And I would pick up on, on Doug Beattie and others in relation to that, that we have many departments that need to take responsibility here, including justice. These crimes currently come under the Public Order Act 1987, which does not meet the stipulations of international human rights standards. There needs to be serious consideration given to a restorative approach post-conviction or incarceration, as this will assist in reconciliation and meaningful rehabilitation, as imprisonment alone will often not address the underlying issue. Any restorative approach must be victim-led and voluntary, but I think it is a very important part of the approach because that is what will actually lead to real and meaningful reconciliation, as we well know from our, our own lived experience here. We need laws that properly meet the needs of victims, but as a community, and we in particular as leaders in our community, need to have a zero-tolerance zero approach to racism in all of its forms. The best way to protect ethnic, ethnic minority groups from attacks is by ensuring that they're not seen as isolated or vulnerable. And the way to do that is to ensure that we all, as individuals, reach out to our neighbours and those in our constituencies who may fall into these categories. It's not good enough to stand back or to put a, a statement out and say this is terrible, what has happened to, to a person that lives near me or in my constituency is, is terrible. We have to be seen to be standing with those people. We have to be seen to be reaching out to our neighbours. We have to be seen to let, let our children play with those children because too often you see it's easier just not to because they speak a different language and there's all kinds of barriers. If you have children who live near children of other backgrounds culturally, you should be encouraging your children to embrace that diversity. It, as has already been said here by, by Mr Stalford, it's really, really important. No child is born to hate. They learn it. So what we need to do is teach them differently. And we as parents, we as leaders, all have responsibility around that. So I thank this motion for coming forward and support the amendment. I call Martina Anderson. You know, it is a sad indictment on our society that in this day and age we need to call for the full implementation of a racial equality strategy, but unfortunately we do. We know that from the 2018 Life and Time survey that a significant group in the North are intolerant of people who they don't want as neither a friend or a neighbour. Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of the colour of their skin or their background or their religion. People must learn to hate. Children are not born hating, as has been said. They learn hate from within their peer groups, their communities, and sadly, sometimes within their own homes. Prejudice is a blight in our society that needs tackled, and a good starting point would be to address it within our schools and our education curriculum. Schools are one of our children's earliest learning experience, so we need to teach them that based on our common humanity, we are all equal, no matter the colour of our skin, our background, or religion. Thankfully, many schools now include new nationals. So schools must adopt an anti-racist ethos 
that practices would, that will stamp out racism whenever it raises its ugly head. This could be advanced through enhanced teacher training to support them when dealing with children who suffer racist bullying. Confronted, confronting narrow-mindedness, developing inclusive processes and procedures which include ethnic minority children, teaching children that all human beings are born equal could reduce racism in the future. Of course, it's not only schools that need to stamp out racism. This assembly needs to step up to the plate by advancing, and as was evidenced by my, my party colleague, Linda Dillon, who highlighted the impact of legislative failure. Previously, I put questions to the SDLP Minister for Infrastructure, Nicola Mallon, about the legality of TransLink facilitating the targeting of people on the basis of the colour or ethnicity on cross-border transport services. It is just wrong that the colour of someone's skin or their appearance. Just as a point of information, does she have uh, which particular evidence is she talking about about TransLink staff stopping members of the public? It would just be helpful if she could clarify exactly what she's talking about. Transport facilitating buses being stopped and people being taken off the bus because of the colour of their skin. And it is wrong that the colour of someone's skin or their appearance can determine if they are singled out on a bus full of people. This is not equality, and as has been said by the chair of the, the SDLP chair of the TEO committee, we can't have things done and left unchecked. We need mandatory ethnic mo min, uh, monitoring of how stop and search powers are being used. The powers of law enforcement officers to stop persons and seek papers confirming their identity and status is clearly provided for by law. To our new nationals, Sinn Féin say to you, Ked Mila Falsha, a hundred thousand welcomes. And we will do all within our power to protect you, particularly from abuse, racially motivated intimidation, violence and discrimination. As political leaders, we have a duty to send out a strong message to everyone within our society that racism is a cancer that we will not tolerate. An important first step, as this mo motion points out, is for this Assembly and Executive to ensure that we have a robust racial equality strategy accompanied by an action plan which clearly sets out steps we will take both legislatively and legally to protect everyone within our society. As our Joint First Minister Michelle O'Neill stated today, there is a responsibility on us all to create a society free from racism which values diversity and which treats everyone with respect. As a Sinn Féin MLA for Derry, I want the North West Migrant Forum to once again hear that Sinn Féin message loud and clear. If anyone or any party in this Assembly or Executive is an obstacle to that, then let's find out and let's call them out. Thank you all. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm now the third member of the Assembly for South Belfast to stand up and speak to this motion. And that's appropriate. And I will echo a lot of what both uh, Paula Bradshaw and Christopher Stalford said about the constituency of South Belfast. It's not only the most diverse in Northern Ireland, it has some claim to be the most diverse in the whole, on the whole island of Ireland. And we are rightly proud of that. It adds to the richness of our community. It is uh, important for our, uh, for it adds to the economic vibrancy and the cultural vibrancy of the place we live. This year, we have all been focused in large part uh, to a much greater extent on deep structural questions around uh, structural racism and racial inequality in our societies. This was first, uh, or first this year, um, brought to um, forced into the public debate by the appalling murder of George Floyd and the um, protests that followed in the States. 
like Emma Shear and I visited the deep south of the United States, and it's difficult to visit that part of America without being deeply affected by the deep, by the burning sense of profound historical injustice and unresolved wrong that continues to afflict that part of the United States. And it's not irrelevant to this part of the world. It isn't, uh, it isn't something that we can um, ignore in our own society, not just because, as I said about South Belfast, our society is becoming more diverse. So there is no, I think, real difference in this assembly about the importance and urgency of addressing structural racism in our society. This morning we had a debate on uh, one of our own long-standing uh, pet preoccupations in this part of the world, that of flags and associated questions of identity in this part of Ireland. Well, those kinds of debates and our um, tendency to have quite a few of them in this place, and that's not to, to say that there weren't aspects of this morning's debate that weren't important, does tend to alienate many of the people from newer communities in Northern Ireland who think that these institutions don't do enough to reflect the fact that we don't exist any longer in a green-orange binary society and that there are very real, very profound uh, injustices that they face in their everyday lives and in the economic um, uh, opportunities that they have and in the opportunities that their families have. Um, the meat of the motion is about reflecting the fact that we need a new racial equality strategy because the previous uh, one was not fully implemented. As my colleague Colin McGrath said, um, we can't completely ignore the reasons for that um, uh, racial equality strategy not being implemented and why we were not here to implement it. I don't have uh, any problem with the context of the racial equality strategy being reviewed. In fact, I think it's essential. So in that part, I completely agree with the motion. There is concern within the sector about um, taking time to go away and redraft an entirely new strategy um, at a time when um, there is a huge amount of urgency in terms of implementing what was agreed in 2014 but left on a shelf. So what this motion should not be is permission for our institutions, our executive, to go away and uh, delay implementing what's already been agreed, including some of the, the things that Linda Dillon was very eloquently talking about around hate crime legislation. Given that we know those uh, are things that we need to be implementing, we should just get ahead and do it. But it is also the case that the context has changed since 2014. Um, we all, the context has changed since this January when we came back to this place. Uh, yes, because of COVID-19, but also because of some of the circumstances around Brexit. Brexit will fundamentally alter not just our economic relationships, but also the, uh, under, the, the constitutional and legal underpinnings for the broader human rights agenda in Northern Ireland. There, are a, there is a very long list of unanswered questions that the British government has failed to engage on that, we, that is uh, directly relevant to how we proceed in terms of uh, equality legislation and the broader racial equality strategy here. Um, there are specific things we need to improve in terms of the implementation of the existing strategy around budgets, around meaningful accountability. And if today's debate does anything, let it do this. Let it not be the last time we discuss this for months until we come back for a private member's motion and, and, and an amendment to it. Let us keep up the pressure. Let's keep talking about whether this is being declared. delivered and let's hold those uh, to account who said they were going to deliver this strategy. Uh, let's hold them to account for actually delivering it. So yes, uh, I want to see a new focus on delivering uh, racial equality in this society, but no, I don't just want to see us spending time, uh, the time debating the, 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 the term, you know, debating the what we already should be getting on with implementing. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and yep, I'd be the fourth South Belfast MLA then to stand up, so it's great to see all my South Belfast colleagues here today. Um, and obviously, proud to take the, the shout out for the most diverse constituency across across the land. And I know for a fact, well, I would be pretty confident, sorry, that Deirdre Hargy, um, as the fifth MLA for the area, would be here today if her health allowed her. Um, but I'm also um, part of the Italian immigration story that was referenced by my colleague Christopher Salford. Um, and my family are all integrated education alumni, um, and there were 27 languages spoken in my children's primary school. All these reasons were part of the reasons I chose the school, but this motion really does confuse me. 
um, and many have pointed out already the problems with it. Um, and it states that this assembly recognises that the racial equality strategy 2015 to 2025 was not fully implemented and is now significantly outdated. So, unless I'm mistaken, we are only in 2020. Um, and there are five years in which we can rectify that um, and have a look at what we do need to do. Now, let's be real. This strategy, like every other executive strategy, is only as good as the political will to implement it. I, ha I have consulted with some of the black and ethnic minority community leaders um, over the past few days, and they, like me, believe that the strategy continues to be very much serviceable. It's the implementation, or the lack of, where the problem lies. Do we really have the resources to develop a whole new strategy when the current one hasn't been delivered or implemented? What is needed are action plans and resources to implement the undelivered 11 key actions already committed to in the current strategy, along with an anti-racism strategy that will be resourced as well. One key action in the racial equality strategy is the establishment of a ministerial panel, for example. That's not been done. So what has been done with regards to racial equality since January 2020, when the Assembly was reconvened? I know of only two of the key actions that have been implemented, and that was the appointment of department champions, for which we have no updates or ongoing works for, or know nothing about the training and resource given to them. And the subgroup has been established. Um, and while the, yep, sure. Do you agree with me that it's not good that those 11 are those uh, departmental champions? As I understand it, there's only one that has actually been there from the strategy started in 2015. The rest have continually turned over and that they've had one training session in five years. And that if we talk about things being outdated, it's getting those people in their room to find out what they can actually do within a department. The members an extra minute. Thank you. And I think that comes back again to, you know, a strategy is only as good as the political will to implement it. Um, yep, so there's lots to still do, but the subgroup, the subgroup has been established. They do meet regularly. They do meet quarterly. And I think that it's uh, sad that they probably weren't even consulted on for this debate uh, before it was lodged. Um, but I believe that commissioning a new strategy, strategy could be quite regressive and um, move to delay us really tackling the racial inequalities that do exist. And I think our time would be better spent reviewing and resourcing the current strategy as it is and developing and rolling out anti-racism training, which is absolutely key for us all to learn about tackling racism in our society. So there's much, there is a need for much more significant staff resources and funding to be dedicated to tackling racism, and this needs to be for a long term. The Northern Ireland Assembly must renew its commitment to building a society where racial equality and diversity is supported, understood, valued and respected, where people of minority ethnic backgrounds have a sense of belonging, which is acknowledged and valued by people from all backgrounds. Um, which is acknowledged, or sorry, and as outlined in the strategy to ensure accountability for its implementation. And while working hand in hand with the current subgroup um, and using their expertise to move us forward. And I think it's shocking to realise that while um, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, we know that a lot of our BME community are um, key workers through this crisis as well, and shocking to realise that those same people would appear to have suffered disproportionately during this crisis because of the inequalities and the further barriers that they suffer in our society. So tackling these inequalities must be a priority. We must be prepared to learn from their experience, um, but we have very limited time. The BME community um, have been really patient enough um, and with us, and we must act resolutely to ensure that our young people have the opportunities they need and they deserve. But today's debate, regardless of any majority vote in the end, will carry no sway in mandating the Executive Office to deliver, to deliver on either the current or any future strategies. But what it has allowed for um, has been the acknowledgement that to date, we have failed to fully protect and remove barriers to full participation for our BME um, population. And the fact that I am a white woman speaking to a room of other white people has also not been lost on me. 
We have much to the do. remarks to close. Please. Yeah, we have much to do to, and a lot to get done. But let us not rely on already asking under-resourced and under-pressured organisations to do that work for us. Let us today pledge to review, implement, and resource the next five years to make the world an easier place for our new communities. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. First of all, this chamber should commend the Black and ethnic minority-led groups who initiated the proposal uh, to bring forward this urgent discussion and a call for action uh, on racial equality uh, to the Assembly. It is very unfortunate that the BAME community felt it necessary to register their disappointment at the lack of political will to tackle racial inequalities here. Uh, and it is indeed a, a matter of profound disappointment and something that the Executive, frankly, should be ashamed of. Uh, this is another example of parties, in my view, hypocritically saying one thing and doing another, or in this case, doing nothing. And yet there are some who claim that there is no structural racism here in the North. The letter from the BAME community was uh, prompted by the horrific murder of George Floyd. And some might say, I think even some in this chamber previously did say, that that's something happening very far from here. Yet we have the embarrassing spectacle uh, of DUP MPs enthusiastically uh, proclaiming their support for President uh, Donald Trump, the tyrant in the White House who has defended the murder of black people by police in the US and given encouragement and protection to racist vigilantes who have killed Black Lives Matter protesters. The letter from the BAME community calls for the Assembly to ensure people from minority ethnic backgrounds living here uh, could not be treated as lesser uh, human beings and for the necessary resources to be put in place for a genuine racial equality strategy to be implemented. This needs to be done immediately. Uh, people for profit. Mr Deputy Speaker, heed the call from this community uh, to support this motion. and We will be giving it our, our support, uh, full support today. We do not just want to see it passed. We want to see it implemented in full, with the full participation of the, of the BAME uh, community. We need to fire up the effort to eradicate racism from every aspect of our society. Um, and I would like to acknowledge, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we submitted an amendment to the motion in front of us today that was unfortunately uh, not accepted. The amendment seeked um, for the Assembly to support uh, the call for all, all the fines and the threats of prosecution to those who attended and organised the socially distanced Black Lives Matter rallies in Belfast and Derry uh, on June the 6th to be dropped. As everyone in this chamber knows, the health guidelines have been breached by many events uh, in many ways during the pandemic. However, it was the only the Black Lives Matter protests that, unlike all the other events, were organised uh, in the safest possibly socially distant way with masks, sanitizer and gloves. It is only the Black Lives Matter protests and protesters that have been system systematically criminalised. I repeat, the Black Lives Matter protesters were systematically criminalised. Therefore, the way in which Black Lives Matter organisers and protesters were treated is a blatant example of institutionalised uh, racism. Members of the black and ethnic minority community were visited in their homes the night before the protests and threatened with prosecution by the PSNI. What a disgraceful matter of refers. On the day of the protests, people of co colour and many attending uh, or attempting to attend the protests were harassed as well by the PSNI. Uh, I will take a point, yeah. To the member. I hope that the member will recall the debate that there was in this House on the issues of the breaches of the health regulations that took place at Milltown Cemetery. And I hope you will recall that on that occasion, I myself also highlighted the discrepancy in treatment between people taking part in one event and people taking part in the Black Lives Matter event as well. Members, an extra minute. I'm sure you did. Uh, but, I mean, where was the police visits for people who run car homes where there's been outbreaks of COVID-19? Where was the police calls on workplaces where there's been health and safety um, issues raised about COVID-19? If you can't see that, member, then uh, sorry, I can't, uh, I can't help you there. Uh, and I think for this to be uh, carried out the way these protesters were treated, um, legislation had to be undemocratically rushed through this assembly. This is a blatant example of institutionalised racism and it appears to be com completely lost on some in this House and it appears to be the member uh, from South Belfast as well. Um, the Justice Minister and all those who uh, stood over, voted for, defended uh, what occurred on June 6, um, say they're not racist, say we support civil rights, say we support racial equality, but they didn't do it on June 6. 
And the failure to recognise institutional racism does not stop here in the City Council. Uh, parties claimed to support civil rights and racial equality and the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, some of them did not support a, a motion brought by my party uh, to drop the fines uh, and prosecutions, the threats of prosecutions on June 6. Shocking, really, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. And here is the point of all this. The Assembly has voted for the past for a racial equality strategy, but did nothing to seriously implement it. Now we have the danger of more possibly lofty gestures, with still a refusal to acknowledge institutional racism towards the Black Lives Matter movement. This is called hypocrisy. And even the dogs in the street are barking about it. So we call Mr Deputy Speaker and all members of the Assembly to vote for the motion, vote in favour of the motion, discussed as a way of um, fully acknowledge, acknowledging structural and institutional racism in our society and the need to act in order to eradicate it. We also call members to uh, fully take on board the demands of the BAME community. We also call for the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, fines and threats of prosecution to be dropped immediately and for a sincere apology to be issued to that community for, the, for their treatment. Thank you. I now call on the junior minister, Gordon Lyons, to respond to the debate and you'll have up to 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I am grateful for the opportunity to respond to some of the concerns um, of members that have been expressed uh, in regards to the current position of the Executive's racial equality strategy. I want to reassure the House that addressing the needs of all of our minority ethnic communities in Northern Ireland is a particularly important matter for us, and one which has and will continue to be a priority. As the Executive's Racial Equality Strategy 2015 to 2025 acknowledged, we are under no illusion about the size of the challenge involved in tackling racial inequalities, and that will require time, effort and resources. Mr Beattie said during his remarks that this should be a cross-departmental uh, issue, uh, and of course um, it, it will be. But additionally, we have to recognise, and indeed our strategy recognises, that each and every one of us has a responsibility to play our part in combating racism and racial inequalities. Success requires the support and active participation of all sections of society and not government alone. The strategy does, however, establish a framework for action for the Northern Ireland Executive and commits to 11 key actions. And good progress has been made to date in implementing these key actions. And I want to highlight these now, uh, specifically uh, the structures to support delivery, including the racial equality subgroup to act as the voice of minority ethnic people, and racial equality champions in each department. They are both uh, in place. Work on developing uh, a joint work programme and approach is ongoing, as the subgroup have been exploring ways to work and to make best use of the connections with the champions. The Department engages regularly with the Racial Equality Subgroup and its members, along with representatives from a broad range of organisations representing minority ethnic groups. Additionally, a review of the Race Relations Northern Ireland Order and relevant aspects of other legislation is underway. And research into ethnic, minor ethnic monitoring, which also includes the potential for amendments to our fair employment legislation, has just been com completed. Ethnic, minor, ethnic monitoring can be defined as the process used to collect, store and analyse data about people's ethnic background. And this system is critical to achieving racial equality, monitoring service usage and ensuring that services are meeting users' needs. Without this monitoring, government departments and agencies will find it difficult to identify gaps and monitor whether racial equality work is having any impact. The Racial Equality Subgroup has been engaged to inform the final research report which we expect to receive in the coming weeks. It will be used to develop future proposals and we will want to engage with other departments and agencies to explore the possible and most appropriate options for implementation. There is growing evidence of a disproportionately high number of BAME deaths from COVID-19 in England and Wales and we understand that work is ongoing with the Department of Health to examine the situation here. This ex I'll give way to the member. Thank you very much. Would, would, you've mentioned um, twice the racial equality subgroup, which is supposed to operate under the auspices of a ministerial subgroup. Would you agree with me that the, an early appointment of that ministerial subgroup would be really useful to help 
garnish the views that have been made and then pass that through to the various departments to help them uh, reflect and change anything that needs to be done? Well, as far as the, the monitoring of what is, what is taking place and how we can best hope to implement the, the strategy, that, is, that of course is something is, that we can uh, consider and appreciate the member uh, raising that, uh, that point with me. Um, I was uh, referring there to the uh, BAME deaths uh, in England, and um, this example reinforces uh, the need for reliable evidence gathering to fully uh, identify the extent of racial inequalities uh, across uh, the board. And our work on ethnic monitoring will support the establishment of an improved evidence base. A review of the delivery model for the Minority Ethnic Development Fund, a key element of our policy for supporting racial equality and good race relations, has also just completed, and we expect again a report, uh, a final report in the next few weeks, and the findings will inform the future operation of the fund. We are also working with the Department of Education to identify ways to tackle racist bullying in schools, and this is supported again by the Racial Equality Subgroup who are also engaging with the PSNI to agree actions uh, to increase identification and monitoring of race, hate, crime. A draft refugee integration strategy for all refugees and asylum seekers is being finalised, and we hope to publish this for consultation later this year. This is of the utmost importance at this time, particularly given the increase in those seeking asylum here over the last number of years, and we have drawn on the learning and best practice from our work with the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme, uh, which will help us to inform the development of that strategy. Indeed, the uh, Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme is a shining example of successful cooperation and collaboration across government departments, agencies, local councils and the community to achieve results which really improve people's lives. To date, we have successfully welcomed 1,815 individuals here and are committed to the continuation of what is, not, what is now known as the Global Resettlement Scheme. The work carried out by the Executive and all partners on making this scheme a success is central to what underpins the racial equality strategy, all sectors working together to tackle racial inequalities. This work has been widely recognised as best practice and provides a model for approaches to addressing other areas of racial equality and marginalised communities. For example, it is planned to extend the remit of the current structures overseeing uh, the Syrian uh, VPRS to deal with the issues faced by asylum seekers who come here outside of a formal scheme. The Racial Equality Indicators Baseline Report was published in November 2018 and presents data measuring the progress uh, of the racial equality strategy, and we are pleased that the report shows headway made in a number of areas. Notably, it shows that there has been a significant decrease in the proportion of respondents reporting they are prejudiced against people from minority ethnic communities. In 2014, uh, that was 24.8%. In 2017, at 19.7%. We do, however, uh, of course, appreciate that there is more to do and we will continue to work to fully implement the actions in the strategy. At this juncture, I would like to take the opportunity to highlight that the racial equality strategy is a 10-year strategy of which we are, of course, in year five. Uh, it was never meant to be that the strategy would be fully implemented at this stage, and we have a number of key actions ongoing and at critical stages, as already highlighted. We believe these actions remain important in our efforts to address racism and inequality and ensure people of all backgrounds and ethnicities can participate equally in society. We therefore remain very much committed to seeing them through to completion. I would acknowledge the reference to the racial equality strategy amongst a list of other strategies in the New Decade New Approach document. This is in the context of the programme for government and strategies which could underpin it. While there was an action in NDNA to publish a new comprehensive timetable within three months for the development and delivery of the strategies necessary to achieve the outcomes of the programme for government, it was not explicit or, in my view, intended that a new racial equality strategy would be published. 
as such a strategy already exists and has not run the full term uh, to enact all of its commitments, which remains important today. Members will, however, be aware that the Executive had agreed at its meeting of the 17th of February a two-stage approach to the PFG. Firstly, preparation of an immediate outcomes-focused PFG to be ready by April 2020, and secondly, development of a new strategic uh, PFG reflecting agreed longer-term priorities to be ready by April 2021. In the weeks following that executive meeting, good progress had been achieved towards preparing uh, PFG 2021, and an intensive engagement process had been initiated to take the views of stakeholders ahead of the programme's planned publication in April. However, in mid-March, in light of the developing situation in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was decided that work on the PFG and NDNA should be temporarily paused. The changes brought about by that crisis and its impacts are, as we all know, uh, considerable. The Executive has therefore subsequently agreed a revised way forward on the programme for government. Firstly, an activity-based recovery programme is to be developed as the basis for driving economic health and societal recovery, which will continue for the rest of 2021. Secondly, a new outcomes-based strategic PFG is to be developed for the commencement uh, of April 2021, informed by citizen and stakeholder engagement and co-design. It will also have to reflect any executive decisions on the prioritisation of the actions in the NDNA document. However, we remain committed to our goal of full implementation of the racial equality strategy, which will continue to contribute to addressing key outcomes around equality and good relations. To say that the current strategy is outdated would suggest that those key actions set out and which we are currently progressing are no longer appropriate. While we understand and our officials have discussed with partners across the sector some frustrations with the speed of progress, we have not had feedback which would suggest the frustration is with the overall aims of the strategy or indeed uh, that those actions identified are no longer needed. I give way to Mr Stalford. appreciate the Minister for giving way and he has touched upon the inherent problem. If you hit reset on this process, on this project, and you're going right back to first principles, right back to the very start, it may actually end up taking longer to secure the outcomes that you want. For his intervention, and, and I absolutely agree, we do not want to go back to that um, starting point again, um, because people are waiting for this um, strategy to be um, implemented, uh, and I just think that that would take a, a longer period of, of time. Not only that, but those in the sector are not calling for a new strategy. There's nothing wrong with the strategy that we have in terms of the outcomes that we all in this chamber have, have expressed that we share uh, today, uh, or how we go uh, about that. I think what people really want to see is an increase in the speed uh, in which those are, are to be uh, delivered. So the motion requests a commitment to act urgently on the forthcoming report on the review of hate crime legislation. This is not within the remit of my department, but is being taken forward uh, by Judge Desmond uh, Marinan on behalf of the Department of Justice. I understand he is currently analysing responses to his consultation and that DOJ expects to receive his final report at the end of November 2020. Any recommendations relating to devolved matters that require new legislation or amendments to current legislation will be considered and brought forward by DOJ in due course. The issue of an anti-racism ethos in our schools is being addressed by the Department of Education. The Addressing Bullying in Schools Act 2016 will require schools to record incidents of bullying, their motivation and their outcome, including racial bullying. The Minister of Education, Peter Weir, will announce commencement of the provisions of the Act in due course. In addition, key elements of the curriculum include mutual understanding, citizenship, cultural understanding and ethical awareness. Our schools have the freedom to use a variety of resources to introduce key concepts such as the impact of racism in society into many areas of learning. Uh, in fact, today, the first day of Good Relations Week, we will celebrate 14 more schools serving, serving urban village areas achieve the Schools of Sanctuary uh, Award. 
As part of its work in tackling the enabling factors of hate crime, uh, DOJ has also commissioned SIA to review the primary and post-primary curriculum to gain an understanding of the teaching of topics which contribute to reducing hate crime and ensuring that issues such as racism are adequately addressed to increase understanding of diversity and the negative impact of prejudice-based uh, bullying. Uh, it is worth noting that the PSNI hate crime statistics indicate that there has been a decrease in race-motivated crimes and incidents in the last 12 months. However, we will not be uh, complacent. On the point of addressing both the contributions made by members of our ethnic minority communities and racism in general, I would like to once again reiterate that we have made it clear in previous answers and statements that racial inequality and good race relations is one of our key priorities. We recognise the need to continue our efforts across government and wider society to tackle racism and racial inequality, which has been brought into even sharper focus uh, by recent uh, events. We remain committed to the implementation of this strategy and welcome the ongoing support and advice uh, from the subgroup. Let me just finish, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, by saying that racism in any of its manifestations is an evil that can have no place here. We reiterate that today uh, and say that we have a zero tolerance approach to racism or discrimination of any kind. Thank you. I now call on Kelly Armstrong to wind on the amendment, and you'll have five minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank all who have spoken here today. Um, we are hearing a unanimous voice coming forward from the Assembly that states very clearly this Good Relations Week that ra uh, racism is wrong. Racism has no part in our society. And I would like to thank Ms Sheeran for bringing forward the motion today. Um, it helps to focus our attention on the fact that we do have a number of issues with our existing um, racial equality strategy. Like many of you, I've spoken with members of the black and ethnic minority community and representative bodies, and they have indicated they do not wish the hard work that was completed in advance of the 2015 strategy to be wasted. What does need to happen is an effective implementation of the current strategy strategy which many of us around this chamber today have acknowledged not all of those recommendations have been carried out. So let's not delay by writing a new strategy. Our amendment has said that we want to see an update to that strategy, but we want to see an update of that strategy with the people who it most affects. And I appreciate that others have said here today a working group already exists. Having spoken to the BAME community, they will confirm that many of those people who are part of working groups are volunteers. Many of those people have lost funding for groups. Many of their employed members of staff no longer have jobs. So what we would like to do is to ensure that if we're going to include people's voices, that we include those people and ensure that they're supported to be able to take an effective part in looking at the update of the strategy. And it is right and proper. Any of us have worked with strategies in the past. We recognise absolutely that partway through a strategy, you look back at what has been done and what needs to be done in order to see it fulfilled. We only have 18 months of this assembly term left to go. If we wait until the end of that to see the rest of the recommendations implemented, they'll never happen. It's noted by the Equality Commission that the current strategy does have a few problems. It lacks outcome-based actions, and that does need to be reviewed. Actions should be designed to address inequalities experienced by people from minority ethnic communities in areas such as health and social care, education, housing, employment, and participation in public life. And that is why we go back to the amendment that we have made, which calls on the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, because while racial equality lies within the Executive Office, it will be that department that rules it out across all of our departments. All of our departments recognise the need to improve on racial equality in the work that they do, and that's why they have champions. But those champions are hidden. We don't know who they are. We don't get reports on what they're doing, and we would all like to see that happening as soon as possible. We also lack effective data recording to measure how effective measures are or where there are opportunities for improvements. As we all know, in order to access investment, you need to produce a fact-based business case. And unless we have appropriate data collection, this is impossible. If we are to have racial equality, then we need to address negative attitudes and ensure black, Asian and ethnic minorities are visible and voices are heard. 
As part of this Good Relations Week, we need to do more to ensure strategies are reviewed and updated to ensure they remain effective and still deliver an outcome. And was mentioned earlier by Ms Martina Anderson, one of the key ways that we could do that would be through, as she mentioned, teacher training for our schools. Of course we want to see better racial equality and training within or help within our schools for our pupils, but we need to start with the adults who are with them in their classes. And to be honest, that teacher training needs to be published so we can all see the content of that. In the disability community, we say nothing about us without us. The same must apply to the racial equality strategy. This room, as has been acknowledged, is white. I'm going to use my white privilege to say I don't know what it feels like to be a person who has black skin or who is from an ethnic minority in Northern Ireland today. They do, and they're the best voices to have input to that. BAME community must have an integral role in updating the current strategy, and we must take leadership by timetabling effective delivery of all the recommendations. Following on from the Black Lives Matter movement and the impact COVID has had, our society does need to do more to achieve better good relations for everyone. The timetabling is key. People don't want to hear about what we're going to do, they want to see a timetable when it's going to be done by. I ask that this Assembly supports the amendment and the motion. We have an opportunity to make a difference and we have a short time left to do it. Thank you very much. I now call on Colin Gildenew to wind up the debate on the motion and you'll have 10 minutes. Um, I raise today to support the motion, obviously, but also the amendment that has been brought here today. And colleagues from across the House have highlighted the important areas that are in urgent need of reform to tackle institutional and structural racism that is evident here in the North. It's important, whilst having these discussions, to, to close with some reflection on the positive impact that migrants bring to our society and to highlight why they deserve better. And I suppose at this point I should declare an interest um, in, the, in the sense that we have heard from many representatives here from South Belfast today, but I represent South Tyrone and we too have a very vibrant and valued ethnic minority community. Um, and indeed right across from Anna and South Tyrone and Mid Ulster. In 2017, the migrant population of the North comprised of 138,000 people, a mere 7.5 per cent of our population. With a total of 1.85 people living here in the north, 3.3 per cent were born in the EU 26 nations and only 2.6 were from the rest of the world. Moreover, since the EU referendum, international inflows have decreased by 13 per cent, while outflows fell by, by 7 per cent. So this would suggest that this problem is linked to the Brexit campaign, which dubbed migrants as a problem and led to an increase in racist hate crimes. This is also evident in very significant shift in attitudes displayed in the North of Ireland Life and Times survey between 2013 and 2017. In 2017, out of a total of 835 workers, 883,000 were born outside of these islands. This accounts for 10 per cent of the working population. Despite these relatively low numbers, when respondents in the Life and Time survey were asked their attitudes and asked the following question, um, whether the needs of migrant workers are putting a strain on schools, a worrying number of respondents agreed with the statement. 17% strongly agreed and 28% agreed. A total, I will. Did the member agree with me that we as leaders have a responsibility, as I said earlier, to, to, to remove that negative language and to ensure that people understand the value of these people and that they're not actually a drain on our resource but actually a benefit to our communities? I would ab absolutely agree with that. I have to say that uh, when, when I referenced um, the South Tyrone and, and my own background coming from an engineering company, um, in, the, in the early 90s and early 2000s, the Tyrone and, and the South Tyrone engineering and food manufacturing sector are world leading in terms of their, but in that, in that 90s when I was involved in an engineering business in, in South Tyrone, we were being constrained, not as a, not as a result of economy or ideas or the ability to export, but by skilled work. And people came, but not only did they bring their skills and their diligence and their enthusiasm into the workplace, they brought a very deep and a rich culture with them as well. And I think we have benefited massively from all of that in our society. So 
we see these, these, these shifts within the attitude, and I think that needs to be absolutely a wake-up call to every one of us in this chamber. Recent and, in my view, shameful media reports have created a false narrative of a migrant invasion targeted refugees. This narrative is used to create fear in the population that migrants are coming to take our jobs or take our benefits or take our houses or whatever it might be. A load of nonsense, to be quite honest. Um, that's an age-old playbook in terms of scapegoating migrants, scapegoating refugees for failures of the British government, for failures of service provision, and in some cases, their mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen that many of our skilled workers and frontline workers are migrants, and we are forever indebted to the work that they have done for us all in our health service, our shops, our factories, our delivery services, and indeed a range of other frontline services. Migrant workers are often recruited to workplaces in the north. Therefore, it's important to note their crucial contribution to our economy. Migration provides vital skills to our workforce and is estimated that minority ethnic enterprises contribute around £16 billion pounds per year to the economy across these islands. My own constituency of Dungannon is one of these areas that has benefited most from migration. In 2017, Dungannon had the largest proportion of overseas-born residents in the north. Workers come and staff our engineering companies, our meat plants. They add diversity to our schools and support businesses in the town. And I have to say, it would do your heart good to walk up through Dungannon Square on a Friday afternoon and to see the wide range and diversity of culture of young people from across the world interacting, bantering, engaging with each other, and indeed wearing sports tops from right across sports across our whole society and contributing in all those ways. However, despite the hard work of migrants, many workers are exploited for their labour, receiving a smaller wage than local people for the same job and often working in very precarious conditions. This was evidenced in the recent outbreaks at local food processing factories right across this island and these islands, where the workers tend to be majority migrants. As migrant workers are here on work visas or insecure status, they are afraid to speak up in case they may lose their job. It has also been referenced by my colleague Martina Anderson in relation to people being racially profiled, and this issue has been raised both in relation to the Black Lives Matter that Jerry Carroll has mentioned and in relation to transport. And there is no, re there is no uh, requirement for anyone from those areas to produce passports in this country uh, or across these islands. And we should not allow creeping racial profiling to, to come in here in, in terms of identifying people solely because of the colour of their skin. A recent UNITE survey has shown that 20% of the workforce at a COVID-19 impacted meat processing plant, 43% are migrants who live with two or more of their colleagues, and 11% live with five or more. An overwhelming majority of these said that they continued to work while sick as they could not afford to lose pay. And I think this raises the issue that we must, we must protect these workers as we protect everyone else. They are in need of additional consideration given their more precarious work and their multiple occupancy housing situations. However, when discussing these clusters, we rely heavily, and indeed too heavily, on data from elsewhere on these islands. And I note um, the, the acknowledgement that Gordon Lyons has made today in terms of the data, but I have to say I haven't seen anything to date uh, clear by way of evidence, but I think that is a huge gap. Um, so, as Emma pointed out, due to the lack of implementation of the racial equality strategy, there is actually li very little ethnic monitoring in workplaces at present, which will provide us with the information we need. We are also limited, and Gordon Lyons has referred to this, of, of how COVID-19 affects black and Asian minority ethnic communities in the north as a result of COVID. We are aware of the difficulties they have faced across the islands, but we do not, to my knowledge, have concrete uh, information and data yet, and that's an issue we must address quickly. So the same issue applies to the underreporting of crime, as mentioned by Linda Dillon earlier. We see an underreporting of crime. We see a, a reluctance from some of these communities to come forward and report crime in the first place. And I think that is something that we absolutely need to tackle. In the years since the Good Friday Agreement was signed, we've progressed into a much more open, accepting, and multicultural society. Uh, since the violence ceased, migrants here feel safer to come and work and contribute to life here, and as a result, our communities uh, benefit from that contribution and the very rich diversity they bring. 
As Martina highlighted, with more migrant children in schools, it gives our young people the opportunity to learn about other cultures and languages that they may otherwise never learn. Early intervention against racism is key to halting the growth throughout our society. This will have a major impact on our children and young people uh, as they learn to be open-minded, tolerant and creating a racism-free future. And I have to say, both my own lads, both uh, in primary and in secondary school, regularly talk about their friends who clearly come from other countries and benefit from that. And one of our members previously uh, stated the very important and relevant fact that no child, no child instinctively is racist or bears hatred. That's an attitude that's learned. So, one of the key components of the Black Lives Matter movement was the need for a broader education in schools. That includes a more comprehensive curriculum, including dealing with the skeletons from a colonial era and the long-term effects this has had on our society globally. Creating an anti-racism ethos in schools is key to assimilating black and Asian minority ethnic communities into our society as children alongside their peers. It's important to emphasise that those who are prejudiced and, and display prejudice are in the minority, but we cannot take that as a reason to be complacent. So finally, and I, and I apologise to members, I didn't get around many of the very fine contributions that, that many of you made, but I think it is fair to say that this House is united in our view that we need to deal with this issue quickly and robustly. And I would like to thank the Council for Ethnic Minorities, the African Caribbean Support Organisation and the North West Migrants Forum who have contributed to those bringing the debate here today. And I wish to support the debate and the amendment. Cora Mayagaf. Members, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Paula Bradshaw and Kelly Armstrong be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Country no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Item 5 in the order, paper of the adjournment. The question is the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed.